Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming, uh, coming out this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to call to order the Board of Supervisors regular meeting for June 4th, 2019. As uh, usual, we will start our meeting with an invocation. This evening, I'm honored to welcome Reverend Ronzo Lee. Uh, I think uh, three of us were at his installation a few months back at Ebenezer uh, Church. Um, Reverend Lee, if you'd come up, and we'll follow that with a Pledge of Allegiance led by Mr. Peterson. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here today. Let us pray. O thou in whose presence our souls take delight, you are a comfort by day, you are a song in the night. Father, we thank you for this time that you've allowed us to gather in this place to conduct the business of Goochland County. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to serve you and to be able to serve your people. Now, Father, we ask that your presence will be among us. We ask that you will bless all that will be said and done. Let it be done, O God, to bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you, Lord, for these, the Board of Supervisors, each one, each district. We ask that you will bless them and to bless their families. Father, we thank you for being residents of Goochland County. And we pray, O oh God, that you would continue, Lord, to help us to do your will and to do your way. We pray, O oh God, especially for each resident in Goochland. We pray for the state of Virginia, our governor. We pray for these United States of America, our president, the Congress. We pray, O oh God, for the Supreme Court. Most of all, Lord, we pray for our world. We ask that you would give us peace, Lord. We know that peace cometh from you. Now, God, bless all that will be said and done. Let it be done to the glory and honor of your holy name. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any requests to postpone agenda items? Are everybody okay with the agenda? Yes, sir. All right, we'll move on. Uh, for my com comments this evening, I'd like to remind everybody that this uh, Saturday, June 8th, from 11 to 8 o'clock, the Jackson Smith uh, Blacksmith Shop will be holding its annual uh, event. Uh, that is a really good event. They'll have food, uh, usually music, uh, they'll do tours of the of the uh, blacksmith shop, and this is one of the few remaining standing in the state. Um, so I I invite you to um, to join them at 11 o'clock from 11 to 8, and there'll also be a food trucks. So come and enjoy the uh, the afternoon. I'd also like to congratulate the high school seniors who graduated this past weekend. I wish them well and. If we can ever help them with anything, uh, let us know. Uh, Mr. Budeski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a number of comments. I did want to echo your comment about the Jackson Blacksmith uh, event. I believe it's 11 to 4.30. Uh, if you go at 8, you're going to probably miss the fish sandwiches. <laughs> and that's the best, it's one of the best fish sandwiches I've ever had. Um, but also, not only do you get to experience the, the blacksmith shop history and what the family's done there. They're also uh, having an art exhibition of Jerome and Jeremiah Jones there this year. Uh, and so it's really a nice event for the community. If you have an opportunity to stop by, um, please take the opportunity to do so with that event. Uh, speaking of events, this past weekend, uh, the annual Rasawick event was held in the county and we welcomed thousands of visitors into Goochland County. Uh, it's sort of interesting to, to be out at Raswick, some folks show up, they don't even know where they're at. Um, and, and really, uh, it's, it's one of the most beautiful parts of our county and really get a chance to take it in. 
uh, and a lot of a lot of folks came in from out of town and learned a little bit about Goochland County and and some of the best parts, some of the rural parts of our community, um, and and that lifestyle. And so it was a really nice opportunity to to welcome some new folks to Goochland, and really appreciate everything that all the individuals involved with the Rasawick event, uh, the time and effort they put into that. Um, did also want to share uh, one additional event. Uh, Saturday, June 22nd at Central High uh, Educational and Cultural Complex. Uh, there, uh, along with the Historical Society in Parks and Rec, uh, Rita B. Dandridge book talk and signing event. Uh, uh, there's a book written on the life of Josephine Turpin Washington uh, and encourage uh, our residents to participate in that event. Again, it's 1 o'clock on June 22nd. Um, additional events uh, on June 17th at 6 p.m. This is a Monday evening. We welcome the community uh, to Tucker Park uh, to dedicate uh, the, the county's very first dog park. Uh, and it's a, it's a fenced in off leash area for our residents to bring dogs out to. Uh, this is a partnership of Goochland County and Goochland County pet lovers. Uh, along with the contribution of the Reynolds family. And uh, so we look forward to dedicating that that night. And then after that, that park will be open to the public. Also like to recognize uh, the schools and their partnership. They've done all the benches that are shaped like dog bones for the park. And um, it's just the beginning. Uh, we have an additional park and partnership planned at Hidden Rock Park as well. Uh, and this park uh, will affectionately be known as Tucker Bark. Um, <laughs> and uh, so please uh, join us at Tucker Bark um, <laughs> at 6 p.m. on the 17th. If it's raining, it'll be the 18th. Um, and so look forward to you joining us there, 6 p.m. Um, since our last meeting, we had also hosted uh, a session on uh, whether the county should consider a noise ordinance um, or not. And we received a lot of feedback before at that meeting and after that meeting. We are in the process of gathering all that information to share with the board. We're hoping to be able to surmise the feedback that we've received at our July meeting um, for the board to consider and determine uh, which future actions we'll be taking as it relates um, to that particular matter. So uh, we've received uh, I will say I've been going on three years of service here, we've probably received more comment on that item uh, than most uh, that we've ever re that have received in the past three years. So there are people passionate on both sides of that issue, and so we're working to collect that information for the board. Um, if you caught the news yesterday or saw one of the county's press releases, we are uh, rolling out a program that the county actually planned for over a year ago, budgeted and planned for of changing out the private street signs in Goochland County uh, <coughs> and there will be a differential sign for private street signs versus public street signs and all the new signs are gray or, or brown and white. Right now many of our signs are all green and white um, and so it'll help us, many of those green and white signs on private roads were really aging um, and quite honestly the new signs will help with uh, visibility in the evening for our residents and public responders but also help distinguish. We get calls on, I got an issue on this road, and if all the signs look similar, it's sometimes hard to distinguish a private versus public road. So there was some intent to try to make some distinguishing clarity so we can answer uh, individuals' questions easier without having background research. That program is underway. Um, there's about 800 signs throughout the county that will be replaced in this program, and it'll take some time. Um, we're doing this. Um, uh, while our crews are out in different parts of the county. So it won't happen overnight, but we anticipate uh, really in the next 12 to 24 months, all these will be changed out. And then as roads are developed in the future, those signs would be put up according to the, their particular colors and indication of the road type. Um, last thing I wanted to share today, um, four o'clock last week, and while none of you will care that I was at my annual physical, um, other than it turned out okay, and thank you for your concern. Um, I was sitting in there waiting for the doctors, we often do, 
um, and killing time looking at my phone. And my heart dropped out when I saw the alert that Virginia Beach, uh, at that time they didn't really have a lot of information about what was going on, but that they knew that there was fatalities and individual public servants at a municipal campus uh, while going about their daily lives and a citizen there doing their daily business, uh, we ultimately learned that 12 individuals lost their lives that day. Uh, and they were just there being public servants, serving uh, the community that they loved. Um, I tell you, I've struggled this week um, in trying to draft something to my own employees. I don't envy that city manager that was in a position to have to do those press releases and talk to those families um, and respond to a crisis. And this isn't uh, some political position. You know, one of the things we pride ourselves on in Goochland is being approachable, being accessible. Um, and that allows us to hopefully hear, listen, and serve <coughs> our citizens in the best possible way. Um, there are jurisdictions now looking at safety plans and security plans and things that can be done, and, and we do that ongoing. We have emergency plans here in place should something ever occur here. Um, we hope to God we never have to use them. Um, and Virginia Beach had to respond to those matters Friday afternoon. Um, and uh, I just, our hearts go out to those individuals and their families, the service that they were just there doing their jobs. A lot of us, you know, these don't do public service for the pats on the back or the glory or the pay some days, uh, but it's because we believe we're giving to our community. And while this incident was a, an employee with personal issues, this could have been anybody. This could have been the next customer. This could have been someone else that was displeased. You know, the, I hope that in Goochland we provide an opportunity for civil discourse, that we can approach matters uh, as positively even when we disagree. I hope for our employees' sake that we recognize and address issues um, when we see them, that th they know that that door is open for service and support to help them when they're in, in difficult times. Um, and, and really, um, you know, there's some things that, that you may not be able to address in every which way you can possibly think about. But when you see something, say something. I know that's, that, that mantra is being said. Uh, sometimes people just need a lift up, and, and, and that's what we need to do with each other. And so for our employees, I'm grateful for the service that you do. Some of our employees have worked with individuals that were their lives were taken that day. Um, these were all good people that just cared about their community, that now their families and colleagues in their community suffering and, and wish them the very best in our thoughts and prayers and, and uh, thank our employees for the work and public service that, that, that they do each and every day. So thank you for letting me have my little bit of time there, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, next item on our agenda is our citizen comment period. Um, anyone wishing to speak, please come forward. Uh, give us your name and address and try to keep your comments to about three minutes. My name is Linda Moore. I think you all know me pretty well. Um, I live at 2164 Prophet Road, um, Mannequin 7. Um, tornado season 2019 is here. No big surprise. Um, back in 2000, uh, in August of, of uh, 2005, my son knew young people with disability who lived in the area devastated by 
uh, Hurricane Katrina. From this con uh, concern, are you ready disaster preparation for people with disability project uh, was formed. This uh, provided information on how to assemble uh, bags, go bags, um, to help people, especially with special needs and medical needs, with information so that they could, uh, in fact, inform the Red Cross when they got to the center of what they needed in order to get their medical needs met. Uh, it was very important because during Katrina, we did a very poor job. Many people with disabilities perished. Um, from that project, um, many fine Goochland people helped. Um, we, matter of fact, we won a governor's award for this project. Um, Ned Creasy uh, was, and um, Robin Hillman, um, all people that are uh, Goochland Baptist Church, all of them were, were right there with my son to allow him to win the governor's award. I'm telling you right now, we're kind of slipping in the area uh, of, of disaster preparation. I know we're very busy people, but now storms are raging. We need to get back to helping, especially young people. I had the honor uh, back in during Vacation Bible School to help the little children in my Vacation Bible School. We made, um, their, they made their own go bag. The package you got that's, that's going around is just the information pack that went around with it. The, I, I worked with three-year-olds all the way up to 12-year-olds. They only had 15 minutes apiece, and they loved it. They went from table to table putting together their little go bag, and they had a ball. You know, so I'm telling you, I, I know my light's blinking. Um, please give me a few just, more minutes. Just finish uh, your thoughts. I, I, I won't. I won't. Uh, um, these are things that are really reasonable, really cheap, and that, that could provide our children with a sense of calmness when a disaster happened. I'm asking us to kind of start thinking about how we can include that into the school programs and stuff like that. This was a service learning project for, for, for children with different, I call it different abilities rather than special needs, um, where we worked with children who wouldn't have the opportunity to, to do this kind of service learning project any other way. Please, like I said, uh, let's, let's start thinking about using people who, who wouldn't have a chance to participate any other way. Have a nice day. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Moore. Thank you for your leadership on this. I'm Wendy Hobbs. I reside at 3055 Tramby Croft Way in Sandy Hook. On May the 7th, 2019, the Electoral Board stated 227 taxpaying Goochland residents were being reassigned from a precinct in Goochland County to one in Louisa County to vote. These residents legally live and pay taxes in Goochland County. During this meeting, the board made a concerted effort to ensure the citizens that they know that the Board of Supervisors did not make this change and that the electoral board solely made the decision. When you took your oath of office, you swore to represent the citizens of Goochland County. However, as of today, 227 citizens have been told of their new assignment precinct assignment. 
So you fail to take actions to make what is wrong right. The code in question cites the Bureau of Census boundaries as determining factors for assigning precincts. However, this boundary has been wrong for years. The code in question has been in effect since 2011, but not enforced for eight years. Voting is the most significant voice citizens have to elect those who represent them at various governmental levels. While most of these people will not be affected by this action at the state and national level, they will be at the local level. This year is a local election year, and these people should be able to vote for the people who will make decisions governing their lives, as well as for those sworn to serve and to protect. The recent actions by the Electoral Board denied them those rights. As the legislative body from Goochland, you can do something to make this right. If you're truly representing all the citizens of Goochland, then support the 227 disenfranchised voters. File a lawsuit to block the moving of these citizens to Louisa County to vote. As a governing body, you can do this without placing this burden to sue on individual citizens who may or may not have the financial resources to hire an attorney to file a suit. If ever there was a time to represent the citizens of Goochland County, this is your opportunity. These people have a right to vote where they live and not be held accountable for mistakes made by county leaders years ago and those who have followed without correcting the problem. If citizens have not been forced to vote out of the county in the past, one must wonder why now. We heard this problem in other jurisdictions that may have resulted in the state electoral board telling our electoral board to assign people to the correct precinct. However, we should seek a loophole in this code to protect the citizens from voting disenfranchisement. If you're generally representing all of Goochland citizens, do the right thing and file the law lawsuit to block the move of citizens' voting precincts from the county where they live and they pay taxes. And I've talked to our representatives at the House and the Senate, and I've heard of resolutions that are being considered by both counties, but I felt it compelled to say that even though you all didn't do this, I do believe that you can make a difference and keep our people in the county where they are living and where they should vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hobbs. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner. I live at 1702 Bridgewater Court. Um, real quick, I, I want to, on a side note, echo Mr. Bredeski's comments about how accessible everybody in the county is. Um, me personally, I've spent plenty of time in his conference room uh, discussing the issue I'm about to mention and other stuff. Um, wanted to come up today and express support for the board's uh, motion to consider the service district for Bridgewater for the roads. Um, it's been a long time coming that, you know, we it's been a long time that we've been dealing with the situation in there. I'm not saying it's the board's fault, the county's fault. It's a unfortunate situation. and. Personally, um, I appreciate everybody's time uh, upstairs and everybody in community development um, over the years working towards a solution um, and uh, optimistic that we're in the home stretch now. So appreciate y'all's consideration of that and uh, look forward to hopefully getting it, done, getting it done soon. So, Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Anyone else? Members of the board, Jonathan Lyle, 1521 Mannequin Road. Uh, I seem to have an ability to clear a room when I stand up to talk. People start leaving. Um, I, I gave you all an email warning, if you will, or heads up, maybe warning is the wrong word, that I was going to mention um, the comment period for the governor's uh, 
watershed implementation plan that is currently going on and having spoke with Debbie Bird and Mr. Badesky prior to the meeting, I understand that there is a response underway and uh, I appreciate that very much. I have shared with you, uh, I, it should get to you sooner or later, a copy of the letter I sent to the governor's office uh, specifically referencing 11 points that I think are bad for the agricultural community. I may have neglected for the people viewing from home that I am a uh, director of the Monacan Soil and Water Conservation District and, and um, I advocate as frequently as I can for the ag community uh, with Boots and wanting to stay rural and, and Mr. Lumpkin's rural is defined as agricultural and open space uh, to answer your question from several months ago. But um, keeping Goochland open at 85% is, is incumbent upon us having farmers because if they're not productive, they're going to find another use for that land. And unfortunately, that seems to be rooftops and houses. Um, and I live in a house, so I'm not against houses, mind you. But um, I, I do commend the county for looking at what the comment period affords us, and that's an opportunity at the get-go to influence policy. Uh, how far our comments will influence policy, nobody knows, but I do appreciate that if we don't say something, uh, we really have less ground to complain later on. Now I'm going to switch gears. Um, there is a public hearing tonight, and I have worked really hard to contain my comments to the time allotted to them, so I'm going to say now how much I appreciate the board. Look at that. Like there's a lot. Um, uh, opening and, and entertaining comments. And I also want to say that I appreciate the developer who's going to present the Tuckahoe Bridge presentation for their ability or willingness to meet with community members. Uh, I still have disagreements with what they're saying, and you'll hear more about that tonight. Uh, that's called a preview. Uh, but I, I really do appreciate that this has been, as, as Mr. Alvarez has said, we've been able to disagree without being disagreeable. It's been civil and, and uh, I may not have the chance to tell the developer that tonight in my public comments, so if they're watching from home, they'll hear me say it now. Light went off. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Lyle. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Take your time. We don't, we don't count that as part of your three minutes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Of the board, ladies and gentlemen here. Um, my name is Linda Gray. I am not a uh, born resident of Goochland County, but I moved here about 15 years ago. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the um, EMT, the ambulance response time. Um, it, I'm from New Jersey originally. Now, I know it's a small, that Goochland is a, lar a larger area than where I'm from. And, but if someone is having um, difficulty breathing, a heart attack, pain, and stuff like that, I was taught that response time should be like four minutes or perhaps less. And here I have seen uh, the response time being 12 minutes, if not more. And if somebody's having difficulty breathing, chest pain, that type of, of uh, you know, that's wrong with them, there could be no, they could be gone. You know, the first responders are, the police officers are not first responders, said I'm used to that. Um, I don't know, I, like I said, I, I'm new here, and this is just, I, I'm comparing it from where I am from, and it's not a big city where I'm from. I'm from a place called Madison, New Jersey, and it's about four square miles, which I know is much smaller than Goochland. But this is what I learned. And I was, I rode ambulance for 10 years and I have like three CPR saves because we had first responders, people, cops, police officers getting there that started oxygen and, and stuff like that. So my thing was like, if can anything be done, you know, to help the response time of our EMTs. Did I blink? No, not yet. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. You all have a blessed day. Blessed day. Thank you, Ms. Gray. And we can probably provide 
I'm going to just ask yeah. Chief to, to yeah. just follow up on your concerns, but Eddie, you don't just yeah. you can and catch up. Anyone else with public comment? Okay. My name is uh, Walton Gray. That was my wife. And I was at the graduation Sunday. And going in the building, uh, they had a real good way of not letting crazy people get in there. <laughs> and I felt pretty safe in there because when you, get, when you got there, they checked everything at the gate. Then they had a clear bag package for the ladies that you couldn't get a gun in that place. And I was wondering why don't a lot of other places do that to make it more safer for people that get killed. And uh, while I was there, it was I felt pretty safe inside that building because what I went through myself, they'd make you get your keys out, your wallet, and cell phones, everything that could get inside that could hurt people. And uh, I felt good about what I saw about the uh, thing, uh, the, with the George uh, Arena, mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty good because I was at the graduation Sunday, and I think everybody else felt pretty safe too. But it was very nice getting into a, a lot of people like that, and you kind of thinking that I'm pretty safe in here. And I think what they did up there, they should commend it for that because there was no problem, uh, you know, of anything threatening to any other people. That's what I wanted to say about the, uh, the safety of, of the of the school up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your recommendation. <coughs> Anyone else? If not, I'll close the public comment. And I, I would like to respond to Ms. Hobbs. Um, Ms. Hobbs, I attended the, the electoral board meeting and I uh, opposed the change uh, verbally and uh, <laughs> loudly. Uh, unfortunately, they, it's an instant, you know, I think we were doing the right thing for the last eight years or nine years. And unfortunately, the incident that happened in Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County highlighted it. The electoral boards were told to correct it. I still would have preferred to have gone on the do the right thing instead of the doing things right approach. Um, but we are considering and we have looked at perhaps suing the electoral board. It's, it's uncomfortable because we're suing our own members, our, our own neighbors, but it is something we're, we're looking at. So, um, anyway, that's, I think that's all I have for now, but, okay. Um, next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. Any, did everybody get a chance to read them? Any updates, changes? If not, I'll accept the motion. So, Mr. Chair, move approval of the May 7th, 2019 meeting minutes. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The minutes uh, are approved. Next item on the agenda is reports. And I think we have Mr. Cawthorn here today for subbing in for Mr. Wynn. Um, Mr. Harlow, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. How you doing? Um, doing fine. Good afternoon, Mr. Pedeski, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Mark Harlow. I'm the ARA at the Ashland Residency, filling in for Mr. Wynn today. Uh, hopefully, all of you have the report from Mr. Cawthorn for our maintenance activities and residency activities that went on this month. Uh, I would like to follow up on that with the, uh, we did get the flashing stoplight at Shannon Hill and Broad Street installed, uh, so that's working properly, uh, Ms. Lascolette. Um, our maintenance crews continue to work on potholes, litter pickup, mowing, uh, drainage ditches and pipes. Uh, last month we, re we received 97 work orders. Uh, we closed out and completed 63 of those. We had uh, 14 emergency call-outs, after-hour call-outs, uh, high water trees down that our crews took care of. Um, our schedule work, our secondary schedule work, the uh, surface treatment is supposed to start uh, about the third week of June, so you'll start to see that throughout the county. Uh, that should go on for about three weeks, and they sh should finish up with uh, good weather. 
But other than that, that's about all I got. If you guys got something for me. Questions for Mr. Harlow? So, Mr. Chairman. Oops. So, Mr. Chairman, um, we put the request, just put the request in, but um, there have been a couple instances, trees overhanging the roads, limbs falling. Uh, there are a lot of places where the tree limbs from both sides are totally over the road. So it's just something we ask you to take a look at. Shannon Hill Road, excuse me, Haydensville Fife Road was one in yeah, particular. Mr. Mr. Wynn got it yesterday, I believe, and yes. he forwarded that to me, so we're going to take a okay, look at it. Okay, I really appreciate you taking a look at that. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions? Mr. Peterson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I've yes, spent sir. about nine years in the military, and I'm used to acronyms. Okay. But if I go to your construction category, it says UPC 113550PM4A paving. Like now, that? I'm not sure I understand what <laughs> UPC 113550PM4A paving is. Well, Perhaps I just make a general comment. If in the future, when you prepare these reports, pretend the person reading it doesn't work doesn't for VDOT. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir, we can do that. Thank well, you. That's so really my only comment. It's not the project number. The UPC is the, uh, the way it gets paid for, and the project number is the PM for whatever that okay. is. Okay. So. so pretend the reader doesn't work for Yes, me. sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Peters. I, I have a couple, couple of comments or questions. I know you got a lot of flack over the paving of 522 because <laughs> I know my wife got stuck in it like three times. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I learned, uh, I think we increased the, the traffic on Dogtown for, for a few days tremendously, but I think it looks great. I think it, they've done a really nice, it's really smooth, it's really nice, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, the lines on Whitehall Road, as Whitehall Road approaches 522, yes. there are all kind of, uh, they used to, the yellow line used to kind of move to, towards the left. It's now all to the right, and I noticed people stopping back behind the white line so they can go left onto 522. Is that something y'all can look at? Yes, they're looking at that now. Okay. We, we noticed it after they had put the pavement marking back down, so their traffic engineering is looking at that. All right. it's, we can get that put it just, I think when you, when you follow the lines, yeah, you're, it, you're in a position where you can still really see to the left, so I think uh, that's why people are stopping earlier. Yes, sir. The other thing I wanted to mention is I, there was a complaint about shoulder work on Shannon Hill Road. Oh, yes. And that was between, um, what is down here somewhere, between Sky, Sky. and Mount Pleasant yes. Church, right. where the shoulder was um, yes. cleared out, I guess, for drainage. Okay. But now there's a big drop off. Yes. Uh, we're looking at piping that area back in. We're actually going to okay. put piping in the ditch and cover it back to take some of that deep ditch out of there. They oh, had okay. to put that ditch in there to take care of the water that was upstream. It was backing up on right. somebody's property. Oh, right. um, so yes, we're looking at doing something different with that. Okay. Thank you. And um, I think that's all I had. Um, Mr. Chairman, one other thing. Back on Whitehall and Sandy Hook, we write about the turn lane problem. But also, I think, and I could be wrong on this, are there the dotted yellow lines oh, right yeah. at that intersection? Um, there used to be, yeah, that, I think, and now I it's know they were there. Thing. We'll check and make sure. Check and make sure. I, I just was thinking about it the other guys. Was that yellow line, dotted line's fine? So would you check yes, that? Because obviously that that's, shouldn't be a no passing lane. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, next item, uh, fire and rescue. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Eddie Ferguson, the interim fire rescue chief for Goochland County Department of Fire Rescue Emergency Services. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Gray for her uh, comments and coming back in. She and her husband and the minister coming back in to uh, hear the fire rescue report. Really appreciate that. Uh, as you guys uh, know, we are doing uh, many things uh, in the county to improve fire rescue, in particular response times. And I think a, a multitude of things that are in the report this month and the things that I'll speak out on here today will reflect that. Uh, to Ms. Moore's point, I really appreciate her bringing forward the uh, disaster preparedness aspect. Uh, citizens and 
myself included, should have supplies in their home to be able to sustain themselves for 24 to 72 hours in the event of a disaster. And I can tell you that uh, this year on September the 7th, we will have our normal disaster preparedness workshop. It's been referred to as Survivor Day in years past, and we'll have that here in the county and, and more to come on that. But thank you, uh, Ms. Moore, for... What day was that, September? Uh, September the 7th. 7th. And, of course, that's uh, hurricane season has kind of just begun, but uh, they decided to, to do that uh, in the fall of this year instead of the spring. So it's a statewide initiative, and we're certainly uh, taking part in that. So, of course, uh, you all have the fire rescue report in your uh, packet, but I'd like to uh, just take a few minutes and, and bring out a few things in the report and some things that may have occurred since the report was submitted. Uh, first of all, um, we just recognized all of our EMS providers for National EMS Week. It was May 19th through the 26th. And the EMS team is composed of uh, first responders, firefighters, EMTs, drivers, dispatchers, uh, deputies, uh, doctors, nurses, the hospital staff, all that contribute to the emergency medical services uh, system. And I want to tell you about the good things that our personnel are doing here in Goochland County uh, relative to fire and EMS uh, response. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, just recently the department was recognized with uh, a Mission Lifeline Award from the American Heart Association. And Mission Lifeline actually speaks to our ability to deliver cardiac and stroke care to the patients that we see. It's predicated on uh, response times, but also from the time that we reach the patient's side until we can perform a, a 12 lead EKG and recognize whether or not that patient may or may not be having a heart attack and make the notification immediately to the hospital that can handle that emergency. And they can ramp up and get their cath lab open and then we can respond with the patient to the appropriate center. Uh, and we were recognized um, for that. It's a Bronze Mission Lifeline Award, and we're very proud of that. And we've been recognized for that in the past, uh, and it's an annual type of thing where we have to submit our data, and they look at our times and so forth, and also what happens there in the hospital. I also want to wave the flag for our uh, public safety law enforcement partners at the Sheriff's Office. They're diligently working on the emergency medical dispatch program. Um, the go live date is later in the month. Uh, it is a, a tremendous project, and they are countless hours are going towards getting that done. A medical director is also involved in that, and we Fire Rescue also has a presence uh, in working side by side with uh, the Sheriff's Office to see that through. So I think uh, many more good things to come, and pre-arrival first aid instructions will be able to give into the 911 callers for certain, certain types of emergencies. In addition, uh, speaking of some of the good things there, our members are doing, we had one of our young members, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kaylee Eckert, is a uh, high school senior, just graduated at Goochland High School, was actually nominated and won the ODEMSA uh, Regional Award for Outstanding uh, Contribution to EMS by a high school senior. That came along with a $1,000 scholarship, and Kaylee now goes on to compete against 11 other uh, regional award winners uh, in the uh, state at the governor's level. The ODEMSA region is uh, four state planning districts, over 100 EMS agencies, 6,000 EMS providers, uh, and over 25 hospitals, so that's a, that's a big accomplishment. Congratulations to, uh, to Kaylee for, for winning that award. In addition, uh, Gregory Jones, uh, he's a volunteer member at Company 5 and also an admin. Just so happens Greg is also the chief flight paramedic with uh, Chesterfield Fire and EMS for Met Flight 1, the helicopter service we primarily use in the county, was also received a regional, gov a regional ODEMSA award for outstanding EMS administrator. Captain uh, Blake Markey and Former Chief Wayne Allen were recently recognized during EMS Week by the American Legion. Uh, Captain Markey was recognized as the Career Firefighter of the Year, and Chief Allen was recognized as the Volunteer Member of the Year. So we're really proud of them. Summertime is here, and uh, every time in the summer, you always heard Chief McKay speak about the, uh, the activity on the James River, uh, in particular uh, people who enjoy the river from a recreational aspect. They float in inner tubes from point A to point B and sometimes misjudge the time. Uh, so far, we haven't been there for, uh, for that type of emergency uh, as, of, as of this day, but I just want to remind everybody that the float times are posted on our website, and if you are planning a trip on the river, be prepared and take a look at how long it takes to float with inner tubes. It's almost 12 hours between Westview and Maintenance, and many people misjudge that time and end up on the water overnight. We have been on the river recently, though. We did have a, uh, an island fire on the river uh, just uh, last week, and we deployed our boats, and we also used for the first time our new 
compressed air uh, firefighting system that's portable that can be placed on a boat and take a, taken out on the river if there's uh, some type of fire suppression emergency. And we were able to, uh, to use that recently. Appreciate your support and being able to have that. <clears throat> Moving on to the, uh, the fire front of the department. Um, recently, in the last uh, week before last, we acquired the Department of Fire Programs mobile burn trailer. This is a uh, structure fire simulator that runs off of LP gas, and we brought it to our fire rescue training center, and we ran Evolutions live fire training scenarios for over the course of about four days. We had almost 40 live fire exercises and rotated through uh, 80 uh, firefighters, both career and volunteer. Uh, the training was phenomenal, and all of our instructors and members uh, made a huge commitment to make that a success. Back to uh, trying to you know, reduce response times and uh, grow the fire rescue department. You know our hiring process uh, is, is in full swing. And as of this morning, we had uh, 61 applications uh, on file. It closes on June the 7th. Uh, looking at those applications, just a quick overview, it looks like probably about um, a third of those people who have applied are at a minimum EMTs, which is a significant uh, certification. Uh, and then about two-thirds of the applicants probably have fire and EMS certifications. We are prepared to offer a fire training uh, school if necessary in order to be able to fill the positions that you guys have so graci graciously granted us. I want to thank you also for uh, addressing the and raising the starting salary so that we can compete in the region uh, for these members. When the applicant pool is relatively small, when you look at all of the other departments around us are, are pretty much doing the, the exact same thing. I want to let you know, uh, and, and this was already on uh, schedule, and Mr. Badesky mentioned uh, about the uh, tragedy in Virginia Beach, and God knows we hope it never comes uh, here or any closer uh, to here, but we do have a class, a FEMA class next week that's, uh, we have 45 uh, people enrolled in. It's titled Campus Emergencies Prevention uh, Response and Recovery, and we're going to be having that program up at the Central High School Cultural Arts Center. And that is um, filled with uh, personnel from the county government, the schools, the public safety uh, sector, as well as uh, some of the surrounding jurisdictions are, are sending personnel to that. And it is a FEMA class that Chief McKay secured for us uh, last summer that has materialized and we've had an overwhelming response to it. We'll actually uh, follow that program up with uh, on June 22nd and 23rd with a tactical emergency casualty care class where we actually drill with the sheriff's office in that type of uh, hostile environment of an active threat or an active assailant. And we'll be doing that somewhere here in the county. Uh, and we'll let you know if you want to come out and witness any of those um, exercises. In conclusion, um, we had the opportunity this morning, the, the sheriff extended an invitation to me uh, to meet with uh, Hannah Rudy. If you remember, uh, Hannah was here presenting in March about her the pro project Baby In, Baby Out, trying to save uh, children from being left in uh, hot cars. You know, we had an, an incident of that in Goochland last year. It was very tragic and sad. Uh, her project is moving forward, and I thought she would be happy to know that she's receiving some uh, good publicity for it and a lot of support for it. And these are some of the tags that she actually uh, has provided. I'll leave these with you, whether you can hang on your rear view mirror to remind uh, parents about children in the, in the backseat of their car, as well as uh, dashboard stickers. And she's obviously made some uh, in other languages uh, so that everyone has the opportunity to, to be saved and, and helped by this program. And with that, uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have um, or anything in the report or anything else for that matter. Questions for Chief Ferguson? Uh, Chief, um, were you able to talk Ms. Gray into volunteering since she's Ms. got experience? Ms. Gray could very easily be a, a very good advisor for us, and uh, I, she quickly told me that. I can't, I can't volunteer. There you go. I tried. There you go. However. We appreciate that. Ms. Gray, we appreciate your support as well as Ms. Moore's support and all the citizens of the county and Board of Supervisors, thank you for your support for the fire oh, rescue one, department. One more thing, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, so, Chief Ferguson, on the uh, volunteer <coughs> hours, that's uh, page 87 of our packet, you're showing none reported, 
under the rescue duty hours for company six in March or April, and then also uh, the fire duty none reported for company six in April. So is that not reported or they there were none? There, there were hours. Uh, they just do not appear in our uh, record uh, management system at that particular time. But company six uh, is pulling volunteer hours, uh, both fire and rescue, on a regular basis. Okay, and, and that's what I thought the case yes, was. I was a little surprised to see that because <coughs> okay. I knew we had I know people who are volunteering up there. Right? Yes, yes ma'am, Abs absolutely. And, and you know, combined with the volunteers and the career members assigned to Company 6, uh, we have a, a really good team approach, uh, and they answer a lot of calls. Right. I'll Thank you very much. That. I, I thought you. that was the case. I appreciate well, I'll that. I'll correct that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just one additional thing, Chief, while you're up there, and, and we've shared this before, but as once the new hires that were approved, seven additional positions, it will be the first time in Goochland's history that all of our stations throughout Goochland will be staffed 24-7 with career personnel once all those positions are hired. So um, we, we've been very reliant historically on volunteers and will continue to be reliant on volunteers, but to augment that in our combination system once those positions are on, uh, we should greatly uh, reduce our response times too. Mr. And we're, this board has been committed to a staffing pattern uh, that will also increase staffing even further in years to come. So, uh, just appreciate you bringing your concerns today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> Next on the agenda is Ms. Kelly Parrish with introduction of new county staff. <coughs> Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Badesky. I'm Kelly Parrish, Director of Human Resources, and I am thrilled to present a new staff member to the Human Resources Office. Mm. Michelle, would you stand, please? Michelle uh, Sutton joined the HR staff as an HR analyst on May 16th. She may look familiar because she comes to us from the Department of Social Services, where she has experience in HR and payroll as well. So I am very pleased to welcome her to my staff. Yay. That is all for today. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Right. And Kelly welcome just back. can't talk to Kim any longer, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're here to support Kim as well. <laughs> Next item is the planning and development activities. They're in the packet. Any questions? Um, and accounts payable, they're also in the packet. Any questions on those? If not, we will move to our consent agenda. Mr. Budeski, can you take us through it? Yes, Mr. Chairman, for those that are not as familiar with the consent agenda, uh, some of these are transactional business items that the board may have discussed uh, in past meetings or review, or often referrals to future meetings for, for additional action. So I'm gonna take a little bit of time and just walk through. Um, items one and two, uh, Debbie's here with the school, just in case you have any additional questions. but. Uh, the first item uh, requested to amend the 2019 school budget by increasing the school's operating fund by 21779 and decreasing the textbook fund by 1505 and increasing the school's cafeteria fund by 5000 There's no additional local impact uh, that you have to worry about on that particular item. Item number two, um, this is primarily uh, reallocation of uh, uh, CIP funds uh, from projects uh, to... Um, complete the track renovation project before the uh, end of the fiscal year. And so these were funds that uh, already in their budget, they're just being requested to reallocate them to a different project. Items three, four, and five um, in your um, package today are requests to set for public hearings on July 2nd. Um, and specifically, these are uh, state law changes uh, that uh, had come out of the General Assembly session, um, and Ms. McGee is certainly available to answer any additional questions for you, but the, no actions requested on those other than the request to set today, um, and you'll have a full public hearing on those for July 2nd. Item number six in your package, you had a resident come out today to speak to the Bridgewater subdivision. We've been working with the residents of Bridgewater for a couple years now uh, directly on trying to come up with a resolution. Uh, the board had stepped up and worked with VDOT to take care of the turn lanes in Broad Street. Uh, ultimately about two-thirds of the project costs are covered 
we approached the residents in that particular subdivision to complete the roads uh, to create a service district for a third. Um, we had asked the residents, and there's 31 property owners in Bridgewater subdivision, if you will. We had asked the residents that, you know, this isn't something that we were trying to, to force on the neighborhood. We wanted their feedback before we had even scheduled the public hearing. After, uh, at this point, we received feedback from about 26 of the residents um, within uh, Bridgewater. 19 have indicated uh, an expressed interest in moving forward with the service district. Six or seven um, uh, are still expressing some concerns and frustrations and have, have not indicated their support. But at this point, we're referring it, uh, rec recommending to refer on to for public hearing. There's no action on that particular item here today. Um, number seven. Number seven is actually a cleanup item. Um, it is uh, in your adopted annual budget. We adopted a common carrier tax rate of three dollars and seventy-five cents per <coughs> code. It really can only be a dollar, and per practice, it's only been a dollar. Um, we're just asking you to um, codify the dollar uh, as accurate and change the three seventy-five. So everything. Um, Practice-wise and application-wise has been correct. It's just incorrectly advertised at 375 in your adopted budget, so this would actually change that to the dollar. Item number eight uh, in your budget or in your consent agenda is an authorization for an incentive for the first ho in hotel in the county. This one's actually under construction. We've been talking with this project for several years, well before um, any ground was broken. This is an incentive. They're, they're investing um, just over $16 million in this particular project. This is a tax reimbursement incentive of up to $200,000 once all those investments are made. These are rear end incentives. Um, the taxes have to be paid and these qualifications and job qualifications in addition to the capital investment has to be met before they would actually even qualify for this. Uh, and so there's no upfront funds, no potential loss for the county. Um, all once taxes are collected and rebated. And the Taco Creek Service District tax is not impacted with that particular item that's paid in full. Um, and the last item that I have for you on your consent agenda, um, we uh, had done a bid process for a Tucker Park pedestrian path. For those residents that are familiar with Tucker Park right now, you know we have one side that has a um, boat ramp, boat launch area, and we have another side that has the, the trail. Um, we have actually been in, in efforts for a while to actually connect both sides of the park. Um, and we did a bid process, and uh, we're recommending to execute an award of 138000 for the Tucker Creek um, pedestrian path between the funds we already have um, and the funds that we have from the Friends of Tucker Park, we're also asking for you uh, in your motion for approval for the consent agenda to appropriate $19,103 from the funds uh, there to, to total the funds that we'll need to complete that particular project and award that contract. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's the, your consent agenda. Staff's here for any additional questions you may have on any of these items. Uh, and you're certainly welcome to adopt as a block or pull any out as you'd like uh, for any further discussion. Any questions on either any of the items or wish to pull anything out of the consent agenda? If not, uh, do we have a motion to, uh, to approve? Mr. Chairman, I move approval of items one through nine uh, in their entirety on today's uh, consent agenda. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions, none. Okay. Consent agenda passes. Next item on our agenda is Mr. Drumwright with our recap of our legislative session. Good afternoon, Paul Drumwright, Administrative Services Manager. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, speak to you briefly about the uh, wrap up the legislative uh, session. Um, you already uh, had on your consent agenda the uh, issues that are, are 
items that you needed to take that were coming out of that. But so these are going to really focus more on priority areas where we uh, focus during the session. Um, as everybody knows, the session ended April 3rd. Uh, they were supposed to go home. Um, if you heard the news today, the governor is going to be calling the General Assembly back into special session to deal with some legislation uh, related to, unfortunately, the incident that did occur down in uh, Virginia Beach. So what that will be, uh, we don't know what type of legislation, and we don't know exactly the time frame of when that uh, special session will occur. But so they will be back in town before uh, next uh, winter. Um, and so you can see the statistics on the screen of the session bills. I'm not going to go over that too much. Uh, when it hit our priority request, the number one priority request related to uh, proffers and clarifying the capacity language of public facilities. As uh, the board is uh, aware and as we presented at previous updates, both bills that we got had carried for us by Senator uh, Peak and also uh, Delegate Ware and McGuire did not uh, secede. Um, there was other conditional rezoning proffer bills that did move forward. Those do uh, have some uh, application to Goochland as we go forward. So it didn't get everything we wanted, but it did move the needle. Uh, the impact fee bills did uh, wind up getting finally disposed of. And so that issue right now is off the table. Moving along. Uh, from one of our other priority areas, which is uh, expand broadband. There were three bills that we were tracking, or three items that we were tracking that were successful. The first one is uh, a ability for uh, localities to create service districts related to broadband um, uh, service for private providers. Seeing exactly how this will play out, uh, we're still watching the implementation part of it. Um, I know there will be some information sessions from BACO and from the state later on uh, this month. Um, the other one is allowing uh, or requiring both uh, Dominion and Appalachian Power to do pilot projects related to middle mile fiber, use of their middle mile fiber to private providers to uh, reduce the cost of having infrastructure. And so right now Appalachian Power is actually well on their way with their pilot project. Uh, Dominion Power is being a little bit more um, cagey with how they're going to plan to handle their piece of this pilot project. So it's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, and then the final one was money in the budget for the uh, Virginia Telecommunication Initiative, otherwise known as VATI. The governor had been asking for $50 million, did not get that but they did move it up to $19 million, which is a significant increase from the $4 million that it is currently. So then that's something that we are tracking and have participated in information sessions on. Other uh, priority request, we only had one from the uh, really that had something, it was for the related to the registrar's office and compensation, and that did not actually uh, succeed. So moving on, we also had three bills of interest that we tracked and actually responded to. Um, two, one was to uh, support, and then two were we were opposing, the uh, county was opposing, and in all those accounts, they were successful. So the two we opposed did not move forward. The one we supported did move forward. So that's uh, good news for us. Um, that one that moved forward was related to Virginia voter registration system and security uh, measures. And it was just trying to uh, clarify some stuff for localities, make it uh, less um, time intensive and uh, uh, for the registrar's office. The other two, one related to agritourism and weddings, and then the, uh, another was uh, machinery and tools tax change that would have been a significant impact to the county. So that is our legislative session in a uh, brief uh, less than 10 minutes. Um, where we are now is we are in the process of preparing for the upcoming legislative session. We are talking with departments and agencies about 
uh, issues that they have. Um, and so I'm here asking the same thing as the board uh, has ideas of what they would like to see for next year. Please let staff know, let Mr. Bedeski or myself know, and we can add that into the list as we prepare for having our usual luncheon with the delegation in the fall time frame. Uh, because we, we will then start working on that. As you are aware, it's over the summer in the fall where the actual work and preparing of a bill takes place. So when it comes time for a session to start, you can be successful with having a coalition or having your stuff all ready to go. With that, I'll be happy to take any of your questions. Questions for Mr. Drumright? Ms. Muscolette? Uh, just one, Mr. Drumright. We don't have a date yet for the um, or get together with our delegation. No, ma'am. Okay. I was actually in discussion with um, a member of the delegation, and they are still just trying to figure out what they're doing the rest of this month. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, committing okay. to the fall is a... Um, a stretch, especially now as you throw in the now mix of that special session of when that will occur and when they have to be back. So that will really adjust everybody's calendar. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add one of the, um, and Ms. Hobbs spoke to it earlier today, there was actually legislation that would have helped avoid what the Electoral Board just had to do that failed last year that would have solved some of these problems. We are working with the Electoral Board one way or another, there's going to be some interim efforts going to be done here, but to understand how we as the county can also have a role in advocating that. I think last year, the electoral board sort of took that on their own and they didn't ask for our support because they thought it would not have gotten defeated. Um, and unfortunately it did, and, and it's having this ripple effect on Goochland as well as many other jurisdictions. And so we'll be working to make sure that we're a part, an active part of that legislation throughout the next year as well. That is one of the ones we're, we're looking at adding onto our list, and Mr. Budeski is correct. Um, looking at the, even the voting history on that, that was well on its way um, out of the station to success and hit a roadblock, um, and even that roadblock, even our advocacy probably would not have stopped that. Um, but so, uh, so we'll, a, something we'll add for the future. A question or comment related to that. Is it possible to, I know Mr. Lind has um, gone to, Ms., um, to the Attorney General uh, regarding this change, is it possible that we could do something on this bill during that special session? I, I can't if, confirm that we could, but more than likely when they do a special session, they do try to limit it to specific, specific topics. topics. Um, otherwise, it opens Pandora's box and everything else. And so um, that's something we can, can investigate um, and see if that is an option. I think um, Pandora's I just box is open. We just need to close it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that other Pandora's yeah, box. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's worth trying. And maybe Mr. Lynn can go directly to the governor and, and request something. But um, anyway. That, we will we'll be happy to look in to see if that is something that is feasible. Mr. Chairman, I had one other um, update uh, to let you all know. Uh, Virginia Housing, we, we did have our proffer bills uh, defeated, though we you know presented our concepts and ideas and why they were important. From that, the Virginia Housing Commission is having a proffer or impact fee work group meeting. So this issue is not yet dead. That They're having that on June 10th going to be chaired by Senator Bill Stanley, who was very active in the proffer uh, negotiation that was going on this past year, and it's for representatives of the localities, home builders, and realtors. Um, I have been asked to speak at that uh, presentation to present Goochland's perspective. So I'm not holding out to tell you that we're suddenly going to have a proffer bill, but um, what we had to say to the General Assembly this past year was at least heard enough that they're interested in, in continuing to discuss it. Whether that is a dead horse we are beating, I have no idea. But um, I, having been asked, I thought it was worthwhile to at least uh, tell our story. So we'll be doing that. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Drumright? No, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Lumpkins? Th thank you. Just real quick, I, I think in the earlier years, prior to last year, we would have the meeting in, I think, I recall even like in the middle of the summer, like July or something. So, I think last year we did September. I, I would just encourage you to do what you can to not let that slip 
further into the fall because I think we're, we're less time, much less time to be. A, that's a critical, critical window there. To, to I think you even said it that you know the summer and, and early fall is the time to be doing things. If we slip much later, I think we'll lose some opportunities. And, and that's where we are now. That's where we're, we're um, definitely trying not to go any further. We're actually looking, making sure we look at dates as many dates as we can. But that's why we're doing some of this talking with departments now, and we've been talking with them for over a month about it, about issues that they may have, so we can start getting that process going well even before that lunch, so that when we come to that lunch, right. we're well prepared. Good. Yep. School board will be well represented again, I know, right? <laughs> look, look Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tomer Wright. Next item on the agenda is the adoption of the Economic Development Strategic Plan. Mr. Kildoff. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Mr. Badesky, I'm Todd Kildoff, Deputy County Administrator for Economic and Community Development, and I have the pleasure of, of presenting to you the Economic Development Strategic Plan update uh, for your consideration uh, for adoption. Um, it's amazing to think about, here we go, now it's working. Um, it's amazing to think about where the Economic Development Department was uh, this time last year versus where we are today. Um, last year, we just had one person that was really doing all the work. Um, we just had the one Economic Development Director. Um, and unfortunately, after he left us to be with his family uh, back in South Carolina, it afforded us the opportunity uh, to do some restructuring and sort of expand the department a little bit more so we can reach those entities and existing businesses and new businesses that we haven't really, that that, that one person wasn't able to get to. So um, we're very excited about where we are today um, and to present this update to you. Uh, for the public's perspective, if they didn't know, uh, in July of last year, uh, the Board of Supervisors and Economic Development Authority held a joint work session to go over the plan that exists. We, we do have a plan. Um, it's the, the strategic, strategic plan from 2011. Um, but we know as, as we looked through it and, and read through it that there were some different focuses that we wanted, some different strategies that we wanted associated with that. Um, so that, that was the whole point of having that, that work session. And what came out of it was a lot of great information from the consultant that was there. We had a lot of great feedback from yourselves and from the, from the EDA. Um, and before I continue, we do have a copy of the plan that we, we put up there on the podium for each of you. So um, after the economic development director uh, left us when talking about the restructuring, um, we ended up hiring, and I want to introduce our staff that's here. Uh, we have Sarah Worley. Um, she's our economic development coordinator focused more on our existing businesses here in the county, um, which is an extremely important position, and Casey Verberg, who we hired from North Carolina. Um, we're, we're happy to have her here, and she's our economic development coordinator focused more on the new business side of things. Um, so you can already see with, with um, Sarah, Casey, and myself involved, and Mr. Badesky as, as himself is involved as well, um, the four of us are doing what one person was doing at this time last year. So we've really expanded ourselves, and we're doing a lot more, and we're able to do a lot more uh, for, for our businesses and for our citizens. But in January of 2019, we were able to sit down as a fully staffed economic development department, and that's really where the pen hit the paper when it came to updating this plan. Uh, we had, uh, I can't even tell you how many of the large post-it notes that we had up on the wall and talking about different goals and strategies and we had things crossed out and it looked like just a crazy football play uh, but at the end of the day Casey and Sarah were able to pull it all together in the document that you have before you um, and we're very proud of, of, of the plan that we have. Um, we actually provided it to the EDA a few months ago uh, and they reviewed it and looked at it. They had a few questions, uh, a few comments about it. Uh, there was one thing they pointed out that was very interesting is, and this kind of ties into your comment, Mr. Peterson, to, to VDOT with sort of the acronym aspect. <laughs> we had a few acronyms that were in the plan, and some of the EDA said, hey, what are some of these acronyms? Um, so we, we added just a sheet at the very back, a glossary that had some of the acronyms in it. Um, one of the other comments was, uh, and I'll get a little further into the plan on this, was all the work that's associated 
with the individual goals and strategies that are inside of this plan. Uh, we very much appreciated that comment because we recognize how much work this plan actually has inside of it and what lays in front of us over the next several months, arguably a few years, um, if you've seen that. But I'll, I'll get a little more into that here in just a moment. Uh, but uh, we got to a point where the EDA looked at the plan and approved it at their May meeting. And so we're here before you now um, with a staff recommendation for adoption. And I'm going to go through some of the highlights of the plan. I will not read it front to back, <laughs> even though we have a little bit more time because Paul went quickly. Um, but I'll just go over some of the highlights for you. And if you have any questions about it, I'm happy to answer any of those questions. And Casey and Sarah here as well. So a lot of changes were made from, from the original plan. Uh, we really have these four main highlights. Uh, we really have the three legs of the stool, which is focusing on the new business, the existing business, and the tourism, with the administrative being supporting all three of those. Because without the administrative aspect, how do you really have all the goals and metrics that you can track on the other items themselves? Um, but you have, see our bubbles there on the, on the right side on the image. You can see really, and I'm going to go into each one of these real quick, um, the existing business, new business, and tourism, how they all really do work together. Um, the one thing with the plan is we really wanted to have a vision statement that pulled together all the, the four items that were on the previous slide. So I'm just going to read it real quick and touch on how each one of those is, is addressed. Uh, to attract, cultivate, and retain diverse business in Guchan County, by promoting economic growth through commercial and industrial development, preserving the county's agricultural heritage. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot going on in this vision statement, but really to attract that portion is really more focused on the new business side. Cultivate and retain diverse businesses, and a few other words in there are really focused more on the existing business and the tourism aspect. And the last item, preserving Goochland's agricultural heritage, is really where the administrative, the, the fourth leg of that comes into play. Uh, we, when this, we actually presented a few different vision statements to the EDA, and this is the one that they really liked, and we kind of tweaked it a little bit at the meeting, but at the end of the day, this is really what, what they focused on and, 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 and approved. So now I want to move into each of those four legs of the plan. Uh, for the new business, as you can see, we have, uh, it's going to be a very similar format for all of these, by the way. Um, there's going to be a goal, there's going to be objectives, and as the plan you see in front of you, you can skip through it. I think the plan's about 64 pages, and the lion's chunk of that is really each individual objective and each individual strategy broken out on its own sheet. So that's really why the, the plan is, is, is as big as it is, because we want each one to have its own sheet and its own attention. Um, and I'm going to show you one of the sheets at the end of the presentation. Uh, but for the new business side, it's really to stimulate investment and, gro and job growth uh, through new business development. Um, and you see the five objectives here. Uh, we want to increase capital investment, of course. That's a new business focus. Uh, effectively market Guchin County to increase the new business. Establish target markets. Develop an incentive program, which we've sort of already started on some of these items. And understand Guchin County's workforce needs. All these are very important. Uh, workforce needs, you're going to see that on the existing business side as well. Um, because for both of them, really, what is the workforce? Where is the workforce? Um, what is the workforce focused on? Is the Richmond region really more concentrated on the hospitality side of things? Is it concentrated more on the technology side of things? These are all things that we want to look at and analyze um, um, internally in Guchin County and also in the Richmond region. Um, objective 1.3, we actually get asked that question a lot, establish target markets. Uh, Virginia Economic Development Partnership, uh, Sarah and I actually presented to them, uh, golly, I think it was November of last year, October maybe. And one of the things they asked us was, what, what are we focused on? There's a room full of 70 people in downtown Richmond asking us what we're focused on. And quite honestly, we didn't have the best answer. We know what we're not focused on, but we didn't really have a good answer for what we're actually focused on. We know some of the good things that we would like to see in the county, but to actually say it in a one or two sentence thing is something that, that's why, we, that's why you see it here as part of the plan. It's something that we really want to focus on over the next year or two and, and hone in on target markets. I think we heard from somebody at a town hall meeting once. They said, I don't want to see smokestacks on Hockett Road. We know some things that we're not going to be focusing on. So, uh, but, it's, but that's what we really want to focus on with um, on the new business side, because we do get asked that question a lot. Uh, for existing business, uh, they call it BRE sometimes, um, business retention and expansion. Uh, retain an existing business businesses here in Guchin County. Of course, this is important to us. We want to create a business visitation program. Evaluate incentives, as mentioned on the new business side. Evaluate incentives on the existing business. 
market existing businesses and their success. We've already taken many steps on that avenue. We've increased our, actually, I shouldn't say increase, we've started a social media feed. Um, we've actually increased our presence on that and with some of our other software programs that are out there. Uh, evaluate the need and benefits for incubator and co-working space. Offer education and training programs for existing businesses. This is sort of in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce. If you get their emails, you know they do their own training, and we have an excellent relationship with them. So we work closely with them on what training programs they have offered and what, we're, what we would like to do as well and see where we can partner on things. Uh, offer resources to existing businesses to help their businesses grow. So all these are extremely important uh, to us on the existing business side of things. Tourism, I believe this is another item that came directly out of that joint session last year uh, to promote. Uh, the goal as we, we have it here is to promote, enhance, and expand tourism offerings in Goochland County. So from the objectives, uh, creating Goochland's brand. What is our tourism brand? That's something that we want to talk about um, and analyze and look at our neighbor localities. It's always good to see what surrounding localities are doing as well. Uh, market existing tourism offerings. Build relationships with our community and regional partners. Uh, promote agritourism. This is something that as early as this morning we were talking to a local business owner about sort of their agritourism and how that is. Um, so I, I guess let me sidestep that for a second. A lot of these objectives aren't just objectives that we're going to do. A lot of them we're already doing. A lot of this stuff we're already focused on. We've already hit the ground running on so many of these items and I don't want to discount that at all and I wanted you to be aware that a lot of these items we're already in conversations with and we're already talking to existing businesses and, and our uh, regional partners and we're also talking to some other economic development authorities and economic development departments and trying to find out what are they doing? What are you guys doing? What makes you successful? Um, let's try not reinvent the wheel. If somebody else is successful, let's see what they're doing. So those are the things that we're focused on. And the last one is enhance outdoor activities, uh, which Goochin County has a lot of outdoor activities. Um, that's something that we pride ourselves on, and we've been reposting things on social media as well. Todd, if you don't oh, mind, I sure. just want the board to be very clear. The tourism component of this is not as robust as the remaining sections. Uh, that was intentional. We plan to spend the summer uh, working more on building out the tourism component. Uh, we keep calling this a, sort of a three-legged stool, which is the new existing in tourism, and then there's the staff and operational side. Um, the tourism piece, we will be back to you most likely in the fall uh, with a much more robust plan uh, to amend this plan. And so uh, I think we're going into it. Uh, Parks and Rec is going to have a major component uh, in the tourism ownership uh, along with our existing team. Uh, these we, are, we have included in here because they came out of the joint retreat, but there is a lot more that we've been discussing that we plan to build this out and bring back to you. So you'll see this again. Thank you. Um, and the last piece that we talked about, sort of the, I don't know if we're on three legs or four legs anymore, but <laughs> uh, the administrative side, which really supports the other items. Uh, this, this one's actually extremely important. Now I want to sort of focus a little more on objective 4.3, but I'd like to read the goal first. Uh, create an effective and efficient economic development department. And I think with this new structure we have, uh, with our refocus and putting uh, our, our, our employees in certain situations where Sarah's really focused on existing business, Casey's focusing more on the new business, um, I'm helping out supporting where I can. I, I think that's just really important. It's going to set us up for success. For the objectives, uh, we really want to set some standards for the Economic Development Department. And again, all this is outlined a little bit more in the package you have in front of you. Uh, creation of a, of a Goochin County Business Center. Uh, we're already talking with the Chamber of Commerce about partnering with them on, on how we can, I mean, they're a huge asset to the county and uh, we want to work closely with them. So creation of a Goochin uh, County Business Center, is, it would be a very important and a very good objective to have. Uh, 4.3 is create metrics for the ED department. This one's huge for us. That's basically the plan itself. That's really where we're going to come back to you at some point in the future, six months, 12 months from now, um, and outline all the different objectives that are inside of this and try and explain where we are with certain situations. Uh, let's just say, and I, I've used the example of existing business. Let's say one of our goals for existing business is to knock on 10 existing business doors per month. But let's say we only ever get to eight. Our goal is 10, but let's say we get to eight. Well, we we said 10, we want to try to get to 10, but if we only got to eight, why is that? Maybe there's a good reason why. 
Um, and that's, that, that's sort of the, those are our goals that we want to get to. And if eight is really um, where the meat is, if that's where we're finding out, we don't want to just meet with businesses to meet with businesses. We want them to be productive. We want to know about them. We want them to know we're here. And if eight's where that number needs to be, we would adjust that to eight. Um, but I just wanted to be clear. But that's what we want to do and present to you guys um, uh, during uh, probably 12 months from now with all of our objectives. Uh, and the last one is examine the uh, Economic Development Authority's role to further enhance the economic development in the county. And we've actually talked to them about partnering. In the plan, um, any of the objectives that you flip to, there's a section uh, that says owner. And if you look where it says owner, it's either parks and recreation staff, economic development staff, GIS staff, and board of supervisors. You flip to another page and it says economic Devel development staff, economic development authority. So it's really assigning ownership to, to these items that are inside of this plan. And we felt that was important as well. And that's really what you see right here. This is actually a snippet uh, from the plan itself. And again, like I said, the lion's share of it is really these sheets. Each sheet is set up identical. They all have these individual tiles that show the objective, the goal at the top, objective, strategy, and owner right below it. So you can see here it says, uh, for the objective to increase capital investment in the county, the strategy is build relationships with key stakeholders. Uh, we didn't really touch on the strategies. It's one of the things we kind of pulled out of this, but every single one of these has its own strategy. Uh, another important item is the owner. This one's the ED staff and the EDA specifically. And then you can kind of read through the individual tiles as you look down through on uh, where we are in the process, expected timelines, deadlines, status, things like that. So. Um, the action plan on the right side is how we're going to get there. I'm not going to read through down that, but, but that's where we actually are telling ourselves, here's how we're going to achieve these goals. Here's how we're going to get to these strategies. And that's the high level view of this updated plan. Um, we're very proud of it, but we're here to answer any questions if you have any. Questions for Mr. Kilduff? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, so thank you, Mr. Kilduff. I know sure. a lot of work went into this with a lot of people, so it's quite an impressive document. I just have one comment, and that's under the incentives. And I just want to be sure that we're really, really clear here, at least from my perspective, um, to create policy documents with thresholds available. I mean, every incentive is done on a case-by-case -case basis, and I hope we're not going to create something and imply that it's available because that may not be true. I feel comfortable saying that, yes, if Mr. Bedeski wants to chime in. But yeah, that's really the goal is, it's sort of about having the framework mm -hmm. um, for the EDA or for yourselves to look at, but it's not saying that we actually have to do that if some other project came in that didn't really fit into the bucket. We wanted to have something that we can speak to and talk to um, potential businesses about, or even existing businesses about. Um, not painting ourselves in the corner, I think that's really, is that the well, question? yeah, I just want to be sure. Not painting ourselves in the corner. You know, we're generally that's right. are not too interested in doing these, although we know we need to do some of them. Um, right. I understand that, but um, yeah, just don't Good. paint us in the corner, because right. you might not get the answer you want. <laughs> that's right. Ms. Yeah. 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 Uh, keep incentive is, is maybe a misused term sometimes. Incentives can also be good business practices, low taxes, uh, easy processes right. and less you bureaucracy. And, and so it's not always right. a cash payment to somebody. Uh, we don't do, we haven't done and we don't do upfront cash payment incentives. Right. That's not uh, r completely right. what this is intended. It's just making sure that um, we're, we're in the game on certain projects, but it, it does not always mean some, some level of cash payment. Right. As long as we're well clear. Thank you. Yes, good comment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions for Mr. Kilduff? Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Chair. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, Todd, again, um, thank you so much for all your efforts on this and everybody that was been involved. Um, this has been a Herculean task. Um, going forward, as you develop the metrics, um, as I looked at the 19 objectives, objectives that you put up there, when I think about the team and you get up tomorrow, do you go off in 19 directions at once? Or <laughs> so what I encourage you to do as you develop the metrics is to maybe distinguish things between near-term goals, intermediate goals, or long-term goals, um, and then distinguish again between things that are quantifiable, which maybe might be measurable in the metric sense, uh, and those that are qualifiable, which means policy-type um, 
we encourage this or we lean this direction, whatever. So you've got specific measurables which are quantifiable, policies that are maybe not, and then within the measurables, which ones are short-term, long-term. That way when you get up tomorrow, you can say, okay, I'm going to focus on the short-term measurable goals today. So it, it at least right. directs your efforts in some, some fashion. So I just encourage you to think about that as yes, you sir. come back to us with what your, what your answer is on that. That's right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Other questions? <coughs> Comments? Mr. Lumpkins. Yeah, quick, sir. Uh, quickly, thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, this is a good, good results, and <coughs> we've come a long way since that meeting at yeah. West Creek. This is pretty good. Um, <laughs> just maybe more of a process question that just came to my mind when I see this as an action item. Um, what is the significance of us ad approving or ad ad adopting this? Just kind of curious, what's the significance? Because uh, it's a very much a living document that I can, and you s alluded to it, and I see for, I see gaps. Not, gaps is not a good word, but I see areas that I know you're going to be focusing on as as what Mr. Peterson said, you, you chart out a timetable. Right. So I'm just kind of curious, what's the significance of us approving this? Um, I think it's an, it, for me, it's an ownership piece showing a commitment to our community and to the business community that economic development is a focus area, that we're doing it in a planned, uh, collective and conservative manner, um, and that it is one of our priority focus areas. And so um, I think there is some value in it. It's an ownership um, also in this plan of the recognition of the value and role of the EDA, the staff's role, the board's role. Um, in economic development planning um, and programming for our community. And so, I, you know, I know ownership is uh, often used for many things, but I, to me it just demonstrates to our community and the business community our commitment to this area. Uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm on board, uh, certainly. I just think that, you know, when, when it changes, I guess we're going to have to have some kind of an idea of, like, when we make changes, do we want to come back and, you know, I mean, I, you don't need the board's participation in every micro little thing you do, but I, I certainly see a lot of important things in here that I hope, I, I know you will keep us informed of, but I guess at some point we're going to have to refresh our approval or or, or uh, something like that. If yeah, you, you actually raise a good point. The, the, as good as the last plan in 2011 and 12 was, it was very event-centric that sort of the event was done and you sort of checked a box. There wasn't a lot of, this plan is intended to be more living and reviewed more ongoing um, because the old plan said develop a website, check the box. Websites and content and all those kinds of things are living and changing um, and the demands for the different sources of information are changing. This is going to change annually. We may realize 12 months from now that some of the strategies that we've presented and adopted um, are not exactly where the market's going or as effective. And so I think in our annual reviews, if there are changes in course you know, the way the path that we want to move forward changes, we will be bringing to you those amendments. Yeah, I wouldn't want this to sit out as a link on a website and just get stale because I don't think if, if we're doing what we're talking about, this is not going to get stale at all. Now we're, we're already moving on a lot of the items, to be honest. So, so goal four, create an effective and efficient economic development department. And in that, in that um, when you talk about the, the count, Goochland County Business Center, that's pretty exciting to me. That's pretty exciting oh stuff yeah. right there. That's yep. and that that's a whole, that's a big project, right there. Oh yeah. encompasses a lot. But I'm just kind of curious. Do you have a talking about you know how often we need to refresh our approval and all that stuff? What's a time frame, right. if it's even one? Ex I mean, it might be too early, but I'm certainly this Goochland Business Center thing. I'm I'm curious if and if anybody's like looked at a calendar and said you know this is when we envision this. Actually, yeah. They uh, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yes. We're, we're hoping it's this fall. Um, we've already been in discussions and partnerships with the uh, Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. We've talked to other business entities uh, that could partner with us. Um, w the business center is in a county-owned facility. We have funds set aside for renovation. Um, and so that is one of the projects that we think that we'd hit this fall. Uh, there obviously, some stars have to align and as we move forward here this summer, but that is one of the projects that's already been I think we've been discussing it now for about six, eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, but you're not already to like the tourism and the incubator center stage of this yet. Not that's no sir. That, that one, uh, you'll notice some of these truly say evaluate. Um, we have not concluded some of the components in here. Um, we, you know, there's been talk uh, 
as far back as the central plan included uh, a business incubator space. There's been some other discussion about business incubator space. But there's different versions of incubators. There's we need to determine do we is there a true need in Goochland County, um, and what model works if it, if it does, and how is it funded, and all those kinds of questions. Um, part of the work of the staff while they're out meeting. Um, existing business does not just always mean brick and mortar existing business. We have a substantial amount of home based business that the intent of an incubator is to help people grow um, in size and scope and provide services that allow them to grow even larger, potentially transition from home base. We need to determine if that is a need. Um, you know, we, when the central plan was developed, it was developed in part because it could have been a potential user and a space, and certainly there's. Uh, uh, internet access there that's of value to some of these businesses to expand and meeting space. But is that the right location in Goochland County? Um, does it make more sense to be in the courthouse area? Does it make more sense to be in the eastern? Uh, but we have not quantified the real need and or user and so I think there's a lot of work in that particular concept that has to be developed before we would recommend any steps forward. Sure, sure. Lots of good partners out there. I think I think we talked about this when I was on the school board about Jay Sargent Reynolds and, and I think keep them in. They, they would probably have some connection to some of this, I would think. So it's, it's exciting. Um, and I think I told y'all when I met on the two by twos, y'all have a very important job. And, and I know we want to support you all because uh, it's, it's exciting. And it's, it's, to me, it's exciting, but it's also important, I think, to get things working together for Goochland uh, effectively. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Chair. Uh, John and Mr. Badesky, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but uh, the question about, you know, why are we doing this and where does it fit in? This board has a strategic plan for the county. And in that strategic plan, there's a, a vision that says that we see this kind of a county out in the future. And then we've tasked each of the agencies to come up with master plans. So there's a master fire rescue, there's a master uh, parks and rec, there's master public utilities, there's, there's all these subordinate master plans on the public facility side um, to support that future vision. The economic development piece, to a large extent, is gonna drive the nature and the extent of the yeah. demand on public services going forward. So as we look at a long-term CIP and we look at a long-term vision for the county, being able to deliver services that don't deteriorate over time as growth occurs, and it will occur, we need to understand the nature of that economic development growth that's driving that demand for services so that all the pieces coordinate. And then I believe on an annual basis, we have each of the master plans with their metrics in them come back to this board to present progress against those metrics and progress against those plans so that we can actively manage this as we go through time. So I think that's how this piece fits into the overall puzzle going forward. And I would envision, again, feedback on those metrics, how we doing, to understand how the economic development is, is taking this county in a certain direction where the facilities need to keep pace with it. So that's that's sure. how I see it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, if I can just add, Mr. Peterson, you asked a question about prioritization. And, and in this plan, it does talk about certain things that will be done in the next six months, 12 months, 24, uh, and so on. The, the plan's dated 2019 through 20, 2024, so it's a five-year plan. There are levels of prioritization of this work effort. The one thing that we plan to do as we report out, just like we do in, on your board agenda items, what references a board specific goal, as we make uh, efforts into accomplishing these kinds of things and or um, learn from some of these, all of our report outs are now going to be referencing uh, at the EDA meetings, at your meetings as we talk about this, give you your biannual and annual reports, it's all going to reference back to this particular document. And if we find that there are gaps or things that we've missed, we will be bringing those back to you. So there are levels of prioritization, um, some of which we're already in the process on. But um, it's, this was one of those plans. We wanted to make sure we had a good foundation, but yet we're still doing the day-to-day -day work. It's not stopped. And so I appreciate the team sort of balancing both of these right now. But uh, I think I think now's the time to sprint once we <laughs> get, get this adopted. and. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And thank you for your comment on the, on the other plans because you're absolutely right. This plan supports all those plans and all those plans support this plan. They all work together. 
um, equally. So it's nice to have this, and that was actually one of our focuses is looking at the comprehensive plan, how's it intertwined, the utilities master plan, how's that intertwined, the major thoroughfare plan, all those roads for new businesses and existing businesses and things like that, it, it does all tie together. That's right. Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the 2019 to 2024 economic development strategic plan as presented. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Kilduff. Mr. Chairman, if I can, uh, Economic Development Authority members were not able to make it here today, but I, I can't thank them enough uh, for their time and participation in this process. They have been, uh, and you know, they all come with a background in the business community, and, and they're a great asset to our team and to the county, so I want to thank them for their time. Well noted. Um, the next item on the agenda is appointments. Uh, we have two appointments um, on, the, on our agenda. Uh, Ms. Uh, Rebecca Massey for the Social Services Board and Mr. Bob uh, Wheatley for the Recreation Advisory Commission. If you recall, we just re um, recognized him last month for his work on the trails at uh, Leaks Mill. Yes. Since both of these volunteers uh, live in my district, I would like to make the motion unless there's any objections to the appointee. So I move that we reappoint Rebecca Massey to the Social Services Board and Bob Whitley to the Recreation Advisory Commission um, this afternoon. <laughs> I left my kind of open. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second. This afternoon. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Abstentions, uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Ms. Massey and Mr. Wheatley for, for their work, work on our important boards. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, the closed uh, meeting for continuing the discussion of performance and duties of our county administrator and county attorney. Uh, so after we receive that motion, we will break for a few minutes, go into closed session. We'll come out of closed session to certify the closed session, and then we'll take a break for dinner. So do we have a motion for closed session? Mr. Chairman, I move in accordance with the provisions of Virginia Code Sections 2.2, 3711, and 3712, and 3711A1 that uh, the Goochin County Board of Supervisors convene in closed meeting for the purpose of discussing the performance and duties of the county administrator and the county attorney as permitted by the code section I cited. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Budeski, would you do a roll call vote? Yes, Mr. Lumpkins. Yes. Mr. Minnick. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Lachalet. Yes. Mr. Alvarez. Yes. So we will uh, go into closed session and uh, as I said, come back, certify, and then we'll take a dinner break. Hope to see you all at 7 p.m. for a short night of hearings. <laughs> <laughs> I move that the uh, Gushan County Board of Supervisors, or Mr. Chair, I move that the uh, Gushan County Board of Supervisors hereby certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under the Freedom of Information Act, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the Gushan County Board of Supervisors in a closed meeting. We have a motion and do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Budeski, will you roll roll? Ms. Lachalette. Yes. Mr. Lumpkins. Yes. Mr. Minnick. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Alvarez. Yes. At this time, we will go ahead and um, take our dinner break. Sorry, Buzz. Buzz. Um, Buzz. And we'll be back at 7 o'clock. Hi. <laughs> Got here just in time. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, at this time, I call to order 
the uh, Grishland Board of Supervisors meeting for June 4th, 2019. Um, as usual, the first item on our agenda will be a citizen comment period. This is not for any item that's on the agenda tonight, but anything of importance to Grishland County that you want to speak about, please come forward, state your name, address, and limit your comments to about three minutes. Seeing none, I'll close the public comment period. Next, uh, we'll start with our public hearings. The uh, first item on our agenda is a, an ordinance change uh, to add section 927 to allow the installation and operation of a video monitoring system on division school buses. Mr. Armstrong will present. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Alvarez, members of the board, and Mr. Badesky. I'm so excited about all the interest tonight in our <laughs> pupil transportation. Um, well, since we uh, last spoke a few months ago, I've added some pretty significant detail uh, to our process and how we would like to implement our ordinance. And as uh, we mentioned back in the winter, this is all about student safety uh, and doing what we can to prevent any incident on our roads with our students boarding and, and getting off of our buses every day. And we're looking at five different routes in our community which uh, serve some pretty high traffic uh, arteries that will be equipped with our stop arm camera system. And I want to talk a little bit more about that process. Uh, again, Code of Virginia really guides us in, in what we include in this ordinance. And this does, of course, uh, facilitate the locality authorizing the division to install the bus stop arm video monitoring system, which is what we are asking for in this ordinance. Uh, and the civil pen penalty is also dictated at $250. Some considerations I just highlight, so I want to make sure we're, we're all clear about. The civil penalty, again, is $250. The penalties levied for the violations uh, may be payable to the school division. Uh, that is not our goal here is to generate revenue. It is to ensure safety. And the prima facie evidence required includes testimony, which would come for our supervisor of school buses, our transportation supervisor, uh, that the vehicle was yellow. That is verbatim from uh, the Code of Virginia, which is provided by the camera footage. And of course, that it was equipped with the warning devices in the form of the stop arm and the blinking red light. And that as well is provided by the camera footage. Here's the process. I realize this is a little, there's a lot going on here, but, but I, I think if you, if you walk with me and you start with the school bus in that upper left-hand corner, uh, the driver would mark the video call transportation on the radio to make sure that they were aware of what had happened. Uh, the transfer state, transportation staff upon that bus arriving at our garage would remove the hard drive, review that video, and capture screenshots of the violation from both the front and the side cameras. Uh, it would produce several images, including the license plate uh, of that vehicle. DMV certified staff, which is going to be our supervisor of transportation, um, will identify the driver using that image and the license plate and prepare a letter which is linked there. And I apologize, I don't have a separate uh, slide for that, but I have a copy I can give to you all to take a look at. And that letter is going to include the ordinance language, the photos actually in the letter um, that they'll be referring to, the notice of the rebuttal process, and the mailing address for the payment, or the affidavit, uh, which go to two different places, payment going to the treasurer, and the affidavit going to the clerk of the general district court. We would mail that letter within 10 days, uh, per Code of Virginia to the registered vehicle address. We'd send a copy to the Goochland County Treasurer. The blue line is the good line. Uh, if the payment is received by the Treasurer within 30 days of mailing, then we, the Treasurer would notify us and we would, again, uh, work through the payment. Uh, if it is not received by the Treasurer within 30 days, this is where it gets a little more complicated. <laughs> the Treasurer would notify us uh, that this vehicle had failed to pay. We would then prepare and file a summons with the General District Court Clerk, who I've already spoken to about this and uh, gotten her blessing as well. And then the general district court clerk would forward that summons to the sheriff's office or the district uh, in which that vehicle is registered for service. And then the payments at that point would be received by a general district court. So that is the process in a nutshell um, in, in the best graphic form I could provide to you. A few other highlights that, that have just brought up some questions in the past. Um, you can rebut uh, that presumption that you were operating the vehicle via a mailed affidavit to the clerk of the general district court. Um, 
or a testimony under oath denying operation of the vehicle or a certified copy of police report that says that your vehicle was stolen prior to that violation. Within the letter that's linked in that presentation, you'll see that we give instructions on where to mail your affidavit, um, and that's included in that notification. The ordinance may direct a civil penalty, as we talked about this before, to the local school division, and the person receiving the citations has provided uh, 60 days for the mailing of summons to inspect the information collected by the video monitoring system. And uh, I looked at the records retention regulations, and we are going to give the 60 days uh, from the date of notification uh, before this is destroyed. Um, that is per that regulation for records retention. And our supervisor transportation, the event that a trial takes place, uh, that's the representative who will attend to testify on our behalf. So our next steps, uh, we would like to begin with a PR blitz this summer using social media, the Gucci and Gazette, our school messenger broadcast system. Then in August, continue that. Allow our drivers to collect data again this fall um, in the summer when we start school. And then have a warning period that when we continue to put the word out about this and make sure that you know we notify violators via letter, continue that PR blitz, and then starting November 1st, go live uh, with the ordinance enforcement to allow ample time to make sure that you know, we're, we're ready to go, which we will be. Um, that is really just the, the main points I wanted to make sure you all were aware of as we hopefully move forward with this ordinance. Again, we appreciate your support as we continue to do what we can to help ensure our student safety. Thank Take you. Any questions? Questions for Mr. Armstrong? Nope. Not this time? answer them all. Okay. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and open Absolutely. the public hearing and then we might call you back if needed. All right. I'll be right back. Thanks. All right. So at this time, I'll open the public hearing on this um, ordinance change. Anyone wanting to speak for or against this item, please come to the microphone. <coughs> Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Any discussion, comments? Do we have a uh, motion? motion? <coughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I move approval, uh, adoption of the uh, ordinance, proposed ordinance, uh, to authorize the school division to install and operate a video monitoring system on school buses as presented tonight. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Budeski, would you do a roll call vote, please? Mr. Minnick? Yes. Ms. Lachalet? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Lumpkins? Yes. Mr. Alvarez? Yes. Motion passes. <coughs> Let's get those cameras out there. <laughs> okay, you got it. Thank you all. <laughs> and I expect all of our hearings are going to be just as quick tonight. <laughs> All right, next item on the agenda is an ordinance to amend section 13-2 uh, to remove provisions limiting the authority of the treasurer to make refunds of erroneous tax payments. Who will be presenting? I'm afraid, Mr. Chairman, you have me on this. Oh, okay. Uh, I am That's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you recently had come before you approval of an erroneous tax refund that was greater than $2,500. And when that came across my desk is the first time I was aware that this uh, ordinance requiring Board of Supervisors <coughs> approval for the refund of anything over $2,500 that was erroneously assessed has been on the books in, in Goochin County since 1997. Um, it was, it is my recommendation, I spoke with uh, uh, Commissioner of Revenue and the Treasurer, met with them about this, that um, that limitation of authority at $2,500 be removed from the ordinance. Um, the uh, ordinance already has uh, an appropriate dual certification process where the Commissioner of Revenue is not only required to report an erroneous assessment and the reason to the Treasurer, but to certify it and then the treasurer would act on that certification. Um, I, I believe having the $2,500 limit, which is not in state law or suggested or recommended <coughs> by it, is unnecessary and, and simply adds to the uh, bureaucracy, perhaps making a citizen of Goochland County who was erroneously assessed wait longer for a refund. So it's my recommendation that you uh, adopt the ordinance amendment as presented. 
questions or comments? No? In that case, I'll open the public hearing. Again, anyone for or opposed to this ordinance change, uh, please come forward to the microphone. Everybody wants their tax returns quickly. <laughs> All right, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. <coughs> Any comments? Questions from the board? Motion? Ready for a motion, Mr. Chairman. I'm ready for a motion. Mr. Okay, Mr. so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the ordinance that uh, to eliminate the $2,500 limit on the trip. Ms. Moore? <laughs> top button. <laughs> top, top button. Okay. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were saying that for later. Um, okay. So, Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the ordinance to uh, eliminate the $2,500 on the Treasurer's Authority, that limit, to issue a tax refund for erroneously paid taxes. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Budeski, would you call the roll? M Mr. Lumpkin. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Ms. Lachalette. Yes. Mr. Menick. Yes. Mr. Alvarez. Yes. Motion uh, carries. Next item is um, zone, a zoning change. Um, Ms. Honor, would you? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Badesky, Joanne Hunter, Director of Community Development. Uh, public hearing this evening is rezoning case 2019-0003, which was filed by Kevin and Tammy Wolf to rezone a piece of property from A1 to RR. Property is located at 2678 Dogtown Road in the central portion of the county. Uh, this property and all the surrounding properties are designated on the comprehensive plan as rural enhancement area and all the surrounding properties are also zoned A1. They are requesting an RR zoning to create one additional lot. Uh, you can see this is the existing parcel. Um, you can see the cleared area where there's an existing tr uh, house there on the property. And then you can see uh, just to the north northeast of the site is there is a private ro road called Dietrich's Cove. This property does not have access to Dietrich's Cove. This property has access through a private road um, out to Dogtown Road. And so what they're proposing to do is, this is the existing house that's located on the property, and you can see how they're proposing to split the lot. It's a 13-acre parcel. Um, both lots would be about six and a half acres. Um, the driveway access that serves the existing house would be extended to the back to provide access to the new additional lot if the rezoning is approved. Um, the parent track the property is zoned agricultural. All the by right subdivision splits have been taken. Therefore, to obtain another uh, lot for this property, they would need to rezone it to a residential district. Um, the applicant has proffered that the property would not be further subdivided, and because it's only one lot, the cash proffer policy does not apply. The applicant did host a community meeting in March. Um, Planning Commissioner Mr. Duke attended the meeting. No neighbors attended, um, and we've received no letters of opposition. Um, at the Planning Commission meeting in May, this request was approved with a 5-0 vote, and no one spoke at the public hearing. So again, just the last of the proffers, the one proffer um, that we'd like to, uh, for the properties that are zoned for these additional lots, is that they can't be subdivided other, any further. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Ms. Hunter? Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Is the applicant here? Would you? Mr. Chairman and other board members. Um, I'm Kevin Wolf. I uh, live in Powhatan County. My address is 2467 West Deer Path Drive in Powhatan. My wife and I have taken the opportunity um, 
to extend um, the welcome of Goochland County by purchasing this piece of property, the 13.09 acres on Dogtown Road 2678. And uh, we are looking to actually, we're in the final stages of re, re um, happing the, the house that's there and uh, making it um, livable again. And um, in the final stages of that, and what we'd like to do in the future, um, in the next couple of years possibly, is to add an additional uh, residence on that piece of property. And to do so, um, talking with the Planning Commission, um, this is the way that we needed to go through and, and get it approved um, through you all. And uh, we would certainly like to uh, take the opportunity to um, have you know, other families here in Gooseland County to support the, the community. Be happy to answer any questions that you have. Question for Mr. Wolf. Let me quickly, how, how do you, you saw the diagram, and I'm looking at the diagram that shows, the, how, how do you access the property? Um, it's actually a deeded right-of-way off of uh, Dogtown Road. Um, it, it runs parallel to that Dietrich that she uh, mentioned. Dietrich Lane is actually a private road that has a multitude of houses on it. This is actually, it, it only has two residences on it currently, and it's a deeded right-of-way that gets back to that 13.09 acres. So what we're proposing is that we extend that deeded right of way through the front portion of the property that we would own to the back portion of the property that we would also own. So it, it would just be an extension of that uh, deeded right of way. And it run, that runs parallel to that Dietrich's, Dietrich's uh, Cove? Cove road. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir, it does. It runs parallel. They, they run literally side by side. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Chairman, um, so that deeded right away, is that paved or gravel? It's gravel. Um, the maintenance of that, is that maintained by the two homeowners on it now? Correct. Uh, is there an arrangement as to how the maintenance requirements are divided? Uh, there, if you're going to add a third party to that, there, you see where well, I'm going with we, we would be the third party uh, mm -hmm. because it would actually be our property on both uh, the two back pieces. Um, and we don't have any future plans of selling it. We're going to be uh, maintaining these, piece, these pieces of property. So um, that would be upon us to, to maintain that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. We'll Thank you. Yeah. call you back if we yes, need sir. to. So at this time, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak in support or against this? Application, please come forward. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Yeah, we're shaving it off. Yeah, everybody's kind of helping. All right, any uh, questions, comments? Uh, since this is in my district, I'll go ahead and uh, make the motion. Um, so I move that uh, we approve the application filed by Kevin and Tammy Wolf. A requesting a rezoning of their 13.9 acres from agricultural A1 general to RR rural residential. Second. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Mr. Budeski, would you please uh, call the roll? Mr. Peters. Yes. Mr. Lumpkins. Yes. Mr. Minnick. Yes. Ms. Lachalette. Yes. Mr. Alvarez. Yes. Thank you. You have your rezoning. Next application, Ms. Hunter. Yes, good evening again. Next public hearing is a conditional use permit 2019-0006. It's a request by Selco Partnership for a 199-foot telecommunication tower. The property is located off of White Hill Road, Whitehall Road, which is in the central western portion of the county. Um, you can see the this is the comprehensive plan map property is surrounded by uh, rural enhancement areas and the property is located just west of the Sandy Hook Rural Crossroad which you can see just off the map where you see a little bit of red. Um, this property and the surrounding properties are zoned A1. There are uh, several residential subdivisions just to the east in the Sandy Hook uh, Rural Crossroad area. You can see this property, um, it's set back from Whitehall Road a good distance, about 3,000 feet, and the property is completely wooded. They are proposing a 199-foot monopole tower. Um, they would allow for co-location for up to four users on the tower. 
Access to the tower will be via an existing 60-foot wide easement. The applicant plans to improve 20-foot of the 60-foot easement with a 12-foot gravel road and a 4-foot clear zone on each side. Uh, the tower would be located approximately 3,000 feet from right Whitehall Road. Uh, there's a significant amount of large trees between the road and the tower. Um, and in the balloon test, um, the applicant will show you probably a little more detail. Uh, the tower was not visible from any public roads. And the tower is also cited to fall within completely within the property. The property is very large. It's a 56-acre piece. So you can see this is Whitehall Road on the top, and sort of this zigzag line is the access easement. So this property is the long rectangular piece here. It has no direct road access. The only access to the property is through this access easement. So they would enter off of Whitehall Road through this existing easement and then come across the, the property owner's property and site the tower there. The leased area for the tower is 100 by 100. Um, you can see this is the access easement coming in and then their drive coming off to serve the tower. Community meeting was held back in February. Mr. Alvarez and six citizens attended. There were questions regarding the access easement and construction tra uh, traffic. They've also done a balloon test, which was held on February 28th, and the balloon was not visible from any public right of way. Um, at the Planning Commission meeting in May, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the request with a 5-0 vote. Um, there was one person who spoke in opposition uh, during the public hearing, citing concerns with the proposed request being contrary to the easement documents. I'll review the conditions um, that we're proposing, and these are the standard conditions for all towers. Uh, one, that the communication tower, that would be the use. Uh, the site plan that was shown in the presentation, they would conform to that. A plan of development would be required. The maximum height of the tower would be 199 feet. They'd have to meet all of the regulatory <laughs> agencies, the FCC and FAA. Uh, the tower would be secured by a fence. The tower could not provide any interference to other public safety, television, radio, electronic equipment. Uh, the color of the tower would be a non-reflective neutral color. Uh, they would have a vegetated buffer around the um, tower base. This property is wooded, so we would look at that at the time of the POD review, whether they need any supplemental landscaping, but we don't believe they would. Um, the county co-location, uh, this is the same as what you saw, I believe, about a month ago with the previous tower. It's a little bit different than what we had been doing in the past. Um, so if the county, what, before they leased any uh, sites on the tower, they would notify the county for first right of refusal to see if the county needed space on that tower um, for public safety needs. We would have 30 days to respond, um, and if we did want to uh, locate on that tower, we would need to execute a lease within 90 days. Uh, construction of the approved project shall commence within two years. The internal access road, as, has, as I indicated, would be 12 foot wide with four feet of clearance and uh, compacted gravel capable of supporting 75,000 pound vehicle. Um, this is the standard created by the um, fire marshal, um, and this would allow fire trucks to get to the property if necessary. Um, the cut would expire 90 days after the use of the tower is, is ended. And our standard transfer or lease condition that we put on all CUPs. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, about this tower. Questions for Ms. Hunter? <laughs> <laughs> that was a question? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Uh, um, so, Mr. Chairman, one, yes, one, just one quick thing. Um, <laughs> uh, Ms. Hunter, you had uh, said that at the community meeting, there was a question that came up about the easements. Yes. Um, are you satisfied that that's been resolved? I mean, there's not, there's not an issue there as far as? We do not have an issue. I believe the app, the person who is opposed to the access easement may, may be making a presentation this evening to. Okay, to thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Is the applicant here? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Lori Schweller, attorney with Williams Mullen, representing Verizon Wireless. Also with me is Stuart Squire, who is a zoning consultant uh, with GD Insights. Uh, I'll try to 
make my presentation brief as Ms. Hunter has given you the basic details about the site and just go over a few additional points. Thanks very much. I see your time is tied up. Oh, thanks. Okay. So as you can see, it's a very heavily wooded site, and it is set back from Whitehall Road over half a mile. The property is landlocked, but there is an existing deeded easement. The easement is over the 4L Corporation property from Whitehall Road all the way back to Mr. Gathright's property. The easement in the deed is 60 feet wide, but in Verizon Wireless's lease, only a 20-foot wide easement is needed, and that's standard in Verizon's leases. It's just a 20-foot access and utility easement. And so Verizon would, as is required by the fire marshal in one of our conditions, improve the center of that 20-foot wide easement with gravel. So 12 feet would be improved with gravel, and then 4 feet on either side would be clear. So that 20 feet would be clear. But Verizon's easement is only 20 feet wide. I just want to make that clear. The facility compound is 80 by 80 within a 100 by 100 lease area, so clearing is only intended to be of that lease area. And the monopole elevation looks practically identical to the one that you saw last month. This is a standard Verizon Wireless monopole with the antennas for Verizon at the top and then room for three additional wireless providers, at least three additional wireless providers on the monopole, which may include the county, as discussed in the co-location condition. No lighting at all is required. And then the balloon test results are quite unusual for a 199-foot monopole in that the balloon was not visible at all from surrounding roadways just because of the heavily wooded nature of this area and the curves in the road and so on. So I won't belabor these photographs, views from the north. There's nothing to show you in terms of a big red balloon. You just couldn't see it from any direction. Those are from the northwest. But we did drive around the circuit and take photos from every location and from the east on Whitehall Road, north on North Road, and from the east on Sage Road. So it's a very well-sited project, a setback far from the road, and should not have any visual impact on the neighbors. And that's my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Ms. Schroeder at this time? Quick, 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 quick. Mr. Lumpkin, thank you. I think Ms. Hunter said, but I didn't catch it. When was the, what time of year, when was the balloon test done? February 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Leaves were not on the trees yet. That's right. Okay. Thank you. We may call you back if we need you. Did you want to speak also? No? Okay. I appreciate that. All right, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and then we'll call you back. Thank you very much. At this time, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing on this CUP. If anybody would like to speak for or against, please step forward at this time. State your name and address. Keep your comments to about three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's Darvin Satterwhite, 3013 River Road West. I'm here on behalf of 4L Corporation. As has been explained, the access easement goes over about 3,200 feet of our property. It's not what we're arguing about. That's not what we've got a concern about. It's not the access. They can come and go all they want to. The difficulty that we have is that the site plan shows a 20-foot utility easement for electrical power and phone lines. That easement across my client's property is only 10 feet in width with respect to the utility easement. And you'll say, well, what, who cares? I mean, well, we care. And the reason we care is because in the site plan, it shows it. We have it right there. Uh, it's hard to read. I know it's in small print, but we've kind of, you can see that arrow. It says proposed Verizon, 20 feet wide, access and utility. 20-foot wide utility is what we're looking at there. The difficulty is 
This is the easement document. There's no question about it. There's only one. It's recorded. The access easement is indeed wide enough. That verbiage there relates solely to the utility easement within the larger access easement. That utility easement is only 10 feet in width. So that, that's the problem we have. And when it's part of the site plan and you've got a set of cup conditions that number one, basically right off the top, tell us that everything listed in here is basically incorporated in as a provision of this cup. And the very next thing you have is the conceptual plan that shows a utility easement double the size of what is actually there. We've got a problem with that. And it's not just a hypothetical problem. In uh, Article 27, Section 4, you've got your guidelines that tell you what to look at when you're considering granting or denying a conditional use permit. Well, we've highlighted at least three of the provisions that tell you why it is not a good thing to issue one in this to grant a conditional use permit in this instance particularly E that talks about having adequate utility easements. It doesn't. The site plan sim simply does not. It is, in fact, injurious to other adjoining property owners because it's injurious to my client. So until, or less until, something is shown on a site plan that gives the correct dimensions of the easement and not, show, not to show it as a 20-foot wide utility easement when indeed it's only 10 feet, it just doesn't make sense. Not to mention the fact there are no construction easements granted across my client's property. So if there's going to be any construction of power lines or any other utility lines, it's got to be solely within the 10 feet, not the other 60 feet. No construction easements at all. Now, maybe it's possible to do that. I sincerely doubt it. The road plans for this particular project also show a culvert going through there. Well, while you've got a culvert in the road, it's fine as long as you've got a drainage easement. There are no drainage easements whatsoever dedicated across my client's property. So on several levels, you've got a site plan here that does not work. And it's not simply enough. I, I think we... I heard this at the planning commission, oh, it doesn't matter, it's on the other property. Well, that's what easements are. Easements come across other properties to serve the subject property. These easements simply don't meet um, the conditions that they should, and certainly the site plan is erroneous. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, I do have a brief summary that I'd like to hand out to the chairman if okay. I could. Thank you, Mr. Satterwhite. Thank you. Um, before I open the public, oh, never mind, I already have the public here. I would like to ask, before I close it, I would like to ask Ms. Schweller to maybe come up and answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the deed that Mr. Satterwhite refers to uh, talks about a 60-foot easement and a 10-foot utility easement within that 60-foot easement. And it's true that our zoning plan shows a 20-foot access and utility easement. Uh, we do not need 20 feet for utilities, and we're certainly not using the entire 60 feet. So what Verizon proposes to do is to build the road that's required within the 20-foot easement and to lay down the fiber certainly within 10 feet. We probably don't need more than a foot or two, and so we would not be violating the width limitations of that easement. Uh, we also wouldn't be, you know, an, under Virginia law, an easement that's granted may be used for any purpose that's not prohibited under the easement, and we're using it for access and utilities exactly as described in the deed. The exception to that, the qualifier, is if you want to add an additional burden 
to the easement, and we are not doing that. We're only using it for access and utility. We can bring the truck in to install the monopole without damaging, without going outside of the easement area. We've evaluated that, and so we'll be using it long-term, just access and utility, just as described in the easement. So we, we don't think there's a problem here. Any details such as will show exactly where within the 20 feet you want to install the utilities, for example, um, all of those things we can handle in the site plan process. This is just your zoning drawings, your, your conceptual drawings for the conditional use permit. Um, we will certainly handle any additional details during site planning process, um, but I, I hope you know, I don't think they should hold up the, the CUP approval tonight. Thank you, Ms. Shawna. Thank you. Could I have a question? Simple question? Well, what about the culvert? You, you talked about the culvert. Can you address that? Well, the, the current easement requires a gravel road, and it also requires the servient parcel owner for L Corporation to maintain that gravel road. I'm, I'm not sure that's being done now or done indifferently. Under our lease, we are required to maintain the gravel road. Under our conditions, we're required to construct the gravel road. So that gravel road will be there, and it will be cleared on either side. That's, that's all that's required. We will, do, we will do exactly what the county requires, and no more than the county requires to you know, comply with both the easement and the county condition. There's nothing about a culvert in that condition. So if that needs to be sorted out in the site planning process, we will do that. Well, I, I guess I was asking, Mr. Satterwhite suggested that you don't have a right to, to uh, the way I understood it, you don't have a right to put a culvert in there. Is that, did I understand him correctly? Or, or I think we'd, we'd have to think about whether that would be considered expanding an existing use when there's already a gravel road, um, but we can certainly work that out. Uh, th so there's no question about the location of the 10-foot utilities. He, uh, he flashed up, he flashed the deed up real quickly and uh, highlighted that it's 10-foot, but there's no question about the location of either either of these easements. I mean, or th there's no question that the utility easement is in a different location than the than the broader access easement? No, sir, we don't have any objection with reading this deed the same way Mr. Satterwhite reads it, which is that 60-foot wide easement includes the utility easement. It's not defined anywhere in the language or on the plat where the 10 feet would be. It just says it could be done. And we're certainly not installing anything above ground, no above, above ground um, wires or, or or anything like that in the easement area. So you're t the, ten, the less than 10 foot that you plan to take up is going to be all inside the 60 feet? Inside the 20 feet. Inside the 20 feet. Which is inside the 60 feet, yes, sir. Um, so so why, why does your, um, why does your uh, form that you had up there earlier, I probably can look at it here, why does it say 20 foot utility easement? That is the lease exhibit for our lease with Mr. Gathright, and so the lease includes, you know, leasing the lease area of 100 by 100 and leasing 20 feet of the 60-foot easement area, and so that's the, those are the rights that we have from Mr. Gathright, uh, derivative of his rights um, as property owner and easement holder, and so... Um, what we have is, a, is an easement that, as far as our landlord is concerned, it doesn't matter to him what we put in the easement, whether it's access or utilities or where the utilities are. Certainly he can give you, for the portion that crosses over his property that you're leasing, he can give you a 20-foot easement. But mm -hmm. yes. is it your position that you have 20-foot rights along, this, along the portion of the easement that travels through the, uh, the corporation's uh, I forget what's Corel, Corel, Corel. Corporation. Yes, absolutely. We do have that right through our lease with Mr. Gathright. So, um, but, but Mr. That, that presumes that Mr. Gathright has that right. Then that's, he does. That's, your that's right. Through through a 1982 deed, and I don't think that's in question. I I, I think that Forel Corporation fully um, agrees that Mr. Gathright has that 60 foot easement uh, for access and utilities. 
or, or rather 60 foot easement, including a 10 foot easement for utilities. Okay, all right. Thank, thank you. All right, questions for Ms. Schroeder. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. Thank you. I call you back. Anyone else um, wishing to speak on this? My name is Owen Lanier. I live at 4209 Whitehall Road. I'm also a shareholder of 4L Corporation. Uh, let me explain to you a little bit uh, how this easement came about. And uh, I will also say that I do not believe that Mr. Gathright has the authority to grant a 20-foot easement across our property within the 60-foot easement for utilities. But the way this all came about was that the owners of land that 4L now own were timber companies, Continental Can, I believe. Uh, the, uh, there were people in the Gathright family that still owned the Gathright property. The timber companies owned land south of Gathright's property and needed to get their timber out to Whitehall Road. So they entered into a ingress and egress easement with Mr. Gathright and gave him the right to cross their land from Whitehall to his land, and he gave them the right to cross his land from south of his land, across his land, onto their land to Whitehall Road. Now, as part of this 60-foot easement, there was a granting of, for future utilities of a 10-foot easement, for future utilities. They were not defined at the time that this easement was entered into in 1982. Uh, the problem that 4L Corporation has is that uh, underground cables, wires, uh, lines will be in their property. Uh, the existing road is not a gravel road, it's a logging road gravel was to be placed upon the road where necessary to maintain ingress and egress for Mr. Gathright. It's not an improved gravel road. There are no culverts in the road. It's a typical logging road that you can drive down. Uh, we do not have any drainage easements set up for construction. Uh, if there are any culverts, you're going to have to direct water, and any time you direct water, you have to have a drainage easement across the property that you're directing the water. They're going to have to improve the road to build an adequate road to access this site. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, in doing so, they don't have the right to, to put in any culverts and they can only have a 10-foot easement across our property to install any utilities. We would respectfully request that this be uh, either denied or deferred, such that things could be worked out uh, if Verizon wants to continue this. I will also say that it's very unique how this property was chosen. Um, 4L Corporation owns the property uh, south, north, and another couple thousand acres all around this, they were never approached about the location of a cell tower back when this was initially done. I remember in the 2016 meeting, the ideal location was back up closer to Cedar Plains Road, and they supposedly had three property owners, and the one they picked was this location. It is a very poor location, 3,000 feet away from from a highway, and the reason the balloon can't be seen is to center the tower up in the property, they had to go down over the hill towards the creek, and uh, the tower uh, is, is not very far above the hills of existing trees, which is gonna make it a very poor tower for transmission of cell service. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Anyone else? For the public hearing. Now I'll go ahead and close the hearing. Ms. McGee, I have a question for you. Um, 
Do we need to be concerned with the right of way? Uh, Mr. Uh, Satterwhite mentioned the possibility that it's, it doesn't meet our ordinances. Um, is that an issue for us? Um, Mr. Chairman, the question before this board is the use of this land by this applicant or frankly someone after them because this runs with the land to uh, construct what's allowed in compliance with the conditions. And uh, this applicant is willing to abide by these conditions and move forward. It's not really the board's purview whether or not what what length of space they may need for wires, whether or not they can acquire exactly what they need to do it. If this site is an appropriate place for this use and these conditions are conditioned appropriately, then, then that's for the board's consideration. Thank you, Ms. McGee. Questions, discussion? Mr. Peterson? Chair, I just had a follow-up on that. Um, <coughs> the my understanding of the easements are the easements have been granted such as they've been granted by the owners of the respective, the two properties. What we're being asked to consider tonight, just, just to confirm, this will not affect in any way those easements. In, in other words, we're not expanding those easements, we're not awarding additional rights, we're not using eminent domain to, you know, we're not doing any of those things. Th that's correct, okay. nor other than eminent domain, which is not on the table, do we have the power to affect those easements? Okay, so we're not <coughs> changing those easements at all. Whatever they say. <coughs> so if they're 10 foot, 20 foot, 60 foot, whatever they are, they are, and we're not being asked to change that tonight. No, and the, the document, let me just clarify, because um, the, the document that's attached is in fact a conceptual plan. Um, the applicant was uh, correct in saying that a significantly stronger level of detail would be required for a site plan on this and there's a process for that and uh, you know uh, needs to show the appropriate things for a site plan and it would only get approved if it does show the appropriate things but this is a conceptual plan um, it is more general thank you any other comments <coughs> questions <coughs> Mr. Lumpkins um, if not, um, this tower is also in my district, so I'd, I'd like to make the motion. When I ran for the board, I promised that one of the things that I was going to do was work diligently to improve broadband and cell coverage in Goochland. Unfortunately, we cannot build our own towers or provide broadband, and I cannot force Verizon to come and put towers uh, wherever we need them. We probably need six or seven more towers in the western Goochland in order to get good cell coverage. So with that said, um, I would like to move, and as Ms. McGee said, I think there are issues related to the, to the right-of-way that Verizon, um, Verizon's attorneys and uh, Mr. Satterwhite and Mr. Lanier's attorneys can, can resolve. Um, we're certainly not a court of law and can solve that. So, I would like to move that we approve conditional use permit 2019 application filed by Selco Partnership to build a cell tower in, um, off Whitehall Road in District 2. I've made a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Budeski, would you uh, call the roll? Mr. Lompkins? Yes. Ms. Lachalette? Yes. Mr. Minnick? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Alvarez? Yes. In good time, people. The next item on the agenda is application uh, RZ 2018 0010, filed by Tokahoe Bridge LLC. Ms. Hunter. Good evening again. 
As Mr. Alvarez had indicated, this is a rezoning request filed by Tuckahoe Bridge to rezone 98.225 acres from A2 and R1 to RPUD with proffers. The property is located in the eastern part of the county in the Centerville Village. Uh, this is the zoning map. The uh, large portion of the property is zoned A2, but you can see a portion along uh, Rockville Road is zoned R1. That's about 19 acres. And the property generally runs between Rockville and Mannequin Roads. The comprehensive plan designates this property single family residential medium density. Uh, directly across the street from this property on the Rockville side, the land use is uh, prime economic development which could allow any type of commercial or industrial use. Uh, property to the south is recreation and open space. That's the existing Sycamore, Sycamore Golf Course. And then to the north is uh, another property that's designated single family residential medium density. This is the comprehensive plan of the property. Um, You'll see the blue and yellow lines. Um, when we did the comprehensive plan, we included roads for the Centerville area. These roads were also included when we did the arterial management plan, which looked at the areas between Broad and Ashland Road. So these road layouts were part of the AMP plan um, and how traffic would be distributed in that area. The highlighted area in the oval is where this property runs. So there is a uh, road that runs completely through this property to provide connectivity between Mannequin and Rockville roads. Um, we do want connectivity in our villages. Um, these are not thoroughfare roads. These are to provide additional options and different ways for people to distribute traffic and to move throughout the village. Uh, there, I do want to point out uh, the Reader's Branch property, which is located if you look to the rear to see that. Uh, this had a conceptual road also. That's a rezoning case that was before the board um, uh, probably about eight months ago. So this, they also had a connector road through their property, which is right here. Um, as, we, as we went through that zoning case, they did provide the road through the subdivision similar to what's being proposed um, in this subdivision request. Uh, this is the aerial of the property. You can see it's uh, wooded on the Rockville side and generally open on the Mannequin side. Uh, there is an existing home on Mannequin Road and also on Rockville Road. Um, there's also an existing cemetery, which is the small red square that you see towards the Mannequin side. <clears throat> there's been significant changes to this application since it was heard by the Planning Commission. Uh, when it went to the Planning Commission, they were proposing 147 lots. Since that time, they have reduced the number of lots to 123. Um, there was also no proffered minimum lot size or lot width when it went to the Planning Commission. The RPU district has no minimum lot size. You can do as small a lot as possible that you can get a house on. Um, however, this application is proffering 15,000 square foot lots with an 85 foot lot width. Um, the lot width is, goes a long way in terms of allowing lots of opportunities for a house. If you have an 85 foot lot width, you can have things like rear entry and side entry of your garages that increase some of the quality and appearance of a neighborhood. Um, they have also made changes that they would provide intersection warning signs at the entranceways on Rockville and Mannequin Road. Um, this was recommended in their traffic impact study. They've added minimum buffer standards along Mannequin Road, and they also committed to installing lighting at the entrances and at internal intersections in the subdivision. So this is the uh, conceptual plan. It is 123 lots. They are proposing a 100-foot buffer along both Rockville and Mannequin. Uh, the Mannequin run is, uh, would be a planted buffer, and when they have some landscape standards there. The Rockville Road side would be a natural buffer because that's where you have the trees. Uh, they are providing stubs to both the north and the south, um, which is um, encouraged by both staff and by VDOT. They have a number of pocket parks um, and some ponds. You can see one park at Sorry, Mr. Peterson, I don't need to shine this on you. Um, there's one pocket park area here along the uh, Mannequin Road. There's one here, uh, another park with walking trails here. They are also providing, proposing sidewalks. Um, right here is 
a f significant floodplain uh, that runs through Centerville. It sort of comes down like this. Um, so we talked, there's a lot of conversation about a bridge here. Um, I want to make sure people are understanding this is not like a bridge that goes over a highway. This is going to be a culvert. It's just a road with a culvert under it. Um, but this bridge has been a um, significant point of conversation with this zoning case. Um, we do believe that them providing a connector road from Rockville in a circuitous route to Mannequin does meet the comprehensive plans uh, proposal to have a connector road between Rockville and Mannequin. So the summary of the application is they do provide the road connection as proposed in the comprehensive plan. As I indicated, they have a 100-foot buffer on both Mannequin and Rockville roads. They are providing uh, up to 45 feet of dedication of right-of-way on both Rockville and Mannequin Road and right and left turns at both of those entrances. Uh, street trees throughout the development, sidewalks, stub connections, and then also access to the existing cemetery. Uh, some of the issues w surrounding the case has dealt with density. Uh, so as I indicated, this, the, the uh, comprehensive plan designates this property as single family residential medium density. Uh, that goes on to describe that designation as single family residential uses with an average lot size of one acre. This classification generally corresponds to the R1 and the R3 zoning districts. The applicant is proposing um, 123 lots which would be a density of 1.25 which is slightly higher than what the land use plan recommends. Um, so I did do some comparison of what they could do by right so they could come in without any approval. It would be just administrative and have 26 lots. That would be on uh, 17 on the R1 portion um, and not 9 in the A2 section. Um, if we did the one acre average lot size um, as recommended by the comprehensive plan, it would be about 98 lots um, and the applicant is proposing 123. I did take a look at some of the um, densities of surrounding subdivisions in the area. Uh, the way the comprehensive plan uh, is set up is to have direct uh, development to the Centerville Village. That is a major village. That is where we want to direct our development. That's where we have infrastructure and public utilities. So, of course, along Broad Street, we have the commercial area. Um, and then south of Broad, it's suburban residential. Um, which is uh, typically the RPUD developments, um, Park at Saddle Creek, which is located here off of Mannequin Road. That has a density of 2.13. Um, then over here off of Hockett Road, you have Park at Centerville. That has a density of 1.92. Um, Reader's Branch, which was the case that I had indicated about the road, which was just approved a few months ago, that has a density of 1.97. Um, and then we talk about lowering the density as you go farther away from the Centerville core, um, and then you have the Tuckahoe proposed, Tuckahoe Bridge, and their density um, at the 123 lots is a 1.25. So it is lower than the, the subdivisions at the core of the village. Um, traffic has also been a conversation um, or concern with this zoning case. I've provided the uh, traffic counts there. Rockville Road vehicles per day is about 2,600 vehicles. Mannequin Road runs about 2,200 vehicles per day, and Ashland Road has about 11,000 vehicles per day. Um, so this shows you the impacts of the development. Um, so when this is talking, uh, uh, one thing to point out, this, this traffic study was done w at the beginning when this was originally proposed for 157 lots. So the impact would be less. I can't, get, can't quantify how much less, um, but the vehicles per day would drop from 1,574 vehicles to 1,230 vehicles, because it's about 10 vehicles per day um, per house. So the, this is not exactly accurate, um, so it would be a little bit less of an impact, but I can't quantify what that would be. Um, so when they work on the traffic study, uh, they first meet with staff and the um, VDOT, and we talk about the different projects that are proposed in the area. Um, so with this study, we had them consider the Mannequin Town development that will be coming through the board um, for apartments and retail um, in the next few months. 
There's an out parcel on Mannequin Road that's proposed for a restaurant. We asked them to take that traffic into account. Uh, the property behind Satterwhite's, which will be retail and office, we had them include that in the traffic study. And then the land investment site, which is on the other side of Broad, at Broad and Mannequin, um, which is a large retail project. So we had them include all that traffic study and then their development and look at the impacts. Um, so you can see that um, ideally we would like to have a level of service C. Currently with all the proposed development, we would already be below that. Um, generally these traffic movements, um, Rockville and Ashland, the eastbound left and right turn lane at AM peak, and Broad Street Mannequin, um, both the AM and then the PM peaks, um, have love, currently have level of services below C um, and would with the uh, proposed development in the area, um, but you do see a level of reduction um, a little bit further with this development. Uh, there's also been some concerns with crash uh, da data on um, Rockville and Mannequin. Um, VDOT did do a crash analysis um, when this zoning case came through a few years ago, about three years ago, this development, there was actually a proposal to build 193 houses on this same property. Um, and after that, the concerns were raised about crash. VDOT did the crash analysis. Um, you can see in 2016, there was one crash on Mannequin Road, 2015, two, and 2014, zero. Um, also the crash data for Rockville Road, uh, four accidents in 2016, two in 2015, and four in 2014. Um, luckily, no fatalities in any of these accidents, um, but there were property damage and um, a few with injury. Um, so after that traffic study, VDOT did um, implement some crash mitigation measures along these corridors. Um, they replaced and installed chevrons and signage and uh, their indication is that they believe there'll be additional reductions in the crash due to their uh, measures that they implemented. Um, what has the applicant done to address the traffic concerns? They are providing a right turn deceleration lane and a left turn at both Mannequin and Rockville roads that would provide a 150 foot storage and 150 feet of taper. They're offering a 45 feet of uh, right-of-way dedication from the center line of both Mannequin and Rockville roads. Um, they'll be constructing the connector road between Mannequin and Rockville that was recommended in the 2035 comprehensive plan and also part of our arterial management plan um, through their cash proffers. Uh, they are offering an amount of $4,331 per residential unit uh, to go towards transportation, specifically in this area, uh, which equates to a little over a half million dollars for transportation funding for the county. Um, and as indicated in their traffic study, they would provide intersection warning signs at the entranceways on Rockville and Mannequin. Uh, we do have the capital impact model that analyzes the um, impacts as well as the capacity driven impacts. Um, this zoning case is filed under the 2016 law. Um, so the impact for each project for the east end of the county, each uh, housing unit is they're offering a cash proffer of $12,586. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see how that funding would be broken down between schools, parks, and recreation, public safety, and transportation. Uh, because we look at the um, imp capital impacts, we also like to show that there is revenue. Um, again, these are very, very rough uh, numbers. Uh, they're based on a house value of 313000 which is the average house size house um, if they had houses that were at a higher value, which I think they had indicated they would, the revenues would be a little bit higher. Um, but you have recurring revenues in terms of real estate tax, vehicle tax, and TCSD tax. That would be about $387,000. And then you have one-time fees to the county of getting the approvals and water and sewer mm -hmm. connection fees. Um, and that would be about $1.4 million. 
Um, there has been a number of community meetings, some large, some small, some with some groups, some with other groups. Um, so I am covering the very first one and the last one, but there's probably been a lot of community meetings uh, in between. Um, so way back in November of 2018 uh, was the first community meeting. Uh, 90 people, about 90 people attended. Uh, the discussion was traffic impacts, road-related concerns, road safety. Um, opposition to exceeding the comprehensive plan, um, questions and discussions on open space, schools, buffers, cash proffers, and concerns about too much development in the county. Uh, then jump to just a few weeks ago, we had a final community meeting on May 20th. This is where the applicant presented the uh, changes that I detailed in the zoning case. We had about 21 people attend. Um, the applicant reviewed these changes. Uh, the neighbors questioned if R1 was considered. Uh, they raised density and traffic concerns and concern with the cumulative effect of other potential development in the area. At the Planning Commission meeting, this was heard back in February. Uh, the Planning Commission voted 4-1 to recommend denial of the application. During the public hearing uh, period, we had 16 people speak in opposition um, and five people spoke in favor of the request. I'm just going to finally just briefly touch on the proffers that are ap offered by the applicant. Um, they have asked, offered the conceptual plan that is shown as part of the presentation. Um, in terms of traffic improvements, the right and left turn lanes on both Mannequin and Rockville Road. Um, so they proffer the uh, amount of storage and taper uh, for both of those. Uh, the turn lanes would be installed prior to the issuance of the first building permit. Um, the second entrance would be at the uh, issuance of the 50th building permit. The applicant has indicated that they would likely start on the mannequin side um, and build there and then move to the Rock Railroad side. Um, the underlined one is the new proffer um, since the Planning Commission, adding the warning signs as, per, as recommended in the traffic study, um, the 40, up to 45 feet of right-of-way dedication from the center line, and the applicant would construct or bond prior to the 50th uh, CO, a connector road, uh, the bridge portion between the Rockville and Mannequin roads. Uh, they have buffers, 100 feet buffers on Rockville and Mannequin Road. The underlying portion is the additional language that they added to provide a planting standard within the Mannequin Road portion. Uh, the vegetated buffer, 100 feet along the perennial streams um, and 50 feet along the intermittent streams. That is uh, similar to what is required for the Chesapeake Bay, even though the county is not located in the Chesapeake Bay area. They've proffered an entrance feature and detached signage. Uh, that lighting would be provided at both entrances and internal intersections. Uh, these would be decorative type lighting, uh, residential in character, 12 feet tall. Uh, these is the, the number of lots and the lot width has changed. Um, was 147, it's now 123, and they are proffering the minimum lot width of 85 feet. Uh, number eight is a new proffer that all lots would be served by public water and sewer, and the minimum lot area shall be 15,000 square feet. Uh, there would be sidewalks along one side of each road. Uh, the open space would be maintained by the um, Homeowners Association. It would include active recreational amenities, including trails and nature overlooks. Um, each yard, front yard and side yard, uh, would be uh, sodded and irrigated. There would be street trees approximately every 50 feet. Um, they've proffered quality building materials. Uh, they have proffered also stub roads to both the north and south, as recommended by the staff and by VDOT. Um, as I indicated, they are offering the full cash proffer as indicated in the capital impact model, which is $12,586 per residential lot. Um, they're proffering access to the cemetery. Um, they would maintain that and also provide one parking space for anybody who chooses to visit the cemetery. And that is all the proffers, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Ms. Hunter? Yet. One, one, uh, real, Mr. Lumpkins, thanks. Could you go to slide 44, please? Thank you for giving me a slide number. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm sure we're going to get into a lot of all, a lot of the Whoops. things that are yeah you had it there. But we'll get into there a lot go. of a lot of these. But I, I some things in there caught my eye that I want to mm -hmm. I want to deal with this traffic impact real quickly. There. I will indicate that the the applicant's traffic engineer is here, so the questions may be directed better to be directed to sure, him. So. Sure. I'm, I'm just, and, I, and you just I understand, and that's what I want to know what the county's understanding yes, is. Okay. Um, and I know there's maybe more detail. And, and I, you explained that you know this is going to have a higher impact because the lot number has been reduced from what the, the traffic impact mm -hmm. causes. So the level of service D is already unacceptable, right? C is acceptable. D and D and E and F are unacceptable. Is that right? So the level of services level of service for traffic ranges between A and F. Um, the major thoroughfare plan that we just adopted, we had in there that we strive to a level of service C. Um, many other localities or traffic engineers say a level of service D is acceptable. However, we did say C in our, in our thoroughfare plan. Okay, so if we talk about unacceptable, we're talking about acceptable is C and unacceptable is D. Yes, sir. So it's all of these intersections are being downgraded from from already unacceptable to slightly less, more. Less so, more so, more unacceptable. But in any case, what caught me at the, is the bottom of this slide when I wanted to address it. Build out includes traffic from Mannequin Town, out parcel on Mannequin, a property behind satellites, and land investment. Could you just help me understand? And I want to focus on Mannequin Town, but, um, and, and I'll help you kind of guide you where I'm going with this. In, in their conclusions and recommendations, in their in the traffic impact analysis and a narrative that was part of their application. It says, as, as part of the four approved development plans analyzed in this study, it is proposed that two improvements be constructed at the intersection of Broad Street and Mannequin Road. These improvements include an exclusive southbound left turn lane and additional eastbound through lane. As part of this analysis, these improvements have been assumed to be in place as part of the overall build out of the four approved developments. So this assumption in here is, is incorrect, right? That the, these the improvements at Broad Street and, and Mannequin are not in place. They are not in place. They're proffered as part of the uh, project that's behind Satterwhite's. So as that property, prior to that property getting a building permit, those improvements would need to be in place. So the but they are, they are not in place currently, <coughs> but they will need to be in place when that property is developed. So you, it doesn't mean that everything falls in place and develops, uh, you know, in, in uniform order, but there are improvements required and planned for that intersection. So these two improvements that were assumed in their study are not part of not part of Mannequin Town, which has no, not been approved. It's part of the uh, the this property behind Satterwhite, the Mannequin approved. Grove. That has been approved. Yes. And the only thing that once a building permit is requested, that's going to trigger the requirement that that the improvements that they're talking about here. It, it's either a, triggered at the building permit or CO. I have not pulled those proffers to recall off the top of my head, but yes, it is is related to the the development of that property. It's likely at the time of CO. So, so again, we'll talk about. It, but do you, can you can you give me or, any more insight into? Um, well, let me ask it this way: the Broad Street mannequin traffic level D, D, and E. That on your slide there, that is current. That, that, that is not current. It is current plus all of these, pr the traffic from <coughs> those four projects that I indicated. So if you take, if, if Mannequin Town was built out, the property behind Satterwhite's and land investment site, if all of those were built out, this would be the level of service. Okay, there's just a lot of variables for us to get our head around. When you say the build out, you're talking about when you say the build out, you're talking about including any traffic improvements that would be anticipated by these developments as well, or just the rooftops. It, it they they look at all of everything that's going to be done with them, the that that okay. they will be doing. All right. 
Chairman, as Mr. Lumpkin said, there were some assumptions made. Mannequin Town is not, uh, it, with all estimates, there's no project to approve, it, but there was numbers given to the traffic engineer for consideration in this. So, um, you know, the other projects we still have conceptuals on. Uh, so there had to be some assumptions made to run them. There were some assumptions made um, on Mannequin Town. However, Mannequin Town is currently zoned B1. So the assumptions were actually less traffic generated than, than what would be proposed with the B1 because B1 would actually have higher traffic generation than the apartments and townhouses that are proposed for a portion of that property. So the assumptions would actually reduce the traffic. <coughs> Does that make sense? It does. Okay. It does. More? Thank so, you. Mr. Minnick. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. So, can I go to the connector road? Sure. So in our, so in the. Is your mic, Bob? Is your mic on? Sorry. Um, so we're going to the connector road. So <laughs> the, um, so the, in the comprehensive plan, the connector road was envisioned as a through road to it, to move traffic to facilitate traffic at build out of the plan plan uses under the comprehensive plan so when we looked at the roads proposed for the Centerville area we looked at how would be the best way to create a interconnected roadway system that would distribute traffic throughout the village in the most uh, feasible manner so of course there's a floodplain that runs through there we did believe that there should be connectivity between Rockville and Mannequin um, and that's why that this road was proposed here. It is to provide connectivity and distribution of traffic. These are not thoroughfare roads. These are not, uh, you know, major roadways that we would want lots of traffic to go through. However, if there was an accident, you know, on Rockville Road, people could go through and around to still get get through and distribute traffic. And also this road, when we did the arterial management plan, it counted in all of these these proposed roads in that plan that, that talked about how we want the future of Ashland Road and different things like that to look at. Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Adam Lurk is finished. Oh, I'm you sorry. finished, Mr. Minnick? I'm sorry, go ahead. Or you can go ahead and he'll <laughs> yeah, let me, gather his thoughts. Yeah, let me, chew, let me chew that one over for a second. Okay, so none of these connector, so none of these connector roads are envisioned as through roads. None of them on the plan then. So no. they would all be theoretically low speed, high turn, multiple turn roads. The only in one the comp, in the comp plan as the comp, comp plans. The only one that I would see would be different would be, um, you know, some of these in the Ashland Road coming across here. However, there would be road. There would be businesses fronting along the front of these. So all of these roads are designed to have access directly to the roads. These are not, you know, interstate type roads. You would have direct access to all of these proposed roads through either residences, businesses, anything like that. It would they would be access ways, collector roads. But Ms. Hunter, th that road is in our twenty five year CIP? No, because we had always anticipated that these roads would be built uh, through development. Um, we only did roads that the county would be building. And all of these, like the Rock Readers Branch run, this one is going to be built through development. As this area develops, we would be looking for the whoever's developing that property. So all of these blue and yellow roads are to be constructed during development um, by the development community. The only one that would be different would be we we're talking about tunneling under 288. That is in the CIP, um, but none of the other roads on here are. Oh, 
Uh, okay, there's plenty of time. We've got all night. Uh, Ms. Hunter, so back, I thought I understood slide 44 until Mr. Lumpkins asked some questions, and now I'm confused again. Okay. So the, D, the D's and E's were going from D to E. Mm -hmm. So I understood D was where we are today, and you're saying no. D is where we are if all of the development at Mannequin Town is built out, the out parcel right. on Mannequin, the property behind Satterwhite's, and the land investment piece, which is at Mannequin and Broad on the right. other side of Broad. With all of that development, full build out, constructed, retail, offices, apartments, everything that's proposed in that quadrant, this would be the, the first number would be the existing level of service. So what takes it to E? This development. So this is showing the difference between what happens with all of that that's already approved and then the changes to this with this development. But Mannequin's not approved. Mannequin Town's not approved. Yeah. It's not, but it's approved for B1 zoning, which actually has a tr higher traffic count than, than what we had them run it as. So it's already B1. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so the approving, approval of this would take it from D to E. And the applicant's traffic engineer is probably cringing at my questions and answers. So uh, I, you may want to direct some of their tra the questions to them. So. Well, I have one more, if you don't mind. <laughs> well, I'm so, so the property behind Satterwhite's is already zoned so, by right to do a certain kind of development there. Is that right? The retail and office development. Right. And they can always come back and ask for a change in zoning. But right now it's by right, mm -hmm. and they could do. And is they, that when you're talking about that out parcel? The out parcel is a property. Oh no, I'm sorry. The the, the property behind Satterwhite's yes. is that property. Yes. So then, when you said when that's developed, that's when those turn lanes or that extra uh, capacity put on the road. But it doesn't have to be zoned. So you mean when they get the building permit, is that There's right? There's proffers on that property and gotcha. prior, I believe That's it's prior to the CO. No, I think I said building permit at first, but I think it's prior to the okay. CO. They would have to have those road improvements in. Okay. And my last question is not traffic. Yay. Yay. My last question is that the proposal as it stands right now d does not meet the comprehensive plan. Is that correct? It exceeds the density of the comprehensive plan. However, it's in compliance with the road connection of the comprehensive okay. plan. Thank you. So let me just final clarification before we talk to the engineer. Um, so if this, if the parcel behind Satterwhite and and Mannequin Town, they make all their road improvements, we will still be at E. Correct. Yes. Okay. If all of those things happen. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Ms. Hunter? Mr. Peterson? Yeah. Do, you know, we do, we, do we know what the LOS is today? Uh, I'm sure the traffic engineer does. I did not pull that. So but Eric will address that. As, if you have, if you want to yeah. ask him that question, he can address that. Yeah, fair enough. And then I was just, we're uh, assuming, which is an assumption, that these other things are built out for purposes of trying to figure out the impact on the LOS by this particular development. And <clears throat> so I guess we're, we're basically uh, uh, assuming that this is the, the last piece of the puzzle to get to that LOS decline from D to E. So that you, if, if this were the first one to build out, then It'd be whoever goes last is the one that triggers that final degradation. Is that, you see where I'm going with that? I'm just trying to figure this out. To, there's a lot of variables here, and we're just assuming that everything else is done, mm -hmm. which is a, a pretty good leap, but then we're isolating the effect uh, of this one and assuming the rest of them so go first and whatever. So. so if none of those other four projects develop, this 
case probably would not impact the level of service. And it, right. therefore, my question of if we're currently at B today and this took it from B to C and C is acceptable, then we're really, it really depends on whether those other things get built or not. So that's where I was going with the question. But I, there's a lot of variables here and a lot of speculation, so I won't push any further on that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I had. Any other questions from Ms. Hunter? Uh, if not, I would like to ask the applicant to come up and present the case. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> members of the board. My name is Jim Theobald, and I'm here this evening on behalf of Tuckahoe Bridge LLC and Main Street Homes, which desire to develop a community to be known as Tuckahoe Bridge north of Sycamore Creek Golf Course and between Mannequin and Rockville Roads. Main Street desires to develop a 123 home community on 99 acres with a resulting density of 1.25 homes per acre to the RPUD classification, which classification might otherwise allow up to 2.5 units per acre. We have limited our density to the 1.25 that's before you this evening. And as Ms. Hunter indicated, uh, between the Planning Commission and this, this meeting, we have further reduced our density down to the 123 level, increased the lot width um, and the size of the, uh, the lots, and took a couple of curves out of the road to address some comments that we heard at the, um, at the Planning Commission. As you all are familiar, the RPUD district promotes highly planned and amenitized communities, emphasizing a clustering of lots surrounded by significant open space and in locations where public water and sewer are available in an effort to combat sprawl. That's a very noble idea that's encapsulated in there and has lots of good things in it, um, I think, to move the county forward. It suggests the kind of uh, quality development that's before you this evening. Main Street Homes uh, builds quality homes for extremely satisfied owners as evidenced by its numerous awards. It's a local developer. It employs local trades uh, and, uh, and suppliers. And we anticipate these homes um, having uh, a sales price of somewhere in the $550,000 and on up, depending upon the, um, the choices by the, by the purchasers. The uh, outdoor amenities consisting of natural areas, pocket parks, pedestrian trails, and gathering areas are a high priority in Main Street home communities. There are many benefits, I believe, that come with this request. We will contribute $575,000 a year in annual tax revenues upon full completion. They're providing public water and sewer to the site, resulting in $1,230,000 in connection fees. They've agreed to pay the full cash proffer of $12,587 per lot, totaling some $1,548,000 uh, 548, and significantly providing for the road connection between Mannequin and Rockville Road as reflected on your plan. The cost of that estimated to be somewhere between half a million and $800,000. Uh, Ms. Hunter has walked you through this a little bit, and I just wanted to reemphasize uh, the site is in the Centerville uh, Village area and is uh, served by the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. Your plan does direct growth to this area in order to preserve other rural areas of the county. The plan suggests medium density residential development with an average of one acre lots without any open space. Um, but that seems somehow inconsistent with the rationale in, in adopting the Tuckahoe Creek Service District to begin with, as well as the existing A2 zoning, which is two acre uh, lots, uh, minimum lot size. Our density per uh, acre is at 1.25 is substantially less 
in previously approved developments in the area, as Ms. Hunter indicated. You can see on the chart, Park at Saddle Creek at 2.13, Reader's Branch 1.97, the previously proposed case by Mr. Wilton 1.96, Park at Centerville 1.92, our initial proposal at 157 lots 1.59, and the current pro proposal, lowest of them all, at 1.25. We believe this creates an appropriate transition of uses from the village core to the outlying areas of the uh, central village. Um, you have noted the prime economic development area immediately to our north and east where we hope to see jobs, businesses, and industry. And as you're aware, there's an additional large tract of land between our northern boundary and Interstate 64 to continue that, uh, that transition. We do believe that uh, this request is essentially consistent with the intent of your plan, the goals of the Tuckahoe Creek Service District, and other area development. We have substantially amended our case based on citizen and staff input, we believe, for the benefit uh, of all. And before I forget, I'd like to read into the record this statement. The proffers in this case are being voluntarily offered to address impacts specifically attributable to the proposed development. We believe the proffers are reasonable under state law. And while I would be happy to answer any questions, we also have our development team with us here this evening. Uh, Mr. Vernon McClure, who's the president of Main Street Homes, uh, our civil engineer, uh, Brian Mitchell, and our traffic engineer, Eric Strohacker. Um, Mr. McClure is going to provide the rebuttal uh, of, to this case after we hear from um, from other speakers. And so with that, I would respectfully ask that you approve this request. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Mr. Lumpkins? Yeah, sure, I'll start. Mr. Theobald, th thank you. Uh, on your slide right there, I just noticed lot dimensions 90 by 170. Um, is, is the proper, I think, is 85, right? Yes. So it should be 85 foot? Um, so uh, whatever that's whatever. the minimum the 85 feet would be the minimum Okay, the proper the minimum and, and the minimum lot size that you've proffered is 15,000 square feet correct minimum. Um, As you know some of these lots will be bigger than others, but those are the, the, the minimum, guaranteed okay. minimums okay. That's that's all I have Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to ask some questions, and maybe um, Mr. McClure, I'm not sure, sure. before we open the public, public hearing. Um, if, you, if you don't mind coming up, and may, maybe, it's, maybe it's not you, but yeah. have we, did you guys ever consider having that uh, connection road around the neighborhood instead of through it? Has that been a consideration? Um, sir, not, not seriously. Um, we think it works better being in the neighborhood, uh, which is what is in Reader's Branch, and, and it meanders through the neighborhood and, and relieves the traffic so people can go either way. So okay. we, weren't, we weren't picturing a thoroughfare road with that. Right. And we didn't want houses backing up to a thoroughfare either. So if you look at our plan, there's a lot of um, open space uh, to the sides and front, or the rears of all the houses, which is what our buyers would like to have. So we just we had a similar example to this with uh, the park, um, the park, uh, Parkside Village. Yes, sorry, yes. Parkside Village, where the, uh, the a road was proffered through the neighborhood, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the houses were built before the road because there were two entryways anyway. When it came up for approval of the road for adding this next section, we had to deal with the all the homeowners who were opposed to the connection road. Right. And I'm wondering, and from what I heard earlier, the plan is to build on the Mannequin Road side and then maybe go all the way to 49 and then start on the Rockville Road side. How do we guarantee that the 49 homes on the Mannequin Road side will not be opposed to the connection road and then we'll have to deal with 100 people uh, concerned about it? Well, because it is on the plan, it will be on the plan that they get, and we will be building it as we go through the neighborhood. It was on so. the plan of Parkside as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so how do we, 
I, I guess to me. Well, they'll be mad at me then because <laughs> we're the builder and the developer, so I'll, I'll get it both and sides. And that may be something to consider. Yeah, but yeah. How do we make sure that it gets in the deed or right. somehow people are notified that yeah. there's going to be a road through your that, front That's yard. something we work with every day. Not to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. that, that's something we deal with every day um, in, with our salespeople and our, our staff. So um, it, that would be very clear. And of course, it is a homeowners association too, so all that would be clear. I did want to clarify one point earlier. Um, the actual plan is drawn at 90, but we're proffering the 85. So that's why the 90 is on right. there. We're showing a 90 foot lot because that's a typical lot to get a 54 foot house and a side low garage for us. So, so let me ask you why are the comprehensive plan calls for RPUD or R3? Or R3? Mm -hmm. Why RPUD versus R3? Well, we actually have a slide. Would that be on here? That would explain that. Um, just push. Okay. And this is it. So we, we did look at this, and we, we looked at this, and we've, we've actually had three community meetings, two in the last uh, month or two. Um, that has been a question that's come up. Um, this is just a chart we made to kind of compare the R3 and um, what the RPUD is. And really, there's not a perfect zoning probably for what we're trying to do. We're really doing half RPUD because we're doing 1.25. We're not doing 2.5. Uh, we're not anywhere near the, the density of the other RPUDs. But the R3 doesn't have the same protections. There's, there's zero buffers at Rockville and Mannequin. Um, we, we did a little drawing. This is what it could look like. I hesitate to show this because we weren't considering it, but we wanted to show you what uh, those lots at those widths could look like with no buffers and up against the road. That's not the kind of development we would like to do. Um, it's not the kind of development we have done. Uh, we've done uh, Aston in Powhatan, and we, we really only, you can only really see three homes on the first 50 acres from the road. And I grew up in the country, so I like driving down the country roads, and I don't want to see 50 houses at the entrance. So that was a big part of our decision. The other decision is this really would be two communities. It's not one. It's not cohesive. It doesn't connect. Um, so that was a big part of what we want to do. We want to do something that's high quality. We want to have parks trails, all the things that our customers tell us. We, we survey every customer that's interested in, in purchases our house, and that's what they want. They want walkability first. They want uh, quality. They want um, these parks and places to go, and, and that's what we're trying to offer. So when we compare the two, um, the lot width on the R3 is actually less than what we're doing. We're providing a 100-foot buffer at Rockville and Mannequin, which is zero in R3. Uh, perimeter buffers to other properties surrounding us is zero under R3. We're providing 35. We're doing turn lanes on left and right on Mannequin and Rockville. Um, the traffic engineer can talk more to that about that. It's not mandatory uh, for VDOT, is my understanding, but we want our homeowners to enjoy the neighborhood. So part of that is just getting in and out. Um, that is typically what we have done in the past. Uh, there's no landscape plan required for R3. Uh, we are doing a quite extensive landscape plan. We're going to keep houses uh, 150 foot off the road, minimum. Um, there's going to be amenities and the, the difference, yeah, sorry, <laughs> trying to look around you. Um, the, the big difference is we're talking about 25 homes. Now, you're not going to see that from the roads. I don't think you're going to feel it. It's going to be one student per year, five students over five or six years in the school system. It's, it's what we would think is a, it's a small impact. This is not in any way a high-density development. This is um, the lowest density development that we would normally do. So um, high density is apartments at 34, uh, townhomes at 8 to 10, um, suburban development at, at 4. Two to two, four, six. So this is one point two five. That's a long answer, but anyway. Questions. That was the whole the reasons behind this. We wanted to build a better development. What we think that the county will appreciate ten years down the road, twenty years down the road, not just two forty-nine lot developments. 
and it and the connectivity was in the conference plan and we felt like that was part of what we had to do so that was a big part of it so we either do the road or we do less lots you can't do both there's just no way to pay for it okay thank you okay any mr love you the number the number that was talked about months ago on the, on the bridge that, that hasn't changed in, in the no we're thinking it's going to be about 800 um the bridge itself would maybe a half a million but we've got to build the roads and everything to it to connect it um it would if you're looking at this road network it would be much much less because there's a whole third of the community we wouldn't have to build a road through but I honestly I just don't I don't think this is the right plan um, it's something that could be done and somebody might do it I just I think what we've done here is, is just we've hired landscape architects we've hired the best um, engineers I, you know we're going to mitigate everything it's it's just a better project better neighborhood for the long term on the mannequin side and in, in, in this plan you have on the screen on the mannequin side that looks like it has without me trying to count each lot and i know it's just a concept but you have a few more on the on the mannequin side right than, than you do on uh, there the probably are a few more yeah. because there's more land on that side more useful land yeah okay. yeah but we and wouldn't be able to build all those until we can do the the, the bridge the connection and the other entrance Right, because when you get to, I think the proper is when you get to 49, you're going to either bond or build the road? Correct. Okay. And you're going to start? And we'll plan on building it. It's just, you never know what the economic conditions are and everything. So we, but I think we would, we would just go ahead and build it. Got you, but your plan Because we, we want to be able to bring people through the mannequin side. It would be two years old at that point. The landscaping would be maturing. It would just look so much better than to try to bring people into another side to try to, to to sell homes and to market homes. It just doesn't make sense. And, and the mannequin side is much more um, central to, to getting people in. One of the things that's been talked about, I mean, this has been, and I would com I, I'll go ahead and commend you because I, I think you have reached out to us. I, mm -hmm. I've been to some of the community meetings and, and so a lot of the stuff we're talking about I think has been addressed. But one of the questions I have for you um, is, is in terms of what we're hearing, and I'm sure you're hearing the same thing, transition. Mm -hmm. there's, there's particularly going down Mannequin Road, um, there's, you know, we're, we're moving from a higher density to you know, just dropping off. Now, I think to the north, if this is north oriented here, to the north, you have property that is also remains in the Tuckahoe Creek Service District, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, sir. And I don't know how much acreage, 100, 140 acres or so past us. Um, to the north is 100, it's still correct. In, and so that. Is potential for development because that ha that's in the Tucko Creek Service District. If correct. Yeah, we road, we'd mm -hmm. leave the service district. Correct. Have you? Um, I guess I, I mean your plan is your response to the transition. Um, yeah, I think it 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 almost looks like we're jumping because there is the golf course there, which is green. But if you look at what Mannequin is, and I think that was what's the density is uh, planned maybe was. Eight, yeah, 12 units per acre. So you've got 12 units, and then we're going out to 1.25. So um, there is a big transition between what is in the center and we're less than a mile away, which is similar to Reader's distance, which is uh, denser than what we're asking yeah, for. Yeah, almost two. Yeah. Okay. So we, we feel like there is a, a, a big transition difference out there. Um, it is in the sewer and water district, and, and this is, from my understanding, where we want development in the county. I, th I think you've heard some traffic. A lot of uh, traffic is a concern of, mm -hmm. of mine, as, as I was expressing. Um, you know, that slide had me concerned that we're, you know, I think we're trying to clear up what that yeah. says. says. Um, yeah, the engineer can help with that. I'm, I'm a little confused sometimes, too, with that, but, yeah. yeah what like my understanding is that the level of service for what we're doing, it, it's, it's more a function of it just pushes us over from D to E. I think it was like one second or something. It just, we were already there, and it pushed us over the limit, so that's why the number, but he can explain more of that. There he is. <laughs> And, and honestly, that's why we wanted to put the left and right turn lanes on both entrances, 
because we're going to take that traffic off that road and, and store it in those, those turn lanes. Okay. And one other thing, you know, we've had a lot of good discussions with, um, with citizens, and in our last meeting, um, there was concern about the road and the sight lines and those kind of things. So we're going to fix all that, um, especially on the mannequin side. There's a big hill there where the house is. We're going to shave that down so you can see around it. We're going to widen that road to uh, let, let me four ask times that, as wide. Let me yeah. ask that question. Where, which which property is that? Because I was I was looking um, for that one. You're you're talking about doing substantial the turn lanes. Well, the the, no, the turn up, the turn. The turn out when you Broad Street North onto mm -hmm. Mannequin, um, you're going to be doing some. All of our work and it's going to be on our site. On right. We're not going to on do Mannequin. anything offsite. We're, we're so, so pledging yeah, the half million dollars. On Broad Street. Can you go back to one of the slides and, and show us what you're talking about? That. Tr uh, okay, you're, you're just talking about the right and left turn lanes on both on sides even though those might not be warranted with our number of on the Rockville homes. side you're not mm -hmm. sure it's warranted but on the mannequin side you agree um I think one is warranted on both sides but not both is uh, that, that would be accessory. yes so we're, we're going to add both whether they're warranted or not and I, I'll again Eric can explain that okay I think one left is on one side and one right is on the other, if I remember correctly. And the other one we're just going to build just for, it's just going to be a better road network there. We, this is my 23rd year building homes. We've built 3,500 homes. We, we want this to be a neighborhood that people appreciate long term. We're going to do it right. Mr. Chair, just a quick, just a quick question, yes, if I can. So, on the R three or R three diagram, do you have? Do you go back to that slide? There you go. One more. This one. So th this is obviously just a notional expression. I mean, you could make this. This would probably be the wor the worst possible design you could come up with here. Well, or the I, we could make it worse. Um, <laughs> how, I'm sure. How would you do that? No, stack, it's stack them on this top of was, each other. I'm just curious. <laughs> so we did. We did ask them to to use the standards and draw it out, um, because you'd still be paying for a lot of the um, costs for the development. You you wouldn't be able to maybe afford a lot of the niceties like um, the parks and those kind of things because we still have to bring the water up, the sewer up make the road improvements, the roads. So it, this was just what, if we don't do it, somebody could do mm -hmm. with R3. The lots are deeper, but they don't have to be as wide. So what we try to do is we try to take the R3 and merge it with the RPUD. Mm -hmm. The only difference, the only difference in the two, really, is we're taking all of the requirements of RPUD, all the higher requirements, the quality, and, and we're just asking for a 15,000 square foot lot versus a 20,000. Mm -hmm. The width will be wider. We're planning on 15 feet, uh, is that right? 15 feet wider. So, because that's what just fits with our house plans. So 90 foot versus 75. Yeah, thanks. But I'm, I'm, I'm taking that you don't like this plan. So. Which I don't really which either. Part, but which part? The yeah. R3? No, the R3. I don't know. The drawing. <laughs> we did this really quick after some questions about it. So. I was surprised that no buffers were required. Honestly, we thought there was. We can look at the pretty one. Okay. Other questions, Mr. Lumpkin? A question for the engineer or? Yeah, Mike is, well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean otherwise. You, you've heard some of the threat <laughs> in rebuttal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Strohacker, uh, Greenlight Solutions. I am the traffic engineer. Um, yeah, I've heard a couple of things that I thought might be good if I could get up and just kind of maybe provide a little bit of context to. Uh, 
Joe, is there a chance, Joe, when we go back to that slide where you're showing the D to E? So as you look at this slide, you're seeing, let's just go to the Broad Street Mannequin intersection. Um, the southbound, go to the southbound, southbound left through. Um, so those measures, the level service D, level service E is actually based on a numerical value and it's a, a, a value of delay. We do some modeling and to anticipate how much delay a person would experience. And based on the standards, it's an, in, an industry-wide standard. When you reach a certain threshold, you go from one level service to another. Uh, some of these movements under the background plus approved conditions, which would be the level service D, are operating at about 54.1 seconds of delay. The second you cross the 55 second threshold, you're now into a level service E. So when we come along and at our traffic, we increase from about a 54.5 seconds delay to a 55.1 second delay. Not, in, in, not, even, not even a second of delay, but because of where it lays in terms of that threshold, that 55 second threshold, we go from a D to an E. So that's why you're seeing some of this. The most significant impact that we're actually having is at the Rockville-Ashland intersection. That's probably where, the, where we have the most issue with our site traffic in terms of uh, having an overall impact to the study area. Broad Street Manic, and it's mostly uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back kind of way of looking at it. We're just, I think a comment was made that we're kind of coming in at that point in time with our, with our little bit of traffic, we're, we're adding about 1,500 vehicles per day to the entire road network, um, which is not a significant amount of traffic in terms of some of the other things that's going on in the area. Uh, it's just it happens to hit some of these movements at a time where it's, it's a problem. It's important also to understand the Broad Street Mannequin intersection. When you look at the overall intersection delay, um, at build out, we're at level service C in the AM and level service D in the PM. So the intersection as a whole will be fine. Um, and that kind of leads me to another point I wanted to make. Level service acceptability. I think that was one of the first comments I heard uh, or, or questions was raised. From an, from an engineering perspective, level service, you don't think of it as a grade in school. It's, oh, you gotta get level service A. Uh, it's more of a balance that we're trying to strike. We're trying to strike a balance between operation and cost, revenue, capital. If you get in level service A, I, I, if you get level service A on a road, what you've done, you've really probably spent too much money on that facility, money that could have went to something else. Because keep in mind, these standards don't just apply to the private development, also applies to you guys, to the public as a whole. So you want to balance that. And what we typically look at is level service C not being as acceptable, but as ideal. Because what you've done is you've created an operation that's working great without spending too much money to get it, or more money to get it. Once you get level service D, yes, you're starting to come down off of that, that peak. Level service E, you're starting to reach an unacceptability in terms of delay, that measure of delay that we have. Level service F, you're starting to get actually beyond the capacity of the facility to handle the traffic. That's where you got real issues. So I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of context in terms of that level service and how we typically look at it. The, the fact that you guys are looking for level service C, that's, that's good. That's what you should be looking for. But I don't want to diminish or, or create a, a thought process that if you don't have level service C, you've somehow reached an unacceptable operation. That's really not a fair assessment of the level of service grade. Um, so now, that was a couple points I did want to make. Obviously, uh, if there's a question about some of these things I've just raised or more questions that you've got, I'm, 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 I'm all ears. Well, I just, what? What improve? You, uh, looking, uh, you heard me read from the conclusions and recommendations in your, in your narrative of your report. Are there any other impro improvements that are not there that you assumed will be there? Because we figured out. I thought it was. I thought this was from Mannequin Town, but it's from the property behind Satterwhite's. Um, but you, in your analysis, you assumed. You assume. Let me let me see if is this a fair statement. In your analysis, you assumed. All of these things pointing to the bottom of the slide, Mannequin Town, Out Parcel of Mannequin, Property Bound Satterwhites, and Land Investment. You assumed all those were built out and developed, and you assumed 
the, the improvements of an exclusive southbound left turn lane at Broad Street Mannequin and an additional eastbound through lane. Is that a fair statement of all, That's correct. Of all your assumptions that you made in your, in your traffic report? That's correct. The study is structured in such a way that we take existing traffic conditions and then begin to project out to some build out year for this. This site is 2024. Uh, and then we develop a traffic condition that goes to that build out year so that we can then come in and then just add our site and understand what that specific impact is at that point in time. Um, for the background condition, the background plus approved condition, yeah, we, we project existing volumes to the build out year based on a 2% annual growth for every movement. Then we take whatever traffic conditions has already been determined for approved development, add that to the system, and then develop a, a level service grade for that, which is where those D's and E's are in terms of that particular slide we're looking at. And then that's when we come in and add our site traffic so that we can really truly measure our impact, which can look kind of bad when you look at the D to the E, but when you look at it in terms of actual delay, it's pretty marginal. I mean, you're talking about less than a second of delay on some of these movements. It's, it's not much of an impact. Uh, 1,200 vehicles to an overall system is not much. To hand, is, is, is not a, a, a significant loading of traffic. But your statement's correct. We assume those roadway improvements, and part of that, understand, is when you throw the approved development into the mix, you bring everything with them. You're bringing their impacts, but you're also bringing their mitigation. So it's only a fair way to look at it. Now, you could always take the approach, well, let's don't add it in. Let's just see what happens if, you know, you could do that. But then you're kind of asking yourself, well, wait a minute. What happens when these guys build out? Because they are approved developments. So that's, that's the thinking behind the way this, the study is structured. Where do you get the impact data from the county, or, do you, or is there another source, the impact of the build-out of these four things? So um, in this instance, those four developments had done some level of traffic analysis themselves and developed volumes that would be specific to their proposed site. We go into those studies, pull the volumes out so that we had the specific vehicles that they're going to be generating and where they're putting them on a system, and then add those right into our model and then do our analysis. So our analysis is unique to our study, but we have their traffic volumes in the model. Gotcha, okay, Th thank you. So just one quick question, if I can. This may go to Mr. Peterson's question earlier. So it actually, no matter what, no matter, it appears no matter what you do, which sequence, you may, th these may build out or may not build out, you still go to level of service E on three of the four road conditions and F in another. So regardless of, regardless of which order you, even, even assuming that, I mean, even making, taking the assumption that Mannequin Town is B, is B1. More entrance. So, I don't know what my point is there, but. That's true, but I do want to give it a little bit of context. Keep in mind that the Broad Street Mannequin intersection as a whole is operating acceptable level services, even with everything building out and our site. Those three movements within the intersection are going to particularly pot pot potentially have some issue with level of service. But that is not significant enough to degrade the intersection to an unacceptable level. And sometimes you have movements within an intersection that doesn't carry a lot of volume, but are delayed in a significant way because there's other movements in the intersection that are a priority. This is a good intersection from that standpoint. That southbound approach typically is neglected in the overall scheme of things out there. It's, it doesn't carry a lot of volume is one of the reasons why so when VDOT times the signals and provides a phasing plan and an improvement plan for an intersection, those movements kind of get put to the back while they take care of the other bigger movements. And that's kind of what's happening at this intersection. And we would anticipate that they would maintain that type of timing plan through, through some horizon year. And so the analysis does reflect some level of service issues for those movements. Again, the overall intersection is operating well and we expect it to maintain that with the improvements that the approved developments have committed to. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask just yes. a, uh, 
obviously when this model was ran, it was run with 157 with 1,574 impact. You said it was going to be about 1,200, so it would have some different impact. So at a, at a, you showed a plan that could be built at 98 with the comp plan versus 123. Did, do you have comparison data? Does that 23 home differential make the traffic substantially worse than it would at 98? What margin is it? So uh, let me make sure we're all on the same page here. The study assumed uh, 100 and was it 157? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Get me from a table here. I'm sorry. It's got it up there. I'm just looking for some data. So, so at 157 density, that's where we would anticipate the 1,500 vehicles per day. We would anticipate 1,500 vehicles per day with that. At the 123, that's more of the 1,200 vehicles, which is what I mentioned earlier since that's where we're at. I was speaking to that. That's what actually would be added with the current proposal. The 98 is going to be right at 1,000 vehicles per day. So you can see the net difference is about 200 vehicles per day. That's, that's marginal. Does a 200 vehicle net difference ch change service levels? You might get a, you, you, that 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 54.1 to 55.1 type scenario that I just described for some of these movements up here, where you where you could see some sort of improvement like that. You just you just take go one side of the threshold just to the other. You might get a little bit of that, but for a from a true improvement uh, or or uh, better operation, no, I wouldn't expect that. I think the thing that's important to understand here is that from a global perspective, the site does, does not have a significant impact to the roadway network. So even when you're reducing these volumes, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's important maybe from the site perspective, but from a global perspective, it's very marginal. Because what's really, what's really carrying the day is what's out there today, what's anticipated to come in the future, uh, that that's where you get the significant traffic numbers from. Mr. Chairman, that one. Yes. Do, do, you, do you agree with Ms. Hunter's statement that uh, regarding Mannequin Town, it's B1, it's zoned to B1, so it's going to have um, more of a traffic impact than than a multi. That's correct. Say, say, than a multi-use. Uh, that is correct. Okay. Uh, I'm somewhat familiar with that case. Yes, that would be a correct statement. Okay. Any other questions at this time? Any, uh, any other questions for the applicant at this time? If not, uh, folks, before we open the hearing, we've been at this for a little over two hours. Uh, we would like to take about a 10-minute break and then come back and open the uh, public hearing. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Don't break that. You have to make a new one. Everybody, uh, please take your seats, except for those uh, guests ready to speak. <laughs> um, before we start the public hearing, I'd like to remind people of the, of the rules. Um, normally, we, have, uh, we allow three minutes per speaker uh, tonight, since we know that there are some folks that are going to speak longer than three minutes. Uh, we would allow our, our rules call for allowing up to four people to donate their time to one speaker for 10 minutes maximum. And I, th I think everybody standing in line already knows all the, all the rules. But uh, so please come up. And if you're speaking, for, if, if you're donating your time to anyone else, please come up, state your name and address, and the name of the person you're donating your time to. OK? Did I miss anything? No. All right, so the public hearing is now open. Hi, I'm Marie Owens, and I live at 621 Fed Lane on Mannequin, in Mannequin Sabbath. And I live just up from this development. And I won't take three minutes. Um, on the slide, they talked about 26 homes that could be in the R1, R3. And they said by right. And then 98 homes is what's the one house per acre, but they want to put on more. All right, um, when I was in school, this is one house per acre. See, this is a little green thing's an acre. This is everybody else's concept, apparently, of one house per acre. So you have all 10 of them here, and there's 10 acres. So, you know, one house per acre, 
I live on 10 acres in my development, and we don't have sidewalks, we don't have street lights, we don't have any of that fancy stuff. We have a pond you can swim in. Um, all of our people walk their dogs on the street because there's no through street. It's just uh, cul-de-sacs. And then $500,000 houses. And I remember one of the meetings, they said there'd be only about 12 kids. I'm like, well, dang, somebody's living on a really good senior salary because you're going to be having two high-paying people living there with kids. So there's going to probably be more than 12 kids in this 123 houses. And I'm thinking if you have 98 houses, you're allowed 98 acres, so you have 98 houses, at least 12 of them are floodplains. You're probably looking at one house per acre is more like 86 houses, not 98. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm kind of new at this, so I'm not sure how people donate time, so I'm just going to move aside and, and see what happens. <laughs> my name is Patricia Hendy, and I live at 2337 Wheatlands, and I dedicate my time to Jonathan Lyle. I'm Gary Laundrie, 2140 Prophet Road, Manic and Chavez, and I'm donating my time to Jonathan Lyle. I'm Carl Nelson. I live at 2610 Manikin Road, and I also am donating my time to Jonathan Lyle. Thank you. I am Jonathan Lyle. <laughs> 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 um, and Ms. Bess K. Witz is going to work on uh, some... Um, that's a good idea. Uh, you know, it's not often people actually want to hear what I have to say. Um, Ms. Beskowitz is working on the technology, so, well, look out. Uh, we Mr. Chairman. That, we, we won't count that time against Well, you. that's good, uh, and I appreciate that. But I also want to say I appreciate the folks from um, Main Street Homes. Uh, we're going to disagree on some points tonight, but I think these are pretty good guys. And uh, if I were ever to build a house, I'd probably let them give me an estimate. I'm not sure I could afford it, but I would certainly give an estimate. All right. Um, you know, Mark Twain once wrote to a friend and said, I apologize for sending uh, such a long letter. I didn't have time to, whoops, look at that, it's already a doing something. Whoops. I didn't have time to send a short one. Uh, you're going to get the short letter tonight because my job tonight is to set the table and let other people expand on what we're going to talk about tonight. And what we're talking about tonight is getting to yes on this rezoning application. Or this one. Or this one. Uh, we got a lot of areas of agreement. We are yes on property rights. We are yes on the comprehensive plan, the village concept. We're yes on the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. And we're yes on Main Street Homes as a quality and profitable builder and developer. What we're not so keen on is the idea of abandoning many of the concepts in the comprehensive plan, moving from high density in the center of the uh, village to medium density and then to rural outside. What we're asking is that you don't create a non-transition area where we go from high density RPUD to the rural outside of the village. Man, 12 seconds is longer than I thought. Um, come on, machine. There we go. You're going to hear from folks tonight on seven areas of concern, uh, the village vision, the village concept, rural strategies, economic development. And at the end, we're going to talk about public necessity, conveniences, general welfare, and good zoning practice. Yes, no. So do we have public necessity, convenience, general welfare, comports with good zoning on five of the areas that are somewhat different or dramatically different from what the comprehensive plan and the uh, CIP call for. In, this is not an all or nothing situation. We're not saying that this property should never be developed. It has uh, guidance for 98 home sites, medium density. The zoning request for 98 homes, it's been said in the community meetings, if you said 98 homes, you wouldn't have this level of opposition. So we're not saying this is all or nothing. We disagree with this market demand justification for RPUD. We don't want to ignore the comp plan. It's taken time to develop. It wasn't done in a vacuum. Um, I've got to learn which one goes right or left. Um, we don't think there's a compelling reason to go high density. What is the benefit? 
in, in essence, we've got to say no in order to get to yes. So I'm going back again. So as been pointed out, this could be rezoned by right. Now, there is a typo in here because it says 28 homes, and I think uh, Ms. Hunter said it would be 26. But if you just said no, no rezoning request, 28 homes could go in. But we don't think by right is a good use of that land. We don't think that takes advantage of the Comp Plans Village concept. We think landowners should be allowed to increase the value of their property. Main Street Homes should build more homes in Goochland. Here's what buy right would look like. You'd have the R1 uh, property with a set number of homes, and then the two A2 or the three A2 parcels would very scatter. But what could it look like if we went with the comp plan and put in 98 homes? Now, this is a little different from 98 homes that uh, Main Street just showed us. But if you count the little squares, and I did, there are 98 homes in there. And that's with the bridge. Now, maybe you don't want to have the bridge. Well, you don't have to have the bridge. You can still do 49 and 49. Does it, it has buffers, it's not up against the road. So there are solutions to rezoning, and we think that going, <coughs> excuse me, going to 98 homes isn't a bad thing. If we ignore the comp plan, what do we got? We got crazy. If you look at the red line, that is Henrico to the east, you got Goochland to the west. Goochland is becoming the transition zone for Henrico. I don't think that's really what we want to do. So we shouldn't keep moving the goalposts. The CIP and the comp plan are intertwined. If we start ex making exceptions to one, we're going to start chasing the deviation. RPUD creates a new transition zone need. Are there advantages going to the comp, uh, ignoring the comp plan? Uh, Mr. Shellhorse said at the um, planning commission that uh, our infrastructure has got problems. We've already seen how some of those uh, intersections are starting to fail. So we need to look at what are the advantages to going to high density. The connector road was mentioned, but we've already heard about the unintended consequences with the folks there at, I call it all shucks, the development. Uh, I'm going to go back just for a second. Um, that, uh, that the developers said in community meetings, in their communities, they post 25, people go 40, residents complain, and we have to put in traffic calming. And then you got technology, GPS, and ways. You don't have to do much of a search to start seeing the headlines. Ways apps are creating new traffic problems. Navigation apps turning neighborhoods into traffic nightmares. And that's from the uh, New York Times. Everybody believes the New York Times. So what I guess is the connector road concept that's presented, I think is flawed. It really would benefit the residents of Tuckahoe Bridge unless we're thinking it should be an everyday connector. There is an emergency connector, Echo Meadows Road, which is three minutes north uh, on uh, Rockfield Road, four minutes north on Mannequin Road. So if you got an accident, if you need to get from point A to point B, you can use 77, <coughs> 771 to get there. Would it be better for us, as Mr. Alvarez asked, put a connector road, a true connector road, on the northern part of the property, let that uh, development take place with 4949. You can put a walking bridge in there that gives you that sense of community, but you aren't putting people at risk, if you want to put it that way, with traffic going through neighborhoods with the GPS saying, here's how you're going to avoid some of these failing intersections wrong direction. What else are the advantages in uh, ignoring the comp plan? Well, the proffers. We've heard this is going to generate a lot of money. Well, they're voluntary and they're cause and effect. No development, no increase in the demand on, on services. I'm going to get this right. Um, you already have talked about the dysfunctional uh, proffer legislation that the General Assembly has put us with. A tischler vice model shows that the full capital impact is 30, not 38, but 30 percent higher than what they're allowed to offer. They, it's not their fault. They're not allowed to offer more, but the full capital impact is still higher than what the profits are going to be. So what do we do? Well, we don't go back. We go forward. Uh, are there advantages? Well, the high, 
our PUD is going to bring more tax revenue. Well, the differential is 25 homes. That's $199 a day or $72,000 a year. $72,000 a year to abandon the comp plan, to put high density RPUD into a transition area. That's high density benefit, $3.31 per community member if we abandon the comp plan and go high density. That's half a pizza. I can't talk about the number of cars that are gonna go through an intersection, but for three slices of pizza, I'm willing to stick with the comp plan and stay with transition medium density development. So where do we go from here? We compromise. I don't know how hard it is to count to 98, but I think if we got 98, we would be in a pretty good place. I've heard the developers say it can be developed at 98. If we didn't exceed 98, we wouldn't have this level of uh, opposition. So what do we do? We compromise, but I think we have to say no in order to get to yes. So now we get to where we evaluate. What is it that we're asked to do? We need to look at public necessity, convenience, general welfare, and whether this comports with good zoning. Well, if we start to fill in the blanks, I think you can see that in several areas, there is convenience, but the convenience is for the applicant and for people who don't live here, the new subdivision residents. Everything else, 17 of those blocks, really are not public necessity, convenience, general welfare, or comports with good zoning. So my light is starting to blink, but I think I got 30 seconds, which is good, because there are two more slides. Folks, I really appreciate what you're doing, but if we analyze it and look at what the ordinance says, and you're gonna hear this from other people, you're gonna find out that we believe sticking with the comp plan, compromising the 98, keeping that transition from high density to rural it's going to let great Goochland grow gracefully. Look at that. 30 seconds over. <laughs> if you got questions, I'll answer them, but I'm not sure that you want to do that to yourselves. So <coughs> I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyle. Douglas Knapp, 2337 Wheatlands Drive, and I am yielding my time to Mr. Rob Williamson. Michelle Williamson, 2262 Wheatlands Drive, and I'm yielding my time to Rob Williamson. My name is Rob Williamson, and I live at 2262 Wheatlands Drive, about three minutes from Tuggo Bridge. I want to start with a sentence in the first paragraph of the first chapter of the comp plan. Comprehensive plan provides a blueprint for the future by establishing a framework. Sorry. Comprehensive plan provides a blueprint for the future by establishing a framework for growth and development. And the comp plan, like I said, is pretty detailed. A lot of analysis. So it's a strategic planning tool and good planning policy. Also, we have zoning ordinances. Those are the legal requirements for each parcel in the county. We also have the 2019 budget and the capital improvement plan. That's good financial policy based on expected growth and projections from impact studies and various formulas. It also incorporates strategic goals for balanced development. Capital improvement plan defines a comprehensive plan as a long-term to control and direct the use of development and property in the county. Control and direct, not my words, words on page 443. United, these documents stand for the best and good zoning practices. Divided, they introduce variances that will challenge public safety and jeopardize the rural character of the county. Divided, they will fail to prevent a cascade of challenges and unintended consequences. Each variance or deviation from the comp plan negatively impacts fire, police, rescue, schools, and negates the, the capital improvement plan. So deviating from the comp plan is not good zoning policy. Developer presents Tucko Bridge and its 123 homes as a benefit to the county. What we actually heard was a developer presenting selected provisions from the comp plan that support his plan 
while skimming over the other provisions designed to protect the village and ensure that the village emulates good zoning practices. So what's the comp plan say about Centerville? Centerville has the most development pressure anywhere in the county. It also says the village must balance the challenges of growth, creating scale and character of a village. And most importantly, the planning of this village is critical to the county. Again, not my words, critical in the comp plan. So what are the comp plan provisions that protect Centerville Village? Well, in chapter two, land use, it says use the comp plan to determine appropriate densities. Again, words in the comp plan. Also in chapter two, village, uh, villages and designated growth areas, it states, encourage more density towards the center of the village and reduce density along the fringes. How does it do that? It designates these areas on the western edge as medium density, one acre average. It also goes and states suburban residential, single family with a max density of two and a half units per acre. Then it also says medium density, average lot size, one acre. And if you look at the land use map, you see these properties tonight are in the medium density along the western fringe, and that's the transitional zone as laid out in the comp plan. So clearly indicates that these properties are designated single family medium density, clearly not RPUD. What the comp plan does do is identify the gold areas there at the bottom below the red as suburban areas. And that corresponds with R1, R3, and RPUD. Medium does not mention RPUD. So does Tuc Tuckahoe Bridge comply with medium density? No, it introduces a density deviation to the comp plan of over 25%. The examples given tonight, Saddle Creek, Reader's Branch, et cetera, with 2.13 and 1.97 are in the gold area designated RPUD. This property is not. So does it, so does Tucko Bridge comply with less density at the fringe? Obviously not. Is there a public necessity for higher density to resolve? The answer is no, but that is a deviation. Is there a public necessity that requires higher density at the fringe? Again, no. Is there a public necessity that requires RPUD over medium density? No. Is there a public need or added convenience for using residential road as a connector? No, a poorly designed connector will only become a public nuisance and a liability. All I can see is dump trucks and bicycles. Not a good idea. Do the extra 25 homes provide any benefit, public necessity, or provide for the general welfare in the county or its residents? There's no compelling argument that 25 extra homes benefits anybody but the developer. And that is not a, comp a compelling argument to ignore the comp plan. There is, however, a compelling argument that medium density, coupled with the transitional friends, fringe is vitally important to ensuring general welfare and protecting rural character. Do developers have a right to RPUD? The answer is no. Developers can't have it both ways. You can't cherry pick comp plan provisions that support your, your uh, plan and discard those that don't. Because resulting, the result is county resources have to forever chase the deviation. For Centerville Village, regardless of the zoning type, Follow the comp plan. When a, when a developer finally presents a plan that complies, then approve it. I want to conclude with the first sentence of the comp plan, chapter two, land use. To have balanced development that contributes to the welfare of the community and preserves its rural character. Keeping that in mind, does more RPUD on the western fringe accomplish balanced development? No, it's RPUD light. Does Tucko Bridge as RPUD contribute to the welfare of the community at large? No, just its residents. Does more RPUD help preserve Goochland's rural character? Again, no. Please vote no for Tucko Bridge RPUD. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Claire Fortier, and I live at 2257 Wheatlands Drive. Um, and I am walking away from the reservation here because um, Jonathan Lyles presented something in his information to you all about ways. A second file, yes. Unless you want to see my master gardener project, which I'm not sure you do. <laughs> Might be more interesting. I do. <laughs> it's, it's certainly probably more, thank you, more fascinating than what I'm about to say to you. But uh, Jonathan presented this issue about ways in a small community. That small community happened to be South Lake Tahoe. South Lake Tahoe I know a great deal about because I was the mayor of South Lake Tahoe. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that I concluded during my time as mayor at South Lake Tahoe is the end of a 20-year war over land use. It was a war that pitted two states, the federal government, and a whole lot of special interest groups against each other, including a group called the Bear League, because yes, bears need to be represented too. And I say all this because I have a very different view of what a comprehensive plan is. It is not a rule book. It is not a reference. It is a covenant between citizens and their government. This is how we see things developed. This is how we see them turning out. And in that regard, I'd like to talk to you about this comprehensive plan. Because I think the covenant that the Goochland County has come to with its residents, now I'm back on the reservation, is you specifically agreed to support a diverse and stable agricultural and forest base in this area. The whole point of your comprehensive plan was to look at your rural character in regard to how do you balance the economic issues that's facing you with this abundance of beautiful land. And the answer you came up with was to do several things. One was support carefully designed new development that enhances the rural character. And that means when a new subdivision comes in, it must occur to have design that must be sensitive to the surrounding areas that it is in, um, encroaching. Now, if you look at what they've presented, there is a case to be made, of course, that there is a great deal of, of new development in the core itself. But as um, they have mentioned, you then skip over all of that and you end up with this development that now becomes more concentrated. It has minimum, one of the things you require is minimal visual impact. The plan does some planting of 100 foot buffers, but within those buffers itself, are all the roadways, all the signage, all the electrical maintenance, and everything else that feeds to the maintenance or to the, this community. You have this mandate to preserve the natural features of the landscape. Well, that means not cutting down old growth. It's not replacing trees with sod. You have another mandate that says you're going to be sensitive to existent, existing typography. Well, he has already mentioned he wants to take out a whole hill so that there's better sighting from his community onto the main roadway. And finally, there's the minimum of clearing, grading, and impervious surfaces. Well, as you all could see, by adding uh, pavement and, and all the rest, you have not minimized the impervious surfaces. So let me go on to just conclude by saying, we all know the old adage about closing the barn door before the horse gets out, but I would submit to you that there is another time that the divine door cannot be, or that adage is not true, and that's at the feeding frenzy. So I point to you right now at where we are here, and then I'm thinking that, what do I hit to go forward? Ah. There's the barn door, that's what happens, and there's the feeding frenzy. And each and every time that you deviate from the comprehensive plan, that's the frenzy that you're facing. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Lohr. My home is at 243 Echo Meadows Road. And I don't have anything really exciting to say other than I fully support this project. I have all along. I've written to each of you, and thank you for your responses. I greatly appreciate that. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lohr. Hi. Yes. Um, 
I'm a good guy here where I can see my supervisor. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, Andy. Chairman Alvarez, Vice Chair Lasterlack, and members of the Gushin County Board of Supervisors. If you can hold it, hold it. You can hold it. My name is Andrew Donnelly. I live at 520 Harold's Drive, Mannequin Sabbath, Virginia. And that's the Knuckles Forest subdivision, which is right off of Mannequin Road. <coughs> Houses are good. I live in one. I suppose you all do too. Houses provide economic development. New houses stimulate the economy. Now at this point, I've got a four-page presentation here, which I'm not going to deliver. But I want to make two points here. And that is, <coughs> in the comprehensive plan, on page 2.4, the document says, referring to Senator Lilly, the plan states, proper planning of this village, the Senator Lilly, is critical to the county. Now, not only critical to Eastern Gooseland County, it's critical to the entire county. <coughs> and again, on the last page of my presentation, it states the comprehensive plan designates this area as single family residential medium density. I say again, proper planning of this village, the Centerville village, is critical to the county. I thank you for your time and your service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. <coughs> Hello, my name is Betsy Fralin. I've lived in Goochland with my husband and my three girls since 2002. We're on our second home here. I'm totally in favor of this project. What a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for families to be able to build the house of their dreams in a great location by the number one builder in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Moore. I live on 2173 Profit Road, Mannequin Savitt. I'm speaking, I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm yielding my time for uh, Dawn Sharp. Good evening. My name is Don Sharp, <coughs> and I reside at, <coughs> excuse me, 1498 Old Oaks Lane in Crozier, District 4. Others have done such a great job. I don't know why I wrote this, but since I wrote it, I'm going to give it. I laud the developer's attempt to amend the plan from 147 to 123 homes, but they stopped well short of the 98 that would comply with our comprehensive plan. And their concept still requires a major change in zoning. Nearby residents believe the property should be developed with 98 homes with a minor change to all R1. <clears throat> and the developer agrees it can be done. They may not want to do it, but it can be done. The surrounding residents are not anti-growth. Rather, they favor, favor and support the medium growth which the board included in the comprehensive plan for this property. The developer mentioned in, in the meeting two weeks ago, and it's been talked about this evening, uh, about the connector road between Mannequin and Rockville roads. This is cited as a, as a tremendous benefit for the county. But I feel certain that the board envisions something similar to the cut through planned in the courthouse village over to Route 6 or Bulldog Way, a road cutting through a residential neighborhood, trucks rambling through and commuters avoiding up to three stoplights to get to West on Broad Street would simply be a disaster. If you believe that people are going to buy $600,000 plus homes and stand for trucks and cars speeding through their neighborhood, I can't believe you, would, you, you buy that. 
And several of you are not going to be here, and I can guarantee you that the buyers of these homes will be back complaining about the noise and the traffic through their neighborhoods. People will drive through a neighborhood to avoid one stoplight. The developers also made mention in the meeting that smaller lots with sidewalks and parks are what their buyers want. I fully understand that buyers in Chesterfield and Henrico feel that way, and they know their markets in those communities. I have not noticed an exodus of Goochlanders for high-density housing in those counties. Newcomers I meet extol the rural character and schools as the reasons for moving here. I've yet to see or meet anyone standing at the line to Goochland waiting for more high-density housing so they can finally move here. There is a reason that homes in other localities on Wen Acre lots sell for a premium to high-density housing. Many families want them, and that is what Goochland can still offer. The board and residents spent untold hours planning for what everyone wanted Goochland to look like, and that became the basis of our comprehensive plan. It includes higher density RPUD housing for certain areas of Centerville. This property was not targeted for that density. In order to enact a change, there should be a rational purpose. Whereas Main Street Homes has presented an attractive development for this property, along with impressive proffers, I see no patent reason to broaden the entire property to anything other than R1. The availability of water and sewer cannot and should not be the sole justification for increasing density. And this development with 25 additional homes would not amount to a drop in the bucket for the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. Just because we can does not mean that we should. Lastly, development need not be a one-way street. It must be good for both parties to justify success. There is simply nothing in this plan for Goochland, but everything for the, de for the developer. And that is a win, not a win-win. I encourage you to exercise your resolve by rejecting this revised plan. Your planning commission voted no to 147 homes. This revised plan lacks a compelling reason to warrant approval. I, ur I urge you to follow the plan that you approved and believed should guide the future of Goochland County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Short. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to read you this, uh, what I've written, because the Please old, state your name. name and oh, address. Larry Barker, live at 2170 Mannequin Road. Uh, the old computer's not as good as it used to be. Uh, remember, Tuckahoe Bridge is going to be part of the total of what I'm going to be talking to you about. Uh, they are projected to generate 40 rescue fire calls in a year once it's developed. Uh, as a point of reference from 2014 through 2018, there were 278 new homes built in Company 3 coverage area. Rescue calls increased by 270 from the 2014 numbers to 2018 numbers. Fire calls increased by 43. There are three new subdivisions, two on Hockett Road, that are occurring, about to occur, or in the case of Tuckahoe Bridge, want to occur, that will increase the number of houses by four times the 2014-2018 numbers. They will add about 10% of the current population of Goochland County into these areas. I have not mentioned the commercial, retail, apartments, assisted living, and the rest of the gross already approved. No part of the county will be immune from the growth in the east end of the county. The far western part of the county won't have the traffic nor the congestion that the east end of the county will have, but their fire rescue apparatus will be called into the east end of the county on a more frequent need. The question is, will fire rescue be able to keep up with the growth? The answer is, I hope so. 
I know that this board will do everything they can to make this happen and that fire rescue personnel, both paid and volunteer, will do everything they can to make this happen. Uh, I was going to speak, to, uh, speak about the needs of the fire rescue tonight because of the growth, but the board already knows the needs, like needing to hire at least nine more career people by the fall to be able to staff at least two pay providers at each of the six stations 24-7. Goochland will be competing with the surrounding counties for the same pool of people to fill these needs, so there's no guarantee that the needs are going to be filled. Um, then there's a need to replace the aging fire rescue equipment probably on an accelerated basis, and finally a need for a fire rescue station in West Creek that I think you all have already talked about. Now, there were times when I was running before all of the current growth that the county would go in UA, no units available, and this still occurs today. It is not a staffing issue, but a call volume issue. Average transport time to area hospitals and back to station is in that one hour and 30 minutes, which takes a unit out of the county for that period of time. So, when I, you know, you just pray that no cardiac arrest, stroke, or bad accident happened before rescue units made it back to the county. I don't think anyone here at this meeting doesn't know that growth is going to happen. We just don't want short, broke, short pump growth to happen. Now is the time to look at the comp plan and just say high density means high density, medium density means medium density, and rural means rural. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Good evening. I'm Nancy Laundry. I live at 2140 Profit Road, Manic and Sabbat. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit and do, give you my opinion of more growth in this area having to do with schools. I'm an educator, retired at this point in time, but schools and the school population, school administration, teachers and students are important to me. In 2017, uh, a study was done about the needs for Goochland and what our schools were at this point in time, what was needed in the future. In 2017, all three elementary schools were, were deemed that they needed help. They were all built in the 50s, I think. Randolph was built in 1958 for a total of 409 students, 409 students. At this point in time, for 2018-2019 school year, there are 476 students at Randolph. Um, the expected enrollment uh, for the 21-22 uh, school year was predicted to be 454. Well, we're already way above that, so we're now looking at uh, in 2021, it certainly will be well over 500. Right now, we have three trailers, learning cottages, at Randolph Elementary School. Those three trailers come at a price. There's monthly rent on those. Also, a big thing for me is safety for the students in those trailers, learning cottages. We have some pretty bad weather around here, so just think about having your child or your grandchild in one of those trailers and a tornado happens. Think about, God forbid, we ever have uh, the occasion where there's a shooter and we have to take those students and put them in the brick and mortar building because they certainly are not safe in a trailer. We can't put more trailers at Randolph without the loss of parking, which is horrendous already, or loss of playground area. That's what more trailers would mean. So please, think about the added population if you approve this new development on Mannequin Road. 25 students? <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't believe that for a minute. So please, just think about kids, grandkids, that you want to stay in this area and be safe. Thank you for your time. I do appreciate you. Thank you, Ms. Laundry.
Thank you. My name is Paul Costello, and I live at 2011 Sycamore Creek Drive in Mannequin Sabbath. We understand the applicant's right to request rezoning and your responsibility to consider this application. You have heard numerous points of concern and opposing views to the applicant's request. It is important to note that the comments shared by concerned citizens reflect significant time and thoughtful research by people who care deeply about Goochland County. You have also heard that the community does not oppose development or rezoning this property R1 as planned. What we oppose is the applicant's request for RPUD rezoning and their request to ignore a strategic county development policy by asking the Board of Supervisors to eliminate carefully planned transition zoning between high density and rural areas. The last 10 speakers highlighted specific concerns, contradictions, and other important considerations from the county staff report. Public comments are also based on the county's strategic goals, each section of the 2035 Comprehensive Plan, Goochland County's Public Facilities Master Plan, and Related Capital Impact Study, and Goochland's 2040 Major Thoroughfare Plan. While the applicant's proposed profits provide limited funds, it does not address cumulative planning implications and significant timing gaps related to roadway safety, capacity limitations, an ill-conceived connector road, an impending burden that the proposed RPUD would place on our public service operations and facilities. It's clear the applicant's request is not in accordance with the county's strategic goal of ensuring balanced development that contributes to the welfare of the community and preserves its rural character. Moreover, the Tuckahoe Bridge proposed rezoning violates the guiding principles and spirit in which Goochland County's strategic goals and comprehensive plan are based. Specifically, the applicant's leapfrog development request undermines a critical component of the county's planning process by ignoring important and best practice transition zoning between high, medium, and low rural density development. In addition to not comporting with good zoning practice, and most importantly, the applicant has not demonstrated that their high density RPUD rezoning request is a matter of public necessity, convenience, or general welfare. In summary, we are asking the Board of Supervisors to protect and preserve Goochland County's guiding principles and to support the comprehensive plan by voting no to deny Tuckahoe Bridge's request for RPUD rezoning and 123 high density homes. Thank you for the opportunity to share the community's views and concerns. Thank you, Mr. Costello. Good evening. My name is Lucy Smith. I live at 2420 Hamden Row, which is south of Echo Meadows and between Mannequin Road and Rockville Road. My name may be familiar to the supervisors, as I have previously written to each of you regarding the issue before us tonight. I beg your indulgence to refresh your memory regarding my previous comments and to address my current concerns. As I know you serve us, your constituents, we count on you to represent us as residents and honor and implement the county plan. As a nurse and resident of 39 years in Goochland, I am concerned about the health and welfare of those in the county and the needed infrastructure to care for those residents. I care about the first responders, fire and rescue, police, schools, the safety of roads, egress, and the numbers of roads. We have been down this road before. Unfortunately, I perceive these developers have demonstrated no interest in our community or the welfare of our community, even after they were educated about our comprehensive plan. They do not have respect for our county plan. If they did, they would have presented a plan that was congruent with our county plan when they were given the opportunity. They are interested in making the most money they can make with no concern about the outcome. When they have done their deed and collected their money, they won't look back and we will be stuck to deal with what they created. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
My name is Dustin Griffey. I live at 512 Three Chopped Road, Mannequin Sabbath. Um, could I get some help in bringing up what I'll call the village circle? Um, one of the things I've noted is that we have some plans for what I'll call connector roads that don't seem to be plans. What we have is a lot of unintended <coughs> consequences that are going to be arising. We see some of the scheduled situations we're going to be dealing with with different intersections when they get to from B to C to D to E to F. And these unintended consequences are going to be some of the things that we're going to deal with. The project called Parkside Village had a parkway that was removed from the middle of the subdivision. That was a connector road. And that is going to have an impact. I believe that 98 homes on 98 acres will be what we need to address. Uh, I don't see the circle there that shows the outside village circle. The one with the circle. The village circle. This one's All right. easier to well, see. Well, let's. I'll work from here. This yep. shows the connector roads, and all of these are wannabes. Nobody paid wannabes, and we're looking at the first connector road that is going to be a wannabe. That basically is probably going to be what I would call a 25 mile an hour or less residential road. And it's going to have people parking on either side of it, because I don't think we can restrict that. But we're looking at an R1 zoning that would be 24,000 square feet. We're looking at properties. We don't have a lot of properties in the R1 category. We need to concentrate on being able to have some R1 properties. We have R2 that I guess R2 and D2 went off together. And we need to look at the R3s at 20,000 square feet and 75 feet. A 100-foot wide lot makes a big difference when you're trying to have a driveway and trying to get a garage and trying to get back onto the property, especially when it's 24,000 square feet instead of a R3, 20,000, which in time will probably end up being 15,000. Every developer seems to be in an RPUD frenzy, I think we need to actually recognize that the developers don't live here. Thank you for your time. I am Dave Bent, a 34-year resident of Goochland County, residing at 72 Harvey Road, Rockville. Good evening, fellow neighbors and members of the Goochum County Board of Supervisors. Tonight you are hearing the concerns of many residents regarding the density issue of the housing units and road safety issues on Rockville and Mannequin Roads. These are your constituents. Only a few short years ago, many of these constituents, including myself, were before you voicing these same concerns about this same property. <coughs> You were elected to be good stewards of the property in Goochland County. Most of us know that a steward is one who manages another's property. We, the homeowners, your constituents here before you, rely on each of you to do what is best for us. Look at our neighbor, Henrico County. That's been mentioned a few times tonight. Some years ago, their planning commission voted to deny some development because the road system couldn't handle the traffic. However, in their relentless quest for money, the Henrico County supervisors charged ahead, regardless of area residents' concerns and quality of life. Now Short Pump is voted having the worst traffic in the area with little road improvements to alleviate the mess. Is this what is best for us? Many of us here don't think so. One of the slides I saw tonight caught my eye and it talked about the proffers the proffers as it stands now, I think the number was 
1,233,000. The proffers of this proposed project were 1,500,000 some thousand. It's not a lot of difference to leave things like they are. Are you chasing the developers to get more money in your pocket? Most here hope not. The developer has no obligation to maintain the rural character of our community, but you do. So we are asking our Board of Supervisors to protect us from the developers and lawyers who do not share our concerns and just want to build approximately 123 homes <coughs> and reap the profits. Do not let them intrude on the rural character of our county as you leave Route 250. Your own comp plan recognized the obligation to maintain this character. It is now your individual obligation to stick to this plan. Don't change it. RPUD does not offer the best of rural preservation and density. The vast majority of your constituents here tonight, the folks you represent, are against RPUD for this area of our county. Remember, you have the privilege and the obligation to protect us. In closing, I am strongly opposed to the possibility of rezoning this property. Please vote no to RPUD. Thank you for your time. have a few comments. My name is Charles Bent, 72 Harvey Road, Rockville, Virginia. I'd have to ask the question of all of us here tonight, do we really need another 123 homes in Goochland? Currently in Goochland County, and these numbers come back from the end of 2018, there's already 3,500 approved building lots in Goochland County. 2,600 of those building lots have been approved. There's 373 approved apartment units. There's 538 units that have already pulled out their uh, building permits, and that totals 3,564 building lots we already have here in Goochland County. 123 more homes, well, that's kind of a drop in the bucket, but it's still something that we're not urgently needing. We've got plenty of building spaces out there right now. I'm just a dumb engineer, but I would like to see 60% of that property used with 60 one-acre lots with million-dollar McMansions sitting on each one of them. It would be really nice transition from the downtown uh, Centerville area out to the outlying areas with one-acre lots. One other final comment is about the uh, transition of the property. Personally, I think one-third acre lots are absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's just like that's Henrico all over again. I would like to see something much bigger. I'd like to see one-acre lots. I'd like to see three-acre lots, but be that as it may, one-third acre lots is just not acceptable. I would ask in your considerations that you vote no for RPUD. I would ask that you vote no for the rezoning application. And I would think that all of you might want to think about our children, our grandchildren, and the generations to come. Because what we're going to do here tonight might well set the precedence for some adjoining properties. And that you, and that you uh, support the rural character that we're all trying to preserve with your vote tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bent. My name is Roland Van Bakers. I live at 1721 Pine Drive, Mannequin Savage. 
ladies and gentlemen, we gather once again to discuss the newest Tuckahoe Bridge rezoning application, which is asking you to deviate from the one acre building lot minimum standard this board has established when they passed the Goochland Comprehensive Plan. Bringing this revised plan before the board, which only changed from one acre per home to one third acre per home, is a very arrogant move. This company expects us to lower our standards just to accommodate them. I both applaud them and I'm appalled that they are not only totally ignoring the wishes of the citizens of the Goochland County, but expect you, the Board of Supervisors, to ignore, to ignore them too. The Board must be assertive in discharging your duties on our behalf. Apply the rules already established and tell this company to come back when they can apply the rules. When a plan for one acre per building lot is submitted, it will be overwhelmingly approved. And to the board, I must remind you that you work for the citizens of Goochland County. It is your obligation to reject the plan as submitted. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Grayson Johnson. I'm an attorney. I represent Lawrence and Ann Knuckles, who own 16 and a half acres of the assemblage, the three parcels that are assembled for this, for this development. And I'm here tonight on their behalf. And I know that the, the hour is late, and I'm not going to belabor um, uh, and, and try to speak a lot at length about anything here. I would simply say to you this. I think it's after sitting here tonight and listening to all of this, I think it's very clear that these properties that are the subject of this rezoning application are going to get developed. Uh, they've been on the market for a, a long time. Uh, so that we've got a willing seller. The sellers want to sell their property. And, the, and Mr. McClure and his company have, have uh, contracted to buy these properties. And I, I would submit to you that what they have presented to you tonight is a very, very well thought out plan that provides a lot, answers a lot of the concerns that have been uh, put forward by the opponents of the um, uh, of this rezoning, and by and by the staff. Um, I, I I hesitate to say to talk about dollars and cents or eco economics, but it's, it's it's a fact of life. If they are going to do what they are proposing to do, if they're going to put in the, uh, this connector road, which I understand the county wanted to have, if they're going to build a bridge over Tuckahoe Creek, if they're going to put in right and left turn lanes on the Rockville Road and the Mannequin Road, if they're going to cut down some the hills so that there's a better sight distance, there is a cost to that. There's a tremendous cost to it. And there has to be a trade-off here economically. If these people are going to do that, then they have to get a greater density than perhaps what is suggested, the 98 acres is, that's suggested by the comprehensive plan. Um, I, I think that's a reasonable trade-off. I think Mr. McClure and his company have shown they have a tremendous track record. I, I, they, have, they certainly have, they have in, indicated and, and given an example of their abilities to develop property in other areas. And I would urge you to, to vote favorably in, uh, on their application. I will add this, a number of the people who have spoken in our position here tonight are my friends, 
Some of them are my clients. I won't point them out. But I hope that tomorrow they will be my friends and my clients. Thank you. We do the same, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Brenda Ellis Wiley, and I am one of the landowners. I own property at 2051 Mannequin Road with my cousin, Betsy Osborne Tanton. Um, Betsy lives in Florida, so she couldn't be here, but she also owns 2061 Mannequin Road. So we are very invested in this project, and I just want to say how grateful we are for your time and listening to this, and also for everybody voicing their concerns. Um, let me just say a little bit about myself, because, and I'm going to read some of this because I get pretty passionate, and I don't want to veer off um, into emotions. Um, in 1920, our grandfather, Walter Ellis, opened Ellis's store, and many people in this room have heard of that, have seen it. It, it stood right across the road from Satterwhite's restaurant right there in Centerville. Um, my grandfather bought 300 acres at that time for his farming operation, and that property included all this. It included the golf course down in Centerville, and he even owned the, the land where the fire department was, is now Centerville Fire Department. He gave that land to the county. He gave it and did all he did because he cared about this county. And, and I'm here representing the family that's selling this property, and it's, it's us that's bringing this before you, along with Main Street Homes. It's not just them, because they want to do something really good for Goochland, and so do we. My cousin and I grew up in Goochland on this property. We went to Goochland High School. Our family was active in Goochland Baptist Church, in the Centerville Fire Department, and in many county committees. And we're very blessed that we had a family to, that taught us to give back to the county that gave us, us so much. We want to do something that's really good for Goochland County. We don't want something that's going to have um, two separate little subdivisions with no road connector that the county needs to meet the growth that's going to come to Centerville. Our property is in the village of Centerville and Tuckahoe Water Sewer District. Since 2006, we've paid over 39000 in ad valorem water and sewer district taxes. That investment allows water and sewer lines to be run to our property at a significant cost by the developer. We chose Main Street Homes because they're a company with an outstanding experience in building beautiful neighborhoods. They are committed to doing something good for Goochland and will bring in significant tax dollars to this county. We know this process takes time. The Board of Supervisors is charged with making a good decision for the whole county. And both the developers and we the sellers have worked hard to come up with a proposal that we feel is consistent with the spirit of the comprehensive plan. And that plan is to keep Goochland rural primarily, but to keep development in the villages. We are in the village. We are in the Tuckahoe Water Sewer District. Main Street Homes has significantly reduced their density. They've increased the size of the lots. We could go on into all the different things that they're doing for this project. This costs money, and it, it's money well spent because they're going to have a beautiful subdivision that all of us will be proud of. This will be a significant benefit to all the citizens of Goochland. Thank you very much, and we hope that you will vote in favor of this rezoning. Thank you, Ms. Wiley. My name is Elizabeth Turner Baker, one of the landowners of the property being discussed on Rockville Road. Over 60 years ago, my parents, Andrew and Arletta Turner, bought what was then called the Woodward property. Back then, an elderly man, his wife, and two girls about my age lived in the frame house on the property. My father relied on Otto Ellis for advice and entered into an agreement with him to take care of the fields. After my mother's death, my father's dreams of relocating in Goochland diminished, and I was an only child raising three children of my own, 
two of which live far from Richmond now. We have paid taxes for 60 years, which helped Goochland grow and tried to be good stewards of the land. From 2006 to 2018, we paid ad valorem taxes of over $44,000 to be in the Tuckahoe Creek Service District, an area designated for growth and development. Main Street is an extraordinary company. Brenda Wiley and I have met with the builders and found them very easy to deal with. To their credit, they have listened to concerns of the community, answered any number of questions, and even tried to meet with those who had objections and made modifications. They have been voted Builder of the Year for the second year in a row. Hopefully, some of those here tonight have taken advantage of Main Street's invitation to visit their offices in Midlothian to look at plans, the materials they use, as well as go online to view other neighborhoods they have developed and ask for references. This would not be Centerville's first development. Our property is in the village of Centerville and the comprehensive plan calls for higher density. Goochland is in desperate need of new and younger blood. Diverse young professionals with families who value living in the country with walking trails, ponds, and activities for the whole family. Access to a public golf course. The tax dollars they will bring in will aid all of Goochland in providing a diversity of business and recreational opportunities for all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bernal Burton, 3851 Old Stage Road, Gooseland. I'm a Gooseland native, been here for a long time. I'm also a real estate broker and been working in real estate, well, I'll say 50 plus years. And I've seen a lot of change in the real estate market. People now, some do not want a big lot. They want a smaller lot and they want activities and they want to be near a location that is convenient. This property is located in the village. I understand the village is supposed to be walkable to get to the stores and so forth, which I think is great that the people maybe with a sidewalk or some way it's connected to get to stores in the area and also by having this subdivision and more building, we can get more business, quality business. I think we are very fortunate to have a developer that wants to do this project and is offering what he is to the county as far as the roads and what he plans to do. It's gonna be a quality subdivision and this is what we need. He would be very good. I think that it is, uh, we are very fortunate to have him and should take advantage of it. Also, the comprehensive plan, I've been told that it's a guideline. It's nothing in concrete. That it can be shamed according to time and situation. Right now, we have a property that's in the village. It's walkable, and it should be developed, which could have smaller lots. And I do feel that it would be to the advantage and benefit to the county to approve this, and I think that it should be approved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burton. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, other board members. My name is George Andrews. My address is 9302 Belfort Road. I have an office building at 33 Broad Street Road. I came here when I was 27 years old, and I'm 69 now. I think that's about 42 years. 
I'm in 100% in favor of this subdivision. I think we've got a first class builder and he's offered above and beyond what is required. But more importantly, I want to talk to you about a covenant. People have talked about covenants and agreements that came about in the late 1990s and it was between property owners and the Goochland County Board and the planning staff. We were approached that Goochland County wanted to encourage growth of businesses, of companies like located in West Creek and rooftops, and there was one way to do it that was a necessary way to do it, and that was that we reach into our pockets, we the property owners, if we wanted to see this happen and agree to pay an ad valorem tax, that's a 50% more tax we as property owners took that covenant made to us in good faith that if we would agree to pay for this that the county would create a density development for the water and sewer there's no need to have a denser denser development if you're not going to have water and sewer but if you if you're going to have it you've got to pay for it the price tag was $60 million. We took on that commitment in good faith 20 years ago from board members like yourselves. And most people here don't know about that. But I suspect that you all do. And if you don't, it's sad that you weren't made aware of it. It's in writing. I want to commend you that the prior board did not keep their side of the covenant. The only growth that took place was near Hermitage Country Club. And, and people, the word was out, don't dare come to Goochland. I understand that that debt in there is $90 million. Mr. Peterson, if I'm wrong, please correct me. 90 million from 60. Goochland County, not just the citizens here, but Goochland County told us they wanted this they needed it, and we believed them. And I think Goochland County, not just the citizens here, needs this. Now, I want to commend you for Saddle Creek. You kept the promise on Saddle Creek when you approved that high density. I want to commend you on the park, the village there at Centerville. Both of those are very nice developments. They're wonderful people that have come to this community. They've added a lot to it. Reader's Branch, I want to commend you for that. You've done, you've kept your promise. This subdivision is far less dense than the other ones you all have already agreed and allowed to come in. I don't know how in good faith you would look at Main Street homes and say we're going to let those people come in at a much higher density in to the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. It's very important. This is in the district and we're not going to let y'all come in. So I encourage you, I, I want to applaud you for keeping the commitment that was made to us business owners and the millions of dollars that we have forked out and that debt is just going to continue to rise. And so this, this is for the county not just the citizens right here, but it's for the entire county. That's the way it was explained to us. And thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anders. My name is Juanita Pryor. My address is 4380 Capscott Road, Columbia. And I am in favor of this development and I'm yielding my time to Bonnie Agee. Thank you. Hi, I know it's late, but I have a few things I need to say. Um, I've lived in Mannequin Sabbath for over for 41 years. My husband and I built our first house and we're living in the second house in the oh. same neighborhood. Um, Ms. Agee, would you please state your name and address? Oh yes, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Bonnie Agee, I'm at 1416 Windsor Way in Mannequin Sabbath. 23103, about three and a half miles from where this development would be. So we moved out here 41 years ago. We are in our second home. 
the same neighborhood about three and a half miles south of Broad Street. So you can imagine the growth that I have seen in 41 years. It was $750 to join Harmony Beach Country Club for a full golf membership. So we've been out here a long time. Um, Brenda, Brenda Wiley, Betsy Tan, and Ann Knuckles' grandfather Ellis's home was at the corner store of Broad and Mannequin, and Knuckles Exxon was where we went for, for gas and repairs. Short Pump Garage was still at Short Pump, and Broad Street was two lanes with woods and fields to town. Since 1978, at least 22 subdivisions have been approved and built in this area south of Broad Street along Mannequin and Hermitage Roads. Mannequin Road today is the same Mannequin Road of 41 years ago. Nothing has changed except some turn lanes for newer developments have been added. It is built the same as those roads, same roads north of Broad on Mannequin and Rockville Road. All of this development since 1978 has not caused me any inconvenience and traffic is not an issue, nor has ever been. I am on Mannequin Road, Broad Street, and Patterson Avenue multiple times a day, all times of the day. And lately, I have been traveling a lot north of Mannequin Road, north on Mannequin Road, over to Rockville, because I have property on the market over there. And I've rarely seen vehicles, and I rarely run into, if there are, maybe one or two. In 2004, after a 21-year teaching career, I decided to become a realtor. I love selling homes in Goochin and have sold many homes from Mannequin Sabbath out to Haynesville. For the past seven years, I have represented three of these, four of these sellers in search of the right developer for these pieces of Ellison and Baker family land. They have wanted to do something wonderful for Goochin and I also, after 15 years in real estate, would like to do something good for Goochin. So we have searched. There is nothing like this property available in Mannequin Sabbath today in this price range for families to purchase. And if you ask any realtor who lives here or sells in Goochland, they will tell you they have the same frustration. Nothing is out there. There are people who want $600,000 homes built of quality and families who want to be here. Goochland has so much to offer families and has put so much effort into its schools and parks and recreation facilities, which is why people really do truly want to come here. It has won many awards for these efforts, and these awards need to be shared with new families. Centerville is an area designated as a village for growth and higher density and higher than the rural areas. Rural areas. With growth comes new homes, new businesses, and yes, traffic, all of which can exist in harmony. Seven years ago, when these properties became available, nothing past Broad Street, Strangers on Broad Street was there. There was no Wawa. There were no apartments. There was no Audi dealership. Nothing. Nothing was there. But in the last seven years, this property has been on the market from Strangers West. It's just been crazy. There, every piece of property west on Broad Street has been for sale. So people, for, so people that say they want, they moved to Goochland five years ago to be out in the country, they weren't, didn't have their eyes open. The progress was coming. Broad Street was widened, and it's coming, and they just didn't go far enough. There is a desire for these homes. There's a desire for our area. So there are two questions. Do you all want the top multiple award-winning developer, builder, who is willing to invest millions of dollars in Goochland before you can even build one house to do something we can all be proud of or something else not so appealing? Respected developers bring business and growth. Something will be built on this land because it is chosen to be in the water and sewer district. And the sellers have willingly paid over $100,000 in Avalorum taxes since committing their land to Goochland's future. They have a right to have this land developed. On the comprehensive plan, there's no red, there's no red or higher density housing north of Broad Street. It goes to yellow and medium density. South of Broad Street are several areas of red and high density with, with almost two homes per acre. Main Street is asking for 1.25 homes per acre, thus transitioning to fewer homes per acre into the rural preservation area north of Broad following the comprehensive plan. The homes will be on a minimum of a third of an acre, which is desired, and a lot size that today, for today's real estate market. Families today are very active, and smaller lots are more desirable. Not everyone wants to spend weekends mowing grass. They would rather be spending quality time doing the things that they love most. We need younger families in Mannequin Sabbath area who will be our future leaders. The demographics chart for Mannequin Sabbath shows a low dip in residents, ages 34 to 54, and the spike it, it spikes at ages 60 to 64. Who will be the future leaders of, of who will be our future leaders as people age out? New families bring new home sales, 
bringing revenue, economic growth, diversity, new ideas, and leadership. I ask that you approve this. These homes are desirable, they are needed, and they will sell and sell very quickly, and they'll be of the utmost construction and quality. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. E.G. All right, I know it's getting late, but my name is Maria Bambacus. My husband's already spoken. I'm at 1721 Pine Drive. I do have a few words to say before you vote. Uh, we all appreciate everybody's comments and the work that's gone into planning this development by Main Street Properties. And we've heard from many that Goochland wants to remain rural. Well, I've never seen stoplights, uh, uh, floodlights or street lights on or sidewalks in a rural area. And if the vo vote bo board votes to allow this, then they should first toss out their comprehensive plan because otherwise they'll be going totally against the wishes of the county. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, my name is Sue Reichel. I live at 1301 Mannequin Road in Mannequin Sabbath. And we also have two rental properties in Mannequin Sabbath, one on eight, eight acres at 1259 Mannequin and another on eight acres in District 4 on Three Chop Road. And I believe that all three of these properties would be negatively impacted by this proposed high density development. And I ask that you deny it. My husband, four children, and I have many concerns about the project, but I'm gonna focus on the issues of traffic on and around Mannequin Road as a whole and its impact on the safety and the rural character. Mannequin Road has for years been a lovely country road with lots of character. Every day cyclists come to enjoy its views, cruise around the beautiful curves and go up and down the hills. Um, there's no shoulder there on Mannequin Road, so you have to be careful when you pass. Um, there can be tractors, animals being trailered, horseback riders, and even the deep run hounds go by um, pretty often. Um, we came to Goochland 19 years ago so that our kids could grow up caring for their ponies, dogs, and chickens. And we value the clean air, the open spaces, and the A2 zoning. We invested in Goochland. At the time, there were three shops that catered to the horse community that are all out of business now. Instead, we have a Goodwill. We have um, two big name fast food restaurants. Um, and new high density subdivisions. I am not against development um, in accordance with a comprehensive plan, but I do believe that we're nearing a tipping point for the rural character of Mannequin Sabbath, which is specifically mentioned in the comp plan is worth preserving. When we first bought our place on Mannequin Road, traffic was light and almost no consequence. There was little noise. We could safely walk our ponies up and down the road. Um, about six years ago, a homeowner at 1500 Mannequin Road applied for a conditional use permit to operate a bed and breakfast. Um, at the planning commission meeting, some of the commissioners sided with this individual and his friends um, over the concerned citizens saying, well, he already is having events and people are spending the night there. Um, our family and others saw a commercial enterprise looming on the horizon, Dover Hall, in the middle of our peaceful rural neighborhood one that would put hundreds and thousands of additional cars on Mannequin Road, and we have been proven right. Not long ago, there was even an episode of The Bachelorette filmed at Dover Hall. Um, now there are even attraction signs for Dover Hall on 64, as you would see for Bush Gardens or Gray Wolf Lodge, directing even more people to Mannequin Road. The, this ever-increasing business at Dover Hall, combined with the new housing developments and fast food in and near Centerville, have significantly increased traffic and noise on Mannequin Road as cars travel from Centerville south to get quickly to Route 6 and River Road West. We have lost a lot of peace and privacy. Even getting the paper and mail from our mailbox has become much more hazardous, and we no longer feel safe walking our pony along the road. I won't even let my eight-year-old get the mail. My point is that, in mentioning this Dover Hall situation, is that what is decided here with regard to zoning has unintended consequences on people who are already here and playing by the rules. We, we bought our home because we fell in love with Goochland and his character. Over the years, we participated in all those community meetings for the concerned citizens about the comp plan. And we believe that our zoning ordinances and the comp plan are the best way to balance the interests of current or owners against those that want changes made in order to make a profit. Often these people do not even live here. 
Um, this parcel is de designated for medium density and we, um, not high density. Um, there's plenty of high density right down the road in short pump. Tonight, we hear from the applicant that from the global perspective, the effect of this is gonna be marginal. Well, I disagree. All right, just from the traffic impact analysis alone, um, we see that the um, level of service could go from a um, E at this broad, broad and mannequin, which is, I go there every day, that, that intersection can go from E to an F. Well, you, the F is the worst. That's the worst level of service for someone who travels that every day. How is this well thought out? Um, it's, it's just very concerning to myself and my family and we humbly and respectfully ask you to deny this rezoning application. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank staying. You. My name is Kevin Dunn. My wife and I live at 2270 Wheatlands Drive in Mannequin Sabbath. I had not planned on talking tonight, but a couple of pieces of information came to me during this presentation that made my ears perk up. Um, probably the, the most scary part of tonight was seeing the overhead on, on Google Maps of what happens in Goochland and what happens in, can we even say the word, Henrico? If we don't maintain our standards, that'll be us. They've had this conversation and skipped the implications of it years ago, and they're now enjoying the fruits of their efforts. If, let me ask you this, this RPUD zoning uh, is something that looks appealing what are we going to say to the next developer that comes along and sees an equally bucolic piece of land there on Mannequin Road and wants to do a similar development? And we say, oh, no, no, you've got, you got to do a house an acre. Well, wait a minute, you already gave them permission to do more than that. Why can't I have the same? And I think the county attorney is going to be pulling her hair out trying to figure out how to defend that. That's scary as well. We have a plan that a lot of people worked on for many, many hours and came up with as the best solution they could find. It expires in 2035, long time, not so long either, not so long at all. I'd ask you to continue to do the kind of job you've been doing and look out for all of Goochland County particularly those residents along Mannequin Road, Rockford Road, will be affected by this development. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. <laughs> Anybody else? Going once? Going twice. Okay, I'm going to close the uh, public hearing. Oh, I want to take a break. Okay, I hate to do this to you guys. I know it's been a long afternoon, but we've been at it again for another two hours. We want to be alert when we make our decision. So we're going to take another 10 minute break. This time it'll be 10 minutes. So we'll be back right at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Thanks everybody for giving us a little bit of a break. Uh, we've heard from everybody now, so I think what we're going to do is just leave it like this and go home. <laughs> so, uh, just kidding. No, it's not, not going over well. <laughs> Bad joke. <laughs> um, so, board. Mr. Alvarez. Uh, well, first, I think we, uh, next on the process would be for the developer to do a rebuttal to respond to some of the comments that were made. Um, Mr. McClure, right. if you'd come up. All right, thank you. Again, my name is Vernon McClure, owner of Main Street Homes, and uh, we would like to develop this property and build homes on it also. I, I don't know that, you know, originally we were 
looking for 157, 147. Those are what the numbers say. But because I think because we're the builder and developer, we can forego the the profit on the development and build the houses. Really, what we need is lots to build on, and and we have a lot of people that would like to live in this area. So that was the that's the big thing. We we went down to our bottom line, which is 123, and that's providing the road the connectivity, everything that's in the comp plan. Again, the road is in the comp plan, as is the density. Um, I just want to highlight a couple things that I'm going to sit down. In the comprehensive plan, this up on the board, we uh, pulled it up. This came straight out of Chapter 2. It says, as the county grows and changes, a one-size-fits-all approach may not be the most effective way to address all these areas, all the village areas, and that the designated growth areas are where new developments should be encouraged and concentrated. We've all talked about the sewer and water district. Um, there's fear about what happens to the next piece of land. If the next piece of land is not in sewer and water district, that's not even a, a concern. Um, if you didn't have water and sewer, you're not going to be able to get these densities. So we think, I think personally, heartfelt personally, that the plan we have is the best plan. It, it provides the amenities that the county wants. It provides what the, the new homeowners will want. And it is the best plan. Could we do 98? Potentially. We cannot do 98 and the road connection. It's just impossible. There's just, it just can't be done financially. So that's where we are, the, the 123 with the road. And um, I'll be glad to answer questions. We have our traffic um, engineer still here. I think our other engineer took off. Uh, but I do have an engineer over here. So. Uh, anyway, if we can answer any questions, uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the county. I thought they did a, a great job of uh, presenting our case, or the case, and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. McClure. So, board, what's your prerogative? Minute, you want to uh, kick us yeah, off, Mr. Chair? <coughs> Thanks. I'll kick. Try. I'll try and kick it off. So, uh, yeah. Um, so our objective, I think, if I can, I'm going to try and summarize what I think is happening with the with the comp plan, um, based on all the the work that's gone into it and the years of kind of the years of development and how the board has. Um, viewed it and worked um, within it uh, over time and the examples, some of the examples of <coughs> the development that, uh, that has occurred over the, you know, over, over the years. I, the, the main objective of the comp plan, I think, was to maintain, um, you know, well, 85% uh, you know, of the county is as rural and to designate 15% of the land mass uh, as our designated growth areas, and those growth areas were situated around um, already existing, um, you know, villages that had been uh, been in the county forever. Um, uh, here, in, here in the courthouse in Centerville. Um, and to constrain the growth into the into the designated areas, added on top of that, of course, uh, as the history lesson is, the Tuck Oak Creek Service um, a TCSD, uh, which came in in around 2000 2002 or so, and I think as as George mentioned earlier in his presentation, there were a few commitments registered by uh, the county. Uh, as that process as that process unfolded, now if I can fast forward um, a, a little bit, so the board, or certainly I look at the plan. And I'm not going to speak for the board. the 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 plan does give give us some wiggle room, and from time to time, the board does exercise um, its prerogative uh, and. It's judgment to 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 color kind of 
maybe slightly outside the lines, but mostly stay uh, inside the lines when we're when we're coloring um, as the county as the county develops. Um, if I can fast forward again, to, if I fast forward to this uh, instant case. Um, since kind of its inception, the, the two keys for me have been <coughs> the connector road, which was uh, to me not in a through a residential area. Uh, my interpretation of the connector road was kind of a a, a bypass of um, you know bypass between Rockville and Mannequin in order to speed kind of north of Broad Street travel uh, in that in that corridor that may eventually develop into you know a higher density area with commercial uh, business and uh, some resident and some residential growth same on the south side of broad broad street um, other areas in the in the county parallel to uh, broad street near to near near to Centerville Ashland Road, you know some of those some of those thoroughfares, as we found in the Oshucks, the the the, the project up by Oshucks, uh, even when a road was designated as a uh, not as a thoroughfare but as a residential road, in essence, what happened is nearly 50% of the residents thought that they were living in a cul-de-sac neighborhood, even uh, with the assurances or with the information that was provided theoretically from the from the builder developer about what was going to happen with those properties there. Kind of a learning lesson, I think, for us. So I guess my point here is to, on the discussion about the connector road is this creates a, a complication for me in my analysis of whether or not that connector road is appropriate through a neighborhood that's connecting basically two relatively significant roads in the county, Rockville Road and Mannequin Road. So my thought is, is that connector road, that road, whatever it is, um, is, is maybe ill-placed in this particular uh, proposal and is not a real benefit uh, for the county in, in that respect. Um, you know, I think the discussion about um, roads in general is is very important uh, at this point, especially in our in our high growth areas. We know we're going to have traffic. We know we're not going to have roads that will meet the demand, but will. Uh, or meet the demand that we may like, but that will meet the demand to move traffic, uh, maybe not as efficient as we like, but certainly have the ability uh, to move the roads, so uh, or move traffic on the, on the roads. So the stipulation that we're looking at three or four other dominoes to fall uh, in order to have still in the final analysis, a decreased level of service uh, on all those roads and intersections is really probably not a good plan for me to uh, approach in regard to suggesting that would be a good idea uh, for something that we should for something that we should do. Um, the suitability of a RPUD versus an R1 or an R3. Um, I guess for, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where I fall on this RPUD, R1, R3 um, discussion. I think the, the benefits of an RPUD are evident in a number of our neighborhoods. I happen to live in one. There's probably a lot of people in, or some people in here that live in RPUD na neighborhoods. Um, many do not that, that live here uh, or that are here this evening. Um, you know, it's all kind of in the eye of, eye of the beholder, I, I guess. And 
which also goes to me uh, the discussion about what do we mean by in this transition area of going from you know from high density to medium density to low density that's also almost a definition that is hard to quantify because what's medium density to me is high density to somebody else and low density represents something else completely uh, completely different so I think what we know is that uh, you know we have uh, by all by all known measures uh, you know a very high quality uh, builder developer uh, long term uh, landowners family connected to the community um, I have no doubt in my mind that the development of this nature would be uh, you know highly sought after and it would probably be of the highest quality, but the the density for this, um, as we've stated in the comp plan, uh, generally stated in the comp plan, is of medium density, about one acre, um, that may or may not be accompanied with a connector road. So I guess my point in all this is that um, I'm certainly in favor of a, de of a development in that area um, probably much more closely akin to um, the R1 or R398 home number uh, minus a connector road because I'm still not quite understanding what that value might be. Um, but um, you know, I'm not also, also not exactly sure how we get there from from here, um, and so um, <coughs> I think I'd be uh, seeking you know some input from the from the board on their their thoughts and their individual thoughts here on this and uh, their impressions of uh, what's before us. I would actually, uh, if you're okay, I, I'd like to ask some questions of our planning uh, staff. Um, the, um, the connector road, um, when, when, we, when we talked about this road, like some of the other connector roads in the, in the area, our expectation is that they'll be built as projects get approved, correct, Joanne? Yes, sir. Do we have an estimate for what this road would cost if um, if we had to build it ourselves? It indicated <laughs> just the the bridge portion and, and you know portion of the road up to that point would be eight hundred thousand um, dollars. All. Full road. I believe they're saying the full road would be about five million dollars. Yeah. Okay. I think um, yeah we had as we were doing our planning for the 25-year plan, okay. we had an estimate for it of about 5.6 million somewhere in that vicinity. Um, I know I had another question, but it's kind of. Well, and I, I can tell you, I mean, recently we just went through, the, and I mentioned it at the 3 o'clock meeting, the paving of 522. Uh, there were people, my neighborhood was kind of in the middle of that paving, and a lot of people were taking 522 to get to Dogtown, I mean, taking my neighborhood to get to, to Dogtown Road, and it alleviated a lot of issues because they were paving long parts of traffic, and so... It was taking 20 or 25 minutes between allowing one lane to go and the other lane. So that's one reason why, why it might be beneficial. Um, another thing that I know comes up in all the discussions is, um, you know, what is this gonna mean for us for schools? I know that came up. Our 25-year plan, we've tried to address 
And I believe as we address the 25 year plan, we looked at the comprehensive plan and we looked at the, at the worst case, I think, for development based on zoning or based on the comp plan. In this case, we might have looked at the 98 homes, not the, uh, not the 28, which probably, which means that the difference between what we planned for in the 25 year plan was 25 homes, not 123 homes. Um, the question of a fire came up at three o'clock. We heard from our fire chief that we're getting ready to hire the people that we need to staff all our stations by the end of the year. We have 42 applicants for, I think, seven, seven positions. Uh, so it's not, none of this is a surprise to the board or a shock to our planning process is where I'm going. So I do have a lot of concerns with it. And I think one of the concerns that that the neighbors have is uh, we go with our PUD and I, I just asked our attorney in during the break, uh, will she be pulling her hair out when the next developer comes, <coughs> comes to ask for our PUD? And the answer is really no, because no zoning decision is precedent setting. Each one is looked at independently based on its own merits. So she won't have to pull her hair out. Um, but it does make it easier for the next developer, obviously, to come in and say, oh, it's already RPUD next door. Why can't we do RPUD? Um, I'm concerned about the traffic, the increased traffic on narrow roads. And I, I've, I've been to this. I've probably spent more time on this project than any other. And I've been out there. I was out there yesterday for about two hours driving into all the different neighborhoods, going back across. I try to take um, 771. Uh, to see if that really is a good crossover. I mean, cut over and it really isn't. Most of that is actually in Hanover County. Um, but I do have a lot of <coughs> concerns about additional, <coughs> additional traffic. Not sure that 123 versus 98 will make a difference. Um, I have concerns about the intersection of Mannequin and 250 and Rockville and Ashland. I know that Rockville and Ashland will will be taken care of in our 25 year plan as we take a look at Ashland Road. I think that'll be the time to look at Rockville at that intersection. I am concerned about urbanization of the area. And this is something that just last week or the week before, we had a listening session for citizens who are concerned about noise. So we're looking at a noise ordinance. Anytime people come in that move into third acre lots, uh, they're going to be complaining about cows moving down the road, mooing down the road, or roosters crowing. And so that's, that concerns me because I, I hear it in some in my neighborhood. So dogs barking, all of that stuff that I, that I think is a concern. And I wish we could put it into the deeds and say, you're moving to the country. <laughs> and as Mr. Lyle said at one point, there are going to be smells, noises, and outdoor sex. That's the way he put it. <laughs> Um, so, animal, 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 animal only, animal. legally, animal, <laughs> animal only. Um, a concern I have with the, <laughs> a connection I have with the, the connection The county road. attorney is pulling her hair out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I do this to her all the time. <laughs> uh, the, the connecting road, I, I do have a concern with it going by front yards. Uh, you would think that if you move into a neighborhood, you want, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up in the city here, um, a good part of it in Cuba, but I grew up here and I could ride my bicycle down Stewart Avenue. I'm not sure I could do it today and not necessarily for traffic reasons. Um, but I think having a, a thoroughfare through the neighborhood could be an issue uh, down the road. And so the, the last thing I'll, I'll say at this, up to now will be, the concern that I have with RPUD, I think is a concern some of the neighbors have, is will that drive other RPUD uh, subdivisions? Is there an opportunity to do R3 but proffer all the good things from RPUD? Um, I'm, not sure if, I'm not sure if that can be done or R1 with the proffers for uh, proffers to cover RPUD. But anyway, so 
those are my concerns. I think there's a lot of a lot of good. I think this developer is top notch. I <coughs> think there may be a developer that comes in and says, "I want to do 49 homes on this side of the creek, and and we'll get no buffer and and not many other uh, benefits." They will be extending the water and sewer line. Um, I don't hear cable extension, but I think everybody in that area already has cable, uh, so that's not a big not a big deal. It would be a big deal in my end of the woods. Um, again, um, the the pros to me are it's a local development, maybe not Goochland yet, but I'm hoping that they'll mm -hmm. move to Goochland, see the see all the things that we have and move to Goochland, but. Um, it's a nice layout. I think it's a really nice laid out neighborhood. If, to me, if the road could be moved to the side where it wouldn't be going right through front yards, um, I think it would be a, a great extension. And again, we're, we're really, I heard from several people tonight, and we're not really arguing over the 98. We're looking at the, it's really the, the 25. And I think that's a, um, um, that's really what we're, what we're really looking at. Ms. Lascolet, Ms. Golovkins, next. <laughs> I'm sorry I made you get up, I only have one question, but <laughs> I think I'll have more before I'm done, but. Excuse me, I'm done. I'll, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts. If okay. Um, You know, uh, what I was hearing a lot was uh, folks don't want short pump. I, I hear that a lot. We get emails, and, and I was at a function last night, and uh, somebody cornered me and, and said they were opposed to this, and they said they don't want it to be, and I, you know, I asked them why, and they said they don't want it to become like short pump. And I hear that often, but I, over the last few months, I've started to ask, what do you mean by that? Because I think it could mean different things to different people. And the recurring theme when I had a chance to ask people, what do you mean you don't want short pump, is um, traffic. That was, you know, they just don't like the traffic. So that's why I, earlier I dove right into the traffic question, because that concerns me when I saw level D going to level E, and, and I just had a lot of questions about that. Um, so traffic is a concern. Um, I, I, I didn't realize earlier this evening I was basically uh, not savvy enough yet, haven't figured all this out, to realize I was basically walking into kind of a problem we have at local government level is, you know, capacity. There's, there's, you know, we, we've committed to things and that kind of flows into the financial aspects of what can we expect from a developer in terms of things that have been approved but are not yet um, online. So that's sort of a inside baseball kind of thing that I think we need to continue to advocate with the General Assembly. Um, because I think we end up, inevitably when we do these things, I think we're gonna end up with traffic problems and other problems and, and we have to be sensitive that we don't add demands that the county's not financially ready to take on. But to Mr. Alvarez's point, this uh, one uh, person spoke this evening about the schools. Well, we're redoing our capital improvement plan uh, to address schools and that's, uh, the approved plan is talking about a new school here in the center of the county and the school board knows they're going to need to redraw lines to relieve uh, capacity problems at, at Randolph. So uh, to your point, these things are not a complete surprise. We have plans for fire and rescue. We have plans for schools and, and they're not just, uh, they're, they're plans that are really on paper in terms of the capital improvement model. So traffic is a concern. Um, the other thing that I've heard repeatedly that, that has stuck with me is the transition element. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. We've got, I'm looking at the, well, I'm looking at this, that uh, that's on the board. To the north is in the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. To the west is not. And, and I was a little puzzled by transition, but we heard some things tonight that I think makes sense. <coughs> people's concerns. What I'm, what I'm puzzled about a little bit, and I don't feel comfortable personally um, giving it a lot of weight or concern, is the idea of small lots. And I know I appreciate 
several people said it tonight. We've gotten emails where people are saying that the smaller lots are ridiculous, <coughs> in words to that effect. That's what people want to buy. I think the, the builder developer is, I, I expect he's building a product that, that he and other, and that's what we see from other developers. That's, look at the higher density and all in the maps that they've shown us of the things that have been approved. People want the higher density. I only have anecdotal evidence of it, but people I talk to, my age, later 50s, and, and some younger and older, and we heard some people say it tonight, folks don't want large lots. So I get a little <coughs> uncomfortable <coughs> when we, I think, are moving these in a direction that are, are pressing a builder or developer to do a design that maybe is, is less than, or is less than optimal in terms of what people want. In this case, I would look at it as like smaller lots, more open space. Um, and more open space tends to lead to the rural, chance to do more of a rural nature and feel to it. Um, so, so I'm competing the tra transition part to the west of this versus maybe smaller lots in the interior. But uh, you know, I know that what's before us is a minimum of 15,000 15, square foot, which I think is about a third. And Ms. Hunter, correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> but R1, as I read the ordinance, let me bring it back up here. R1, where, there, where lots are served by uh, public water and public sewage system, the minimum lot is 24,000 square feet. <coughs> I did my calculation. That's just slightly over half an acre. So is, is that, am I correct that R1? Yes. So And R3 is 20,000 square foot lots with uh, public utilities. Okay. R3 is 20,000 20, square feet mm -hmm. and, and R1. So part of this is already R1, right. uh, part of this property. So I, we saw this last month where we can look at what the comprehensive plan shows with the yellow but then the existing zoning is inconsistent with the uh, comprehensive plan, potentially. Is R1, R1 medium density? Would you call that medium density? The way the um, classification reads for medium density is it says it's an average lot size of one acre and corresponds to the R1 and R3 district. So it would, the R1 but is But if R1 consistent. allows you where public water and sewer is 24,000, then you're talking half That's acre right. lots. Mm -hmm. Minimum lot size. Minimum. Yeah, your minimum and averages. Okay. Okay. So the things that I've heard that have I focused on traffic, <coughs> follow the comp plan, and transition. And I'm going to read, and I appreciate people pointing to the comp plan, but there's a lot in here that folks can point to, to, that's always the way it is, you point to the sentences that make your case, but uh, this property is going to be developed. We have, a, we have a person who's been trying to sell it. We have willing buyers. It's in the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. Um, it's going to be developed. I am inclined to, um, and I complimented Main Street Homes earlier, I, I'm new to this, but I, I've been around long enough that I don't know that every developer builder would make quite the community outreach and effort that we've seen from this developer and they are award winning you it, it it's and I don't think anybody disputes that um, the, the histor history of the company is good products and and certainly our experience has been positive um, w with the effort made and I I get the numbers uh, you know that 123 is your your, your low point that the numbers don't work at 98, that just seems to make sense to me. And the price on the bridge construction has been consistent with what county is telling us is their analysis of the cost. But I do want to just tie back to the comprehensive plan. It, it, it reads in part in the Centerville Village, the area between Ashland Road and Mannequin Road is the, quote, village core, close quote. This area already has developed areas, but there are opportunities for infill development or redevelopment. 
the, er, this area should be the village focus and have pedestrian amenities, landscaping, and buildings that are unique to the corridor and high quality building materials. <coughs> and then it continues, while Centerville will not be rural, it should have rural elements that are characteristics of the county. And they go on to talk about aesthetic improvements, split rail fencing. So I, I, this is not the rural part of the county. It's just, it's just not. Um, I think the question is, is this right for this location? Um, and I know after last month's approval, I've had some constituents suggest that it seems like the county is always trying to grab the money. Um, yeah, I'm sensitive to that. Uh, but Mr. Andrews pointed out, and we are familiar, I think every, everybody on this board, I was on the school board when this board, uh, when the other members of this board joined this board, and we were all in it together in terms of dealing with servicing debt from a huge debt that was taken on in 2001. And, and to Mr. Um, I think uh, Dunn's point, how do you deal with the next property along Mannequin Road? Well, I think the, the Tuckahoe Creek Service District ends at that point. Um, when you're going up Mannequin Road, it doesn't end to the north, but it ends at that point. So there would have to be some affirmative action on this board to say we're going to expand Tuckahoe Creek Service District. Uh, is how I, I would see that happening. So uh, I would like to see, we, we're doing a zoning rewrite right now, and I hope the community will stay as engaged in the zoning rewrite that we're working on here for the next six months as people have been in individual cases because it's in the zoning rewrite where I think we can really frame where we go from here. But in the middle of the Tuckahoe Creek Service District, um, we really have to strongly consider a development if, it, if it's quality, um, a quality development and, and doesn't run afoul of things. And I think when you look at the comp plan as a whole, uh, with the features and the proffers. And again, this is RPUD with proffers. When you just look at the raw R RPUD versus RPUD with proffers, I think that's where the developer is, is somewhat stepping up uh, to address, I think like he said, you're, in the, you're balancing between R3 and RPUD, trying to take advantage of things and, and make some protections. So connector road, I'm, I'm with uh, Mr. Minnick. I, uh, first look at this, I'm scratching my head. Uh, is it what, what we want? Again, I think the developer believes this. I, I'm sure the developer wouldn't do it if it believed it, if, if you all believed it diminished your product or it diminished your ability to sell the, the product. I think, Mr. Alvarez, you talked about earlier, and we, we kind of stumbled upon this um, in a neighborhood over in near Patterson Avenue where we s I noticed in some deeds there was language that cautioned people that they're moving near a, near a quarry. Um, I don't know if you've considered, um, if, you, if you've considered uh, some kind of language like that in, the, in your first out, out deeds that particularly if people can be looking at one side and, the, and there's no evidence that the road's complete, because that's what we were facing at the aw shucks uh, situation where folks were hesitant I mean, folks were like, what? I didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't grasp that this was coming. And our response, well, you could have looked at the plan and seen it, but that's sometimes understandably not really what folks want to hear. But if it's in a deed that comes out to the first buyer that, hey, there's a connector road that's going to be connecting these two ends of this neighborhood, maybe that would um, be something you, you might, if you haven't considered, maybe you would consider it. I guess, do you, do you mind if I ask you a few questions, Mr. McClure? Um, the the, the, have you, have the you HOA, the HOA, I'm not an attorney, but the HOA documents might be a good place for that. Sure, yeah, because okay, we, that, that's fine. We, yeah. we have to give those to every buyer. Right, yeah, that would be a way to discuss it. That's great, that's a good thought. Okay. Um, have you... Have you thought about like a tra transition along Mannequin Road? Have you considered any kind of a, 
way to make a transition. I'm looking at, I think what there's 11 or so lots along that side that, and I know this is just a conceptual plan. Right. Would, would larger lots there, have you considered maybe larger lots along that side? We, if, if we could keep the 123 and move them around, we, we could go to 20,000 or our three lots on that row is that the northwest, I guess? Yeah, north, northwest. If it's up against Mannequin, we could do that. That is something that's been done before in other areas. And, I, 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 again, I don't want to be, I want to. I think it's Mannequin. Though. I want to be. Right. Yeah. I think he's talking about that row that bumps up this, to. This is the transition to rural enhancement. Right. This is still in the Tuck Mercy Service District, still right. on. So I think when folks are talking about a transition, it is. Well, part of it is in the village, still. And Tucker Oaks. And maybe, you know, I don't want to try to get too bogged down in, in details, but if you could do some interior, because when you and I have talked about mm -hmm. it, and I've shared with you that uh, my thought is, at least as I said earlier, folks are looking Sometimes they're looking for smaller homes. Right. Um, maybe you could make up the difference with smaller lots in the interior. Mm -hmm. Something if you if you had somehow permission to do smaller lots. We we would have no problem with that. Actually, having different size lots gives us a little more market differentiation. So, I would have no problem with making that proffer if we could write figure out how to write it up. If that's a concern. Well, uh, again, you've heard the, tra the mm -hmm. transition is something that I think is, sure. is, is something that people have been raising that seems right. like a legitimate current because at that point you are at the edge of, I guess, what we'll call the village. Right. Um, further in, you're, you're not. So right. I don't know how we would. Yes, we, we, could, we could certainly do that if we could get the language. And, and I came up with 24,000 square feet on that because that is – that is R1, that's the R1 number, where there's water and sewer, that, that's the minimum lot size. So I was thinking 24,000 square feet for some of those homes near that transition area. And then, and then in exchange, if, if you wanted to just do rough math, 36 interior lots, you could go to 12,000 square feet. And that would, the math is. <laughs> What's that? And I, I'm, tr I'm being careful. I'm just trying to address. I, I, I think we're, I'm going to come back to traffic, but traffic and that transition piece if, are if, the things that have. If we me had first. a couple of elements that we wanted to work out, and if we wanted to do a deferral, we would be glad to ask for that. If if we needed time to work through that, if if that's well, what we're talking let's about. Well, let's just let's just leave okay. it that I that yes. I that I've just suggest I've, I've just. Ask, ask you questions. all if you all have considered <coughs> yes considered it is something that that we've to considered to address transition correct let's see what um yeah, i don't know where the other board members are right I'm, I'm, I'm trying to address some, some of the concerns that i've heard repeatedly or at least see if you all if you all are thinking along some lines that, that i'm i'm wondering correct and and back to the road we we would much much prefer the road in the front than the rear of lots because the rears where we have the buffers, and that's that's what people, that's their private area. So we'd rather not have the road in the rear. That was a big thing for us. So, and we've developed many neighborhoods like this. Has the traffic person, uh, tra traffic engineer, have you have you have you um, have you given any? Did you do any thought to with well, the traffic is through? Have you done anything to talk to, and analyze <coughs> through traffic through the neighborhood? For the neighborhood itself, yeah. no. Um, the it is expected that there will be some sort of cut through traffic. Obviously, you're connecting two facilities, Rockville and Mannequin, um, for this particular part of the village. Uh, there's certainly going to be some desire to potentially cut through. Um, so there will be that traffic there. I would definitely anticipate that. Uh, 
if you're talking about the sheer capacity of the roadway to handle it, no, I'm not, not, yeah, not. that 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 won't be a problem. Yeah, I don't think I'm so much for that. I'm, I'm thinking more safety for the community. Uh, you know, well, the, the part of the through. part of the safety aspect, if you look at the current plan, is that it's it 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 has many uh, angles and intersections within the within the overall uh, uh, link or connector. Uh, which is one of the reasons I think you guys are concerned about even thinking of it as what you had envisioned as being a connector between the two facilities. Uh, it's not a it's not a facility that would necessarily say this is a good way to go. This isn't a necessarily an ideal route for uh, a typical daily drive, um, but it does provide that connectivity that we, from a traffic engineering perspective, treasure. Um, what you want to do in a facility, anytime you provide connectivity, is you want to provide people with options when there are issues that, that are beyond the typical condition. And this facility will do that. Now, does that necessarily jive with a residential street where you're potentially going to have conflict with parked cars, things of that nature? Um, it's not ideal, but it's, a, it, it's an acceptable situation, I think, to, 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 to present, which is what this particular plan does um, but from an analytical standpoint no there was no specific analysis performed on it gotcha thank you thank you mr chairman Mr. Escalette, would you um, uh, thank you mr chairman i'll just make this very brief i'm concerned about the transition concerned about the traffic on mannequin and 250 in, in particular um, i don't like the connector road i prefer the 98 homes uh, or at least one per acre. Um, I understand you wanted to connect me if you did not 48 or 49 each side to connect them. If you didn't do a connector road and did some kind of a, of a passenger, uh, you know, a walkability um, bridge of some kind, that would lower the cost a lot. Maybe you could uh, then be able to do the 98 homes. Um, I don't know that we've got actually really the right zoning uh, classification for this uh, you're requesting uh, 1.25 per acre or one gets you pretty close actually well pretty close to that so um, the level of service E and F are you are you kidding me I mean it's I, I, this that's horrible so those are all my cons my concerns about this I think we've got um, a lot to think about here uh, the transition is a big concern of mine, um, and the connector road. Don't, don't, I don't care for the connector road at all. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, if nothing else, the citizens of Goochland tonight get an award for endurance. You guys have been amazing. Um, our job, obviously, is to represent you, the citizens, both the landowners that are potentially selling and the ones who live next door and the 21,000 some odd that aren't here tonight. And so our job is, is relatively easy. We just make everybody happy all the time. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out whether yes or no makes everybody happy. And um, that said, there are some very attractive features of this proposal. Um, the builder not with, is a quality builder. And I hope we didn't embarrass you tonight by having everybody come up here one at a time and say you're a great builder and a great uh, award-winning um, partner, and we'd love to have you here. Um, it's the appropriate land use. It's residential. It's in the village. It's um, the right kind of thing in the right kind of area. Uh, cash proffers, they're offering the full cash proffer impact that they're allowed to. Um, water and sewer would accommodate higher density than it's currently there. So there's, there's an awful lot of attractive features to this. There are some concerns, um, and I don't mean to minimize those. Um, we've heard the concerns about uh, increased student load on the schools. Uh, we've heard about the demands on fire rescue and the sheriff's department. We've also heard about the demands on the infrastructure, uh, the roads system, the level of service. and uh, By the way, by my understanding is that the best speeches have a strong finish and a strong ending and you keep the two as close together as possible. So I'm, not, I'm going to try not to drone on here on this. But net-net, I think I'd be the, the, the 98, 1.0 per acre um, 
it's a guide, I get that. Um, substantial compliance is something I'm familiar with. It could be 0.999, it could be 0.98, it could be 1.0. Uh, the idea is substantially compliant, and the further you move away from that, the less compliant you are. So 1.25, you know, density. Um, I guess there's three, three primary areas for me. One is the comprehensive land use plan. And that's our, one of our primary planning documents. It's an excellent document. It is a guide, but it's an excellent guide. And this clearly doesn't comply with the density that's in our comprehensive land use plan. So from a planning standpoint, um, it's, it's kind of out of bounds with what's currently in the plan. From a services standpoint, the public services, which is schools, fire safety, um, fire rescue, um, sheriff's department, those public services um, we anticipate growth in Goodson County going forward, and that is embedded in our planning documents and in our capital impact model where we plan on spending money in the future to preserve the current level of services despite the anticipated growth that's going to come. We don't want a deterioration of a level of services for the public services in Goodson just because there's more people here. So we, we bake that into our plans. And, and so in our capital improvement plan, it's a 25-year plan, we have new schools, we have new firehouses, we have new sheriff deputies. All of those things are, are built in there. So those are somewhat under our control to be able to manage that to make sure that the level of service doesn't deteriorate. Uh, the third area, so you got planning and then the, uh, the services, and the third area is the infrastructure. And we heard tonight about um, the, uh, the roads, the intersections, um, the cut-throughs. The, the roads, to a certain extent, the infrastructure, to a certain extent, is outside of this board's purview because we don't maintain our own roads. We look to VDOT, and VDOT doesn't build roads in anticipation of development. They build roads after the development is there and there's a problem and they need to address it. So we have a limited control over ensuring that the infrastructure is there to support it. And currently, right now, uh, with the anticipated growth in that area, um, the level of service is, is below the, uh, the acceptable level and again, partially beyond our control. So, so net net, I'm willing to entertain the idea of substantial compliance, all else being equal, but there are some serious concerns here. And the cut through does, does concern me as well. Um, you know, we're looking for the connector, is it a connector or a cut through? Well, we know the difference. A connector is, gives you two ways to go when you come out of your driveway and a cut through is something everybody else uses to come through. And, and I, th I think in the plan, the desire was to give people options to be able to go in different directions and for fire rescue to be able to take shortcuts to get to emergency situations as well. Uh, but you don't want to make it that attractive to, that it's a cut through in the center of development because having a, a number of driveways and parked cars on the, on the streets where you've got uh, emergency vehicles or a high speed cut through um, is, is kind of incongruous. And we've seen developments with both kinds of, uh, so those are some of my thoughts. Uh, there's a lot of attractive features with this. There are some concerns and, and wait a minutes and, and hold ups. Um, can they be addressed? I'm not sure. Um, I know the, the um, applicant and the developer have um, sought to address uh, a lot of the concerns to a certain extent um, and have indicated that they're, they're kind of running out of uh, wiggle room there to, to make additional, um, um, additional adjustments. But, but those are some of my concerns and, and kind of where I'm coming out. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Anybody else? Um, I, um, I'm thinking we've, we've proposed several things that um, I don't think we could work out tonight. And I, I'm wondering if it wouldn't make sense for us to defer to, to the July meeting um, to, to give us a little more time to, to work out for our planning staff to work with the developer to see if some of these things could be resolved. These, these lot sizes on the, um, on the, I guess, outside the village and the, maybe even the access, the, the uh, connector road. Um, I know you guys have stayed here for a long time tonight and, um, but I, I really think that this is a good opportunity for us and I would, rather defer and get a better uh, development than to say no and uh, the best we can do is go away for a year. 
Your thoughts? Yes or no? Yeah, we, this has been a Sorry. very long process. I mean, uh, when Ms. Hunter presented, I think she talked about uh, the first meeting and the last meeting, but how many were in between? I mean, there have been a, a lot of meetings. A lot of discussion about this, a lot of community input, and planning commission, and now now to us. I, I would prefer not. I would prefer not to defer it. That'd be my feeling. I, I think a lot of the meetings were really, you know, a lot of developers were not willing to to hold those meetings, and they would have had the community community meeting come to the planning commission and then to the board, and that would be it. Uh, they kind of made a lot of adjustments over time. Um, and I I don't see why maybe we could get a perfect project if we stayed on. Maybe it's not 98, maybe it's 99, maybe it's 100, maybe it's maybe it's 123 with a really good connector road and, and some transition. Um, that's, that's just my thought. But I'm willing to, um, to go with what the majority prefers. I guess if we if we were thinking about deferring, I'd, I'd want to be a, try to be as specific as we could in terms of what we hope to accomplish. Right. I mean, very very specific as to what we what we ask what we would ask the developer in the planning par department to address. I'm not sure we can give that guidance. I'm not sure all of us are on the same page exactly. I mean, if they brought something back. If we deferred it and they brought something back that I'm still not going to vote for, what's the point? You vote against so, well, I, well, I would. <laughs> I, mean, um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that we've been able to provide direction because all the meetings have been, I've been to pretty much all the meetings, but I've been there to observe and listen, not to provide right. any input. I think now we, tonight we've provided, or developed a lot of input that we could provide that might um, get them to kind of look at the plans again and see what what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. But again, I'll, I'll uh, defer uh, to you all. Uh, um. Uh, Mr. Chair, I mean, we did hear from a lot of the the residents that that, that they that they are interested in getting to yes. Uh, I mean, I guess so. And I think this board, in practice, has 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 um, you, you know operates in that same same fashion. And and again, you know, just speaking out just speaking out loud it, is we do potentially. Um, you know, risk throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, by not by not making some attempt to mitigate some of these some of these issues, because on balance there are a number of favorable issues about this product or about this uh, pro about this proposal. There are also some problems. Uh, as well, and I don't think those those can go without being that those can go without being addressed. But I just also know that in its current form, that that this would be a difficult project for me to for me to support, based on a number of factors that we've already discussed: um, transportation, you know, level of level of service, the road, density. I mean, I just tick them off again. So. Uh, you know, I, you know. I think we all heard the getting to yes. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really getting to yes or getting to 98, but, <laughs> but we heard getting to yes, and 
and I. I think that's the same thing. What's that? Yeah. I think the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the so f for me, and I, I suffer from um, Cuban exile disease, <laughs> and I know there's at least one person in the audience that suffers from the same disease, um, and I, I the, the and I, I was told yesterday, well, this is not Cuba, and it's true, uh, but the heavy hand of government is the same whether it's in Cuba or in America. And I think we're fighting over 25, 25 lots is really the argument here, 25 lots. Uh, because I heard tonight from a lot of people, 98 would be an easy approval. And so, so to me, if we have the opportunity to wait a month and come back with a better plan, maybe more acceptable, maybe a yes plan, I would rather do that than say no and, and, and feel like I'm being heavy handed. Uh, I know that I've got friends on both sides here and I may not have one side tomorrow, um, but that's, that's my yeah. thought. Mr. Chair, if I could. Um, there's a scenario where we defer, come back a month later, and the developer is bringing the exact same proposal to us. And so I, if it's okay, maybe we perhaps ask the <laughs> developer, if this is last and final, then a deferral doesn't mean much. Um, maybe that's a question that, as long as the county attorney doesn't pull her hair out, are we, are we able, okay to do that? Okay. We're really worried about your hair tonight. We, <laughs> um, you should but, be worried but, about the gray, not the pulling out. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not going right? to touch that one with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> but perhaps it's a question worth asking because yeah. otherwise we're just, why are we doing it? Good point. Mr. McClure. It's I, I think, I mean, I would take the deferral if I could. Um, I think we've heard things tonight that we could uh, address that maybe we didn't have. We're, we're kind of caught in between the comp plan showing a road that we need to build, is required, and then density. And it, you can't really financially provide both. So that's what we needed some direction on, and I think we got some of that tonight. So right. if, if you would allow us to do that, we would do it and, and refine our plan and come back. And then it's either going to be yes or no, I guess, at that point. Right. <laughs> you so, know, Mr. So. Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind. Uh, um, yes, ma'am. So we heard from our planning department that the road does not have to go through this project. We've heard that last time. The road belongs somewhere in there, but doesn't have to go through this particular project. Is that right? Is that Did I miss here? I that. missed that. <laughs> I think you're going to get that plan. So again. when we looked at um, the roads, when we were doing the comprehensive plan, uh, this area was chosen because this was the smallest area of where the floodplain is. Um, uh, certainly, if we if the road was to the north and that northern piece next to Mannequin is not in the TCSD and not in the thing, we would not get that road through development. It would be very difficult. Um, if it's not on this property, then it would go south through the golf course. Um, the, again, the, the floodplain is, is wider there. There's potential that it could go there. Um, but the comp plan, I, I think the applicant yeah, I think I said at one of the community meetings, they're sort of in a rock and a hard place. They can either be consistent with the density of the comprehensive plan or they can be consistent with the road, but it's hard meshing the two, and I think that's that's the struggle that they're seeing. And, and, and they probably feel like a yo-yo because they're hearing the citizens say we want less lots and they're hearing the county say we've got a road. So they're trying to make everybody happy, and, and that's hard to do. And I totally get that. That totally makes mm -hmm. sense to me, but... Um, the road is what's driving the density. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have to do the road, you could do less density, right? It would be In less theory? Yeah. Exactly. You don't have that expense. I, I did want, I think, I think you clarified that, but if, if you do look at the road location, if you go north of that, the, like I said, the floodplain, the creek splits, so you, you couldn't cross at that northern area. Uh, where it is is kind of where it needs to be, if it goes through the property, or if we're required to do it. Plus, I think that Ms. Hunter, you so if the road's going to have to be there, right. if the road's going to have to be through the subdivision, then we've got nothing to discuss, right? You can see here the Y where yeah. the 
concrete sort of split so you'd have two crossings if the road was on this property but pitched further north. And Ms. Hunter, did I understand you? I mean, if, if, we, if we go to the north, then we're going to be passing this property, and then to the left, to the west, we're going to be going through area that's not in the Tucker Creek Service. It's not going to be developed. Right. And so we're not going to have a developer build a road. And right. there's no reason to get close. So, so I guess it could potentially get pushed to the south, um, but there are, the, the floodplain is larger there. South of here, the floodplain's larger. North of there, we're going to be splits. we're going to be traversing a part that's not that's it would be two bridges. It's not going to be developed. Right. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Rankin, make a comfortable statement. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Mr. Chair. Mr. So I mean, my uh, what I was saying is is that just assumes that we have to have a road that goes through. I mean, so if we're talking about the discussion about we, we either got to have a road or we got to have the density. So my question now, as it has been, I think pretty much since I heard about this project is why do we have to have a road period? I know, I know it's in our comprehensive plan. I know it does make sense in circumstances to have a road, uh, through and through an intersection, but it, or through a residential development, but it's not necessary here to meet uh, to meet a particular objective because you can still egress and ingress residents out of the neighborhood, uh, out of the the two contiguous neighborhoods without a connecting road through and through. But, but the connector road does serve a purpose, I believe. I think it, it what, for, purpose? what purpose? What purpose? Safety. Safety. Um, in, in the event of a, an accident in another area, it provides rescue access, fire rescue access, and it's an outlet if there's a... There is a reason why we put it in the, in yeah. the comp plan. Yeah. Um, not sure. I mean, right now, if there's if there's if there's a need to access an incident on Rockville Road, they they go Ashland to Rockville. <laughs> you know, two fifty two two fifty to Ashland to, to Rockville, or they go the northern route, or they get serviced from uh, mutual aid, uh, from um, mutual aid um, out of out of um, Hanover. I mean, to me, it would make sense, maybe, to defer if we thought we could get to the one home per acre. <coughs> Developer and builder are saying, yeah, really, that's not financially feasible with the road. So if we're saying we have to have the road, then I'm going to have to be a no vote. It's the bottom line. So it's making it harder by having the road there to get to yes. Right. I'm willing to try to get to yes, but I can't get to yes with the road. And I, I mean, and I think I we're all saying the road's yeah. the problem. The connector road's the problem. And what's wrong with the road? Is it just, it's, it's driving the cost, which is driving the density, which is. Above the comp plan. Yes, uh, yeah. you know, against the comp plan, transition area. I mean, that's just my thoughts. If we can't get rid of the road, the connect the road, then there's no point in deferring it. Because we put the builder in a situation, the developer in a situation, they can't win. They're, where are they going to come back? There's nothing they can come back that we could approve. Because they're still going to have to have the density. See what I'm saying? I know the board members are aware of that, of course. Um, and, and as um, Mr. McClure has acknowledged and Ms. Hunter has said, both the road and that density are in your comp plan. And your comp plan is a guide. You may well determine. You have the legal right to determine that the density would be more 
because you're going to get a road, and so you're going to ignore the comp plan density to get the road. Similarly, you could decide to have a density consistent with the comp plan, but decide you don't need to have that road. Right. And I, I know you want to make a, a knowledgeable decision about that, but I just wanted to make it clear that, of course, those are decisions for you uh, to be able to make um, the either way. I mean, I, I think an option for us would be to, I know we have some concerns with deferral, to defer and ask our planning staff to come back to us with a plan that meets the, that better aligns with the density and the road. Um, it's not possible. Uh, Man, that's not possible. With, with or without the road. Yeah, it, well, with or without the road is kind of a. Well, they probably have the lowest density po they possibly can have with the road. Are you willing to give up the road and ask them to come back without a road? Well, <laughs> one way or another, uh, if we say uh, you got to go 98 and no road, we're violating the comp plan. 90, or 123 with a road, we're violating the comp plan. So to me, I would, I would just like to see something that, that gets us to yes. Which is what I what I heard. I'm not sure what what it was meant, but <laughs> 98 and yeah, eliminate the road in 98. I don't know how they're going to get to. I don't know. How, I don't know how they're going to get to a lower density with the road. It's not. It's not feasible. It's not. The road's not feasible. There's no rationale for that road. Well, uh, I'll um, I would accept the motion if. Please, um, everybody's had a chance to, to speak up. Um, let's just no. try to get this. Mr. Minnick. Mr. Chair, I'm, I, move we def uh, I, I move we defer uh, the instant uh, proposal to uh, the next available um, board meeting, assuming July with second. staff's charge yeah. to review so both density and the connector road. The next board meeting is July 2nd, um, and then the one after that would be August 6th. So. Mr. Minnick, um, the board has an option, having conducted a full public hearing tonight, to either defer solely decision on this case or to defer with another public hearing. So I just want to make you aware, whichever way you're making that motion, if you would clarify for your, the board members. You're well, I. Uh, pardon me. You're going to hear something new. We're going to hear something new? Yeah, from well, in theory. But, you know, I think they're asking us to vote today. So, um, you know, they kind of know where, sort of where we stand. And I think if we just defer the decision, it would be, would be fine. Everybody's invited. They can come. They can, they can hear. They can. Um, but, but we don't go through four hours of discussion. Right. May, may, I ask, may I ask the county attorney if if there are changes to the application, are, is there a point that we should we exactly. should say have another public hearing? Exactly. Um, that is certainly a consideration uh, for the board. I mean, obviously, um, according to state law, an applicant is entitled to make. Uh, uh, proffers and changes the application even during a public hearing and still go forward until the changes become so significant that they weren't fairly within what was advertised. So th that's the best, you know, in the gray area of the law, that's the best um, uh, advice I could give you as to that. Uh, typically, what has to happen is that you can't have something, in essence, more dense than what was advertised, but you usually can cut back and do something less than what was advertised. That's the general rule. But like, you could, the board's prerogative, whichever you prefer to hear, I just wanted to, to make you aware of, of both options. Mm -hmm. What is the motion for a decision? So we have a motion. Did you want to modify the motion? Or <coughs> yeah, and I'd modify that without a public hearing. Okay. Uh, do we have a second? 
I will, I will second the motion to defer to July 2nd for a decision. Is that the motion? For a decision, yes. For a decision. Okay, I'll second that motion. Mr. Budeski, would you please uh, do a roll call vote? Mr. Lumpkins? Yes. Ms. Lachalette? No. Mr. Minnick? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Alvarez? Yes. Motion to defer to July 2nd for decision. Thank you all. Thank you for coming here. And one thing that I would add, I would add is we hear a lot about the comp plan, but if you look at the last comp plan, 120 citizens participated in the development of the comp plan. So while we think about it as a huge piece of work, it was a huge work for the county staff. So I hope that all of you will come back as we review it in the next year or two. Thank you all. Take a, we'll take a five minute break, please. My name is Tim Crawford, <laughs> the Director of Animal Protection. Uh, the proposed ordinance amendment before you tonight revises the county's leash law to change the penalty for a violation from a class four misdemeanor to a civil penalty of $25 for a first offense and $50 for any subsequent offense. The revision to a civil penalty would allow for the fine to be prepayable so that a court appearance would not be necessary. Also, the proposed ordinance amendment incorporates required change from the 2019 Virginia General Assembly for an exclusion from the leash law for dogs engaged in acting, active hunting activities. And I would be glad to answer any questions that you may have. You don't have any slides? I do not. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> <laughs> no way. You need some slides. No um, yeah, no <laughs> any questions for Mr. Clough? No. No questions? I may have a few. I'll just have to think on it. That's fine. Okay. Um, if that's the case, I'll go ahead and open the Thank you. Um, public hearing. So at this time, I'll open the public hearing on this ordinance change. <laughs> Seeing one coming up, I'll keep it open. <laughs> uh, I gotta give Mr. Chairman, I simply approach to uh, not disappoint. I think uh, what Mr. Clough presented is brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyle. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, I will close the um, public hearing. Discussion, questions, motions? Keeps flopping around. It's okay. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I move approval of uh, the ordinance to amend the county's leash laws as uh, outlined. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Budeski, would you call the roll? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Lumpkins? Yes. Ms. Lachalette? Yes. Mr. Minnick? Yes. Mr. Alvarez? Yes. Motion right. carries. Now we're on a roll. Thank you, Mr. Clough, for hanging with us. Okay. Next item, Ms. Hunter. We want the pre we want the presentation. <laughs> it's very short, and I will be very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Planning public hearing. Okay. Take your time. <laughs> 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 Turtles. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I know. Um, there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. for breakfast, Lisa. Chicken. <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> is it a break room? Okay. This is an ordinance amendment dealing with PC terms, uh, our existing ordinance. The planning commissioners are appointed for two-year terms and are limited to serving no more than eight consecutive terms. 
State law allows years. planning commissioners to serve four terms, four years, and there's no limit on the <coughs> terms. Um, due to Gooch's population, it's sometimes challenging to find citizens qualified, willing, and able to serve and willing to stay at meetings till midnight. And planning commission training takes a full year to complete, um, so that's a big investment for a two-year term. Um, mm -hmm. And many of our existing planning commission members would not be eligible to continue serving because they're at their eight-year time limit. We benchmarked other localities. You can see um, most of the surrounding localities do a four-year term. We are the only ones that did a two-year term. So the proposed ordinance would allow four-year terms for the planning commission effective um, next April and extend, we're recommending an extension from eight to 12 years of the number of consecutive years of peace he can serve. Be happy to answer any questions. Questions from Ms. Hunter? No. So this is, this is still timed with an election, so a new board can appoint new planning commission members? Yes. In so April. April. That's why we had the effective date. Right. Okay. So the new board would take office in January and appoint a board, a planning okay. commission member in April. Thank you. So um, any other comments, questions for Ms. Hunter? No. Mr. Lumpkin, what did you say about, I'm sorry, I zoned out a little bit, but if it was bench, benchmark with surrounding jurisdictions, mm -hmm. they... <coughs> on the length of their goes, term. Okay. So Goochland was the only one that had two-year, everybody else was a four-year term that we benchmarked. Ah, uh, thanks. <coughs> Planning Commission appointed to two-year terms and limited to serving no more than eight consecutive. So... So, so you're trying to just, okay, you, you're still putting, you're allowing it up to 12, is that what this ordinance yes. Right. So, yes. so yeah, there it is. And thank you. So it would be three terms, basically. Three, four-year terms. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, if no other questions or comments, I'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on this topic, please step forward. State your name again, please. <laughs> and, and address. He's back again, Mr. Peterson. Uh, one of your constituents. Um, oh. Jonathan Lau, 1521 Mannequin Road. Um, I, I think this makes a lot of sense. I, I have recall of folks who, um, I'm gonna say overstayed their welcome, but they, they extended their time on the Planning Commission. I do have a couple of questions, and, and I know this is probably subjective, but uh, qualified by knowledge and experience, do we have any definition of what qualified by knowledge and experience is. And I'll just use me as an example. I've sat through enough board meetings, but there is not, I mean, thank goodness we all have Ms. Hunter to rely on because there's a bunch of stuff in the ordinances that I think, in fact, she has job security. She can never leave, I mean, because she knows so much. But do we have definition for knowledge and experience? I mean, could someone, I've never served on the planning commission. Uh, could I be appointed? How would you determine that I have knowledge and experience? And then the second part is we did a pretty good job when we brought in virtually a brand new board eight years ago, but is there some, I know a lot of board of directors in corporate world have staggered terms so that you don't have nothing but newbies on there. Um, and, and so how I'm reading this, when does somebody's date of appointment take place? Will everybody's take place next April? Is that what yes. will take place? That's the way so it'll be. Yes. There is the potential, not that it's a bad thing, but it is a potential that you could have five new planning uh, commissioner, planning, new members of the planning commission. Uh, yes. What are they, directors? Planning commissioners. Yeah, commissioners. commissioners. No, I keep getting, right. anyway. Those are my two questions, knowledge and Thank experience. You. What defines that? And knowingly that there's a possibility that you'll have five brand new ones. Uh, and that's, I'll let sit down, I'd like to go off. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. I think that's a good question and I, you know, I guess um, I understand it a lot better than I did eight years ago, uh, but I mean, I think you're looking for people with experience in uh, in the area, and I in a sense, you kind of look for people that that think similarly to the way you think about development and the county. People that understand the comp plan and understand, um, 
you know, I know, I know you don't agree with what we might have done tonight, but the planning commission did. <laughs> so anyway, so um, I think it's understanding the county and understanding the the people's desires, and they have to spend a little time, and they can go through training that that teaches them about zoning and and all of that, and we yeah, encourage that training. Uh, I think now maybe three out of the five have been certified. So um, anyway, that's my thought. I don't know about others. How you chose your planner? You closed the public hearing? Uh, yes, I did. You ready for a motion? Hmm? Ready uh, for a motion? Ready? <laughs> oh, come on, sir. <laughs> I want to set the record. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt uh, the ordinance to amend Section 288 to increase the term length and total number of consecutive years allowed for planning commission members. Second. Yeah. We have a motion and we have a second. Uh, Mr. Budeski, would you? Mr. Minnick. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Lumpkin. Yes. Mr. Slashlet. Yes. Mr. Alvarez. Yes. <laughs> Next item as he comes up yawning. <laughs> Another lengthy presentation. It's ten slides, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> and one of them is for questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, I'm Todd Kilduff, Deputy County Administrator for Community and Economic Development. Um, we offer before you a um, proposed amendments to the county code section 14-251. Uh, dash 251 is specifically geared towards the Tucko Creek Service District. So anything related to the Tucko Creek Service District, tax map parcels, how to enter the district, how to exit the district, things like that, that's all found in dash 251. Um, <clears throat> we actually, we had a case in September of 2018 uh, where a resident actually uh, requested to exit the district. I need to give me a little tired right now. <laughs> Chugging coffee. Uh, <laughs> she's laughing at me. Uh, we had a resident who wanted to exit the Tucker Creek Service District. And as we walked through that process with her, there was a few questions that she had that the code didn't actually speak to. So there's a little bit of confusion on her end. Uh, some thing, and as we worked through that process, we started to see that there was a few things that we can iron out um, to make the code a little bit more clear on what specifically needs to be done if somebody was to make a request to enter or to exit the district. Uh, so we really wanted to focus on 14-251A3, uh, um, which speaks towards specifically towards the addition and removal of a parcel from the district. Um, so it's broken into those two sections. Uh, there's really only this one slide for the additions because I want to talk about how there really weren't very many changes to this section at all. Um, as you can see, we maintain that any parcel can make the request to enter the district at any point in time. Nothing changes there. A uh, resident can actually come in tomorrow and make that request to enter the district. Um, the one change we did add in was the language for an application. Uh, we already have an application for that, and I think that was sort of the confusing part when our, our citizen came in and asked to, to exit the district. Uh, they just thought that they said, hey, I'm requesting to exit the district, but we said there's an application we have, and therein lies one, one of the questions. So that's really the only addition um, that, that or adjustment uh, we're offering uh, for the parcel addition section. Uh, the remainder of the presentation is really for when somebody comes in to request a removal from the district. Uh, so, there, in the county code today, there is, a, is, is uh, some language specifically for that, um, and I wanted to highlight the, the portions of it that we didn't touch that we still are requesting to, to leave in. Uh, still a public hearing process, um, and, that, and we, we left it at September of every even year. Um, as I said, September of 2018, we heard a case. The next one wouldn't be until September of 2020, September of 2022, so on and so forth. So we didn't touch that at all. Uh, a removal request for the public hearing would only take place, uh, and again, we didn't touch this, of equal or greater val assessed value of parcels that enter the district. So if somebody makes a request to leave the district and their parcel's $500,000, but only $200,000 worth of parcels have entered, their case would not be heard because it wasn't an equal or greater value. Uh, the parcel cannot already have public water, um, public sewer, or both. If they're connected to either one of those, they're not allowed to make the request and the parcel cannot be uh, commercial property. So anybody who has a commercial property is not allowed to make the request either. Uh, excluded parcels cannot apply to rejoin the district 
for five years. So if you approve a parcel leave, they can't make a request to come back in for five years. So moving towards the changes portion uh, that, that we're offering for your consideration is uh, just like with uh, parcel wanting to be added to the district, uh, we do have the application requirement as well. Those already exist and they're actually in the public utilities website. Uh, <clears throat> this is a new item and this was sort of one of the, the confusing items for the applicant because they made the application, I believe it was in November roughly of, of the previous year and we said, well, we don't offer these cases until, or the public hearing actually, until September of 2018. And they're like, well, I'm making an application now, why am I waiting? So we really wanted to clarify that with the second bullet point, which provides application timeframes. We want to bring the act actual applications uh, closer to when the public hearing would actually be, so we have an actual period of time that the applications would be uh, admitted, which would be June 1st to July 1st of that same year, of that even year. Um, so if somebody wanted to actually today submit an application, we would say, no, you got to hold it until June of 2020, at which time you can submit your application. The other thing that, that wasn't really clear was what happens when multiple people um, actually make applications. We haven't had to run into that process, thank goodness, but we wanted to think outside the box a little bit. If it does happen, we would have a first in, first reviewed, so to speak, um, action. Um, and it also adds at the end of even year that even years will be when an approved removal will cease paying the ad valorem tax. That was a little confusing to the applicant as well. They thought as soon as they were approved to be removed from the district that they would stop paying the ad valorem tax. Uh, we're offering to not do that. If they're um, approved to be removed in September of that even year, they would still be part of the tax district until December 31st when every, so it falls in line with the actual billing cycles of the taxes. It makes a little more sense so there's not some proactive payment associated with this or retroactive payment. Uh, the property is not eligible for removal if we have a capital improvement project uh, that's provided within a five-year span. Five years being a more real project. Anything after that, we still want to plan for, but it may not be as real as the county grows and moves in certain directions. But if something's on our list in the next five years, that property would not be eligible. Uh, and they're also not eligible if they enter the, or the Tucker Creek Service District after it was created. So if somebody five years ago entered the district, they're not eligible to even be heard as the public hearing. Um, <clears throat> so those are some of the requirements. We also wanted to add in a few more guidelines for the board's consideration. Um, regardless of everything I've just talked about, um, one thing that you can use for the guidelines is financial sustainability of the Tucko Creek Service District. That's always at your disposal to use when making, a, making the decision. Uh, the other one is time frame for water and sewer service availability. Just to clarify, I'm not confusing it with the previous slide that had the five-year span. Let's say we had a project that was going to be in front of somebody's house or parcel in year six. That's still pretty close to the five-year span, so we wanted to say, hey, maybe there's some wiggle room with this particular item, so maybe there's still a time frame that might be associated with your decision. Um, and then the last bullet point is really a, a catch-all, the impact of removing the parcel from the utility system. Uh, maybe there's something we haven't thought of, but we, you know, sometimes you don't know until the case is before you or the situations before you based on how the system's growing and what the system, existing system is today. Um, so that's really what that bullet point, the last bullet point, is geared towards. Uh, excluding parcels uh, cannot, uh, this is uh, more um, <clears throat> items that we're adding in here um, for your considerations. Excluding parcels cannot apply to rejoin uh, the TCSD for five years. I've already mentioned that, but Let's say they are approved to be removed, and then five years goes by and they want to enter the district again. Well, we wanted to talk about what that actually means. If they were removed, then they didn't pay those taxes for the five years or six years or seven years, however long it's been before they came back to us and asked um, to be heard to enter the district. So we offered a few other items in here. One is they must repay uh, the previous two years of whatever those taxes would have been. The second bullet point has actually already been in the code, which is they have to pay an adder on their connection fees. At the moment, that's 20% on water, 20% on sewer. A water and sewer, just to put it in perspective, a water and sewer connection fee today is $10,000. Uh, house that enters the district would be $12,000. Just adds 20% to it. Um, however, this is, the, the board can grant a waiver of any reentry requirements for any good cause. So that was a little bit of a catch-all there at the end as well. Um, and that's if, um, let's say, somebody exited the district because they said, hey, I'm on a well and septic, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with my well and septic, uh, but my well went dry, I tried to drill another one, I found no water, drilled another one, found no water, but we happen to be close enough 
then that's where that catch all would come into play where the board can consider entering that parcel of land back into the district for good cause or if there's a situation like that. Todd, just on that for sure. particular item, we, we added that so people weren't trying to game the system by getting out, saving some money for a few years and then trying to join back in and having people come and go out of the district. So that, that there was some reason to add that in for clarity. It wasn't an attempt to be a, a penalty for situation but it was um, we didn't want people to try to to come in and in and out and have sort of this Swiss cheese district either um, by by trying to save a few bucks in between that's right yeah, mr. chair oh sure if you back up that slide just oh. one just to clarify sure. this is a this this leaving and then coming back five years later mm -hmm. as I read this that's a one-time option only for original members because Yes. <coughs> it yeah. says ineligible um, to leave is, I guess it's number three, little I, or anybody that entered after 2002. Yeah, so right so right. if you've done the round trip, you've entered after, you've re entered or entered after 2000, so you don't get to do that again. And also, if you were not an original member, you entered at some point, so you're ineligible again. So right. there's a one time shot for people that That's were right. originally in the district way back when. Um, just wanted that's to clarify comment. that. Yep, no, that's you. absolutely right. Thank you. Uh, just a few, two final bullet points here, uh, additional information. There was a question when we first started looking into this on financial hardship, what that actually means for somebody that may want to exit the district. Uh, when we looked into it, we talked to a few different people, Tara and myself went to the assessor, we went to um, the treasurer, we had a few conversations with social services, so on and so forth. But long story short, financial hardships, not a grounds for removal from, uh, of a parcel from the district because the county actually already has a program that's available for that type of a situation. Um, the last bullet point, nothing in the proposed amendments obligates the board to approve a request for exclusion. So we do have some requirements that somebody has to meet to be heard. We have some guidelines that we presented for you, but nothing of that really actually, it's really up to the, the board's pleasure whether you want to remove a parcel from the district or not. So nothing really obligates you in, in what we've talked about. So, um, but I'm, and I tried to go th through that pretty quick, <laughs> try to keep questions? my eyes open. <laughs> but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Other questions for Mr. Kildo? Come on, Mr. Chairman, real quick. Um, the applications are made June 1 to July 1. We hear them in September. They're first in, um, and if we haven't added, so in, uh, if we've already added, let's say, uh, 200,000 new, and the first application is for 300,000, then that would be denied because we haven't, then would we go to the second one? Maybe the second one say 100,000 or 200,000. Yeah, we would do that. We would yeah. do that, okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's a good in question. fact, just to clarify, Ms. Laskalet, the first one at three hundred thousand doesn't even get scheduled for public hearing. Right. You don't you have that. The board doesn't denied. deny it. It's not eligible for public hearing. Right. But you'd look to the next one. And go to the next one. Great. Just want to be sure. Yeah, that'd Thank be you. at the staff level. We would let the applicant know they didn't they didn't meet the requirement. They didn't meet the We'd go okay. to the next one so you have met and move forward. Yeah, good question. Do you have a question, Mr. Lowe? maybe just more of an observation or a comment and nothing will deal with now but we've spent so much time on removal of parcels this is well written I think you know when we saw this last time in two by twos I think we covered all the bases this is uh, very very much in favor of it. it's a great a great result of a lot of work but it just dawned on me this earlier hearing we had about thinking making me think about the addition of parcels and I didn't really focus on that but you know the one gentleman I think the last speaker tonight said you know how are you going to deal with the next person that comes along mannequin road wanting to you know, do RPUD. And I thought, well, the line ends. You know, the line ends there, so, but it looks, it looks like it's pretty easy to get in. You just, you just apply. So I, I think if we no, see, if no, we see expansion. No, no. So w w what am I missing? Um, the there are boundaries of the district. This is actually for the addition of parcels within, within those within boundaries. The, within the existing boundaries. Yeah, yeah. The, right. the section on the boundaries is not before you because it's not being amended, but Thank this you. is for addition it's only Carter. within the boundaries. So that's part so of it. Of property so good, because I was thinking, I started, it's like, well, people could jump and do no. something that's not so contiguous and all no. this other yeah. stuff. No, this no. is sort of more Swiss cheese There's than, right. but not a bigger slice. Thank you. All right. Good question. Uh, good slice of cheesecake. I do have a uh, question, uh, Don. Sure. 
the penalties that uh, apply when you try to get back in, you pay two years, are those clear on the application? Um, we, they would be. So yeah, they, right now we haven't okay. put them on there, but they would be. So somebody would sign a waiver that says, I realize that if I come back in, I'll be paying two years worth of taxes. That's correct. Yeah, what, what's in the code today, we have clarified on the application. We sort of bullet pointed what's in the code. If this was approved today, we would adjust the application and add these the new criteria in there. Yeah, because we want to make, not everyone goes and reads our code, and we recognize that. But if somebody comes in and asks us, we say we have an application. We want to make sure it. that that's informative of what the code is. We'll reference the code, but we'll have the bullet points. So we'll just pull out, extract, like, the, the key information for them and let them know. But, yeah, that'll be in there. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? No, just, another, just another quick comment. Um, in the TCSD, which was done almost 20 years ago now, I guess, in the, in the bond documents, there's bond covenants where the county has pledged a variety of collateral, a whole package of collateral that they've pledged. Um, and they, they're all enumerated in the bonds, but the idea was to try to protect the value behind the bonds as security, as an enticement for purchasers to purchase the bonds. And, and some of this language is, is really designed to protect that collateral package so that we have a fiduciary obligation to make sure that we don't deteriorate the package. So as someone wants to come in, Maybe some can go out, but you can't all go out and deteriorate the, 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 the collateral that stands behind the repayment of those loans. So it's been about 20 years. There's bound to be the original plans from 20 years ago. You know, it's hard for any plan to actually work out the way you thought it would be 20 years later. So there's some minor modifications here, but the underlying theme here is to, is to make sure that we protect the, bond, uh, the bondholders the way we've covenanted to. So, uh, and I think this does that, so thank you. Thank you, Todd. I'll go ahead and open the uh, public hearing. Anybody that wants to speak on this topic, please step forward. You got to sit in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> he needs the exercise. We, we at least 15, 20 minutes of meeting. <laughs> Wait. Uh, it really is just a question, and I don't know why. I'm just happening to still think about the public hearing that preceded the last public hearing. but. Several people mentioned, well, we've been playing, paying this ad valorem tax for blah years. And in there, it says if they're a CIP plan, I mean, does a landowner know if, there's, if they're bound or a part of a CIP that they may have no absolute impact on? I mean, the CIP sometimes takes place and landowner doesn't know. So there's no option to say, I want to be part of a CIP, is there? I mean, because that would exclude a property owner from being able to request exit from the district. Not that any, this is just what happens at 1230 at night with my mind. So, you know, welcome to my life. <laughs> Sir? 1 a.m. Yeah, okay. Um, no, it is. If those two, let's just suppose, say the board did not approve development for those three parcels of land, and they said, we're tired of paying ad valorem. We want out. And there was enough... I don't know what the value of the land is, but there have been enough that come in and they would qualify. But because the CIP or something, transportation plan, kind of shows a road going through there that says, sorry, CIP says we got something planned, you can't leave. Is that a possibility? No, that's it's go ahead. specifically related to water sewer infrastructure improvements, CIP, nothing no. else. Oh, okay. And, and so I'll, it's, it's... I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, he's good. Anyone else? I'll close the public hearing and let Mr. Peterson explain it. <laughs> oh, I thought you were. Yeah. Well, um, I'll Take just. Your time. No, <laughs> this is going to be really fast. Um, the, the the value of the district um, is was anticipated from day one to increase over time as development occurred. It was it was not agree it was not anticipated to just stay static. And as that development occurs, you've got main trunk lines that then grow in certain different directions. And if there was a large landowner that was in the district where that direction of development was headed straight for that property and then anticipated to go well beyond that property and, and continue to develop, and if that one property that was in the district decided to come out of the district and, and cut off that development and stop the development, it might, it, it could potentially erode the value of the overall system it, by, by retarding its ability to build out. And I think that's in part what we're trying to address here by saying CIP only if that trunk line is coming your way, 
and it's anticipated to go well beyond your property, that you can't be the blocking vote there to stop the, the development, because it, it might impair the, the, the value of the bonds. So, thank you. Any other comments, questions? If not, I uh, will entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move approval of ordinance to amend 14.251 to add additional criteria and process for the exclusion of parcels from the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. Second. We have second. a motion and we have a second. A Mr. Budeski, would you call the roll? Excuse me, a point of order. Oh. Um, I've read this um, directly from the board packet, but I believe we are also amending not In just the exit, additions. but the yep. addition. So I'd like to um, additional criteria and process for the exclusion and addition of parcels from the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. Good catch. The second will accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mr. Budeski, would you? Mr. Any? Peterson. Yes. Mr. Lumpkins. Yes. Mr. Minnick. Yes. Mr. Lashlet. Yes. Mr. Alvarez. Yes. All right, so any new business? <laughs> what time is breakfast? <laughs> Uh, seeing no other new business, um, the board will adjourn to June 26th at 3 p.m. for a Board of Supervisors zoning rewrite work session. Uh, hopefully, um, some of you will be able to attend. Uh, the, it'll be held in room 270 and it's open to the public. And then the next board meeting will be July 2nd at 3 p.m. for a regular business meeting and 7 p.m. for our public uh, hearings. And those meetings are also open to the public. Thank you to our District 2 candidates for hanging out with us <laughs> all night. Deja <laughs> 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 vu. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>